Hello, welcome to Node Redcon. Uh, so this is the English track, uh, which hopefully, yes, we bring up the right, uh, the right overhead. Um, hello, so my name is Sam Machen. Uh, I'm going to be your host for this track for the next uh, about seven hours, I think we've got, of content. Um, so we say, this is the English track. Um, so all the speakers are in English. Um, in terms of time zones, we're we're talking about, we published on UTC, um, but we're kind of trying to cover as much of the globe as we can with this event. Um, so it's it's just gone just after lunch in the UK, but uh, hopefully we'll be picking up people from, from the rest of Europe, some of Asia, um, and then not too early for those people in the Americas. So uh, yeah, we've got... Uh, We've got about uh, seven or eight speakers, I think, today. Uh, should explain, we did start a little late. We unfortunately had uh, one of our speakers, Dimitro, uh, had to cancel at the last minute. He's not well, so uh, we we wish him a speedy recovery. Um, so we dropped his talk out and uh, and just closed up the gap with uh, with the keynote. Uh, we will see if we can try and get his talk maybe recorded and uh, and put up on YouTube or something um, for for later after the event. So, without uh, without too much ado, let's bring on uh, our keynote speaker, Nick. So, if I get this right with StreamYard, yes. Cool. <laughs> Hi, Nick. How are you? Very good, Sam. Very good. Good. Great to see you. Very well. Yeah. So, I saw a little bit of your talk this morning um, in uh, in the Japan track, but uh, we're looking forward to uh, to seeing what the state of Node Red is and where we are in 2022. So, uh, what I'll do is I shall uh, I shall drop off and hand it over to you. Thanks. So let me, there we are. So yes, welcome everyone, uh, Node Red Con uh, 2022, the English track. For those of you who uh, joined the start of the Japanese track that started, what, um, well, nine o'clock this morning, the UK time, um, however many hours ago that was, uh, I, I delivered this, this talk then for the start of that track. So um, really pleased to be able to, uh, Welcome you all to to this track and and to, to Node Red Con in particular. I think it's um, a great testament to the strength of the community and and the project as a whole that we're able to put on an event like this for free. Um, you know, just I should say you know, a huge thank you to everyone behind the scenes um, who's helped make it today possible. Particularly the Node Red Japan user group members who um, led the way holding this event in previous years, but to be able to now hold a, um, broaden the event to have a dedicated English track, as well as the great content from, from our friends in Japan, it's awesome to see. And, you know, I look forward to seeing how we can grow this again in the future. So I wanted to take this opportunity to just reflect a bit on the Node Red project, where are we at in 2022? Um, what have we achieved? And, touch a bit on some of the stuff we're thinking about at the moment but really just to um set the scene if i there we are um before i get too much into it i should introduce myself for those who don't know me um so i'm nick o'leary i'm the co-creator of node red um and i continue to lead the project um from the sense of um just you know helping give it a steer and help help the community keep moving forward with it but something that's really important to me is um yeah you know, being part of the openjs foundation that node red shouldn't I, I wouldn't want anyone to think that node red is just this this project of a couple of people who are doing all the work type stuff we really truly trying to build an open community around it and um bring and invite you know anyone to get involved come and talk to us um, if you've got ideas, all that sort of stuff, you know, we very much um, you know, welcome that and encourage it. But yeah, that's me. Um, please do reach out to me if, if, if you do have any other questions about Node Red and all that good stuff. But again, you're going to hear from lots of other speakers who all have great insight into Node Red as well. So with that, um, Node Red in 2022 so far, because it's only October. Um, we've still got some time to go. And in fact, I've updated these numbers a couple of times this week as as you know, things have happened. This year, um, well, if you saw my talk last year, I did a similar sort of summary. This year, we've done 14 releases across the core Node-RED project. The core Node-RED repository, we've had 876 commits. Um, and that, that's the number, you know, I... I I knew as soon as I put that number on a slide when I put this together on Monday, I'd have to keep it updating it. 
So I, I think 876 is pretty, pretty up to date for this week. 20 contributors. So that's 20 unique people who have actually made some contribution to the core of the project. Um, and again, I keep saying the core of the project. Node-RED is so much more than just the core Node-RED repository. There's all the third party nodes and I'll touch on that in a minute. Um, there's just so much, so many different aspects that people can can get involved. And it's it's quite hard to come up with the number of just how many people have contributed. There are tons of you. In terms of people involved in the core of Node-RED, 20s, yeah, that's awesome to see. Um, people often ask, you know, it, how many people are on the, on working on Node-RED full-time? And it's like, well, no one works on Node-RED full-time. It is truly a, a community effort. People get involved um, as they can. Um, spare time, maybe it, maybe it's part, you know, a, a slice of their day job type of thing. Who knows? But, you know, we're able to achieve what we do largely through the open source community. And we recently, recently hit our ninth birthday as an open source project. Um, and in fact, Node-RED itself um, turns 10 years old in terms of that very first line of code I wrote in January. So in, in just two or three months away. But in terms of it being an open source project, that was September nine years ago. And again, a summary of numbers of, of what we've achieved in that time. And, it, and it's awesome to see. And I, I know I'm going to keep saying it. You know, we can only do this because of the community out there who uh, believe in the project, who support it, who want to help it succeed. And you know, whatever contribution people have to make, it doesn't have to be code, um, you know, just ideas, support, whatever it might be. Um, it all makes a difference to where we get to. This year, um, this is our published release schedule from the website. You can see how we shipped Node-RED 3.0, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. And according to our schedule, we've got 3.1 coming up in the next month or so. Um, we're still doing maintenance releases for the 2.x stream, um, something we're, uh, you know, I think this is probably the first, over the last 18 months, since we established, you know, started doing this process. I think we're we're refining it, we're getting better at doing the maintenance releases, getting the process in place for backporting fixes more actively rather than just backporting things when people need it. So yeah, we're getting better at that and it's, it's good to see. And we always thought it's been important to have this sort of statement of how long a particular version of Node-RED is supported for or will receive fixes. An important point just to draw on this is we, we chose this schedule to align ourselves with the Node.js release schedule, which you can see on the, the lower half of these slides. Um, now, uh, so, so we try to align our major release with when a particular version of Node reaches its end of life. Something just to highlight to the community to be aware of for a number of upstream reasons, Node 16 is reaching its end of life six months earlier than the normal um, April of each year. So we haven't f formally decided what we will do in the Node-RED project to reflect that, but I think all things considered, we won't modify our plans around that. We will continue to do Node-RED 4 next April, June time, where we drop Node 14. And we will continue to support Node 16 until we ship Node-RED 5 in 2021. Four, um, but I just wanted to highlight for those of you who are running in production, those who you know, need to consider this stuff, just be aware that, that Node 16 goes end of life six months earlier. Um, so it's still a year away. <laughs> You've got plenty of time, but it's it's one of those things just to be aware of. As we look back over the last nine years, um, NPM stats of people typing npm install node red you can see just a nice steady so that these data points are uh, per month how many installs each month and you can see a nice steady growth over time of, of people installing node red um, it's not just about people installing it in terms of the community uh, this is page views on our discourse forum which has really taken off in a big way since we moved over to it from the google group we had in the early days of the project so, you know, we're well into, you know, over, is it about over a million 
1.2 million page views each month. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of activity on the forum. Um, it, it's a great resource. And, you know, again, I'm so grateful to there's so many people who spend the time on the forum helping others in the community, um, answering questions, chatting about ideas. Um, you know, it's, it's a credit to the community, just the, the value it brings to helping users understand their dread, helping users succeed. And when we look at the growth of the community, how many people are just signing up to the forum each month? Uh, you can see we're getting, you know, three to 400 new users sign up every month onto the forum. Um, again, just testament to the, to the value and, and what, what an important resource that is to the project. And this one kind of blew my mind. Um, according to Docker Hub stats, which can be a little opaque, but um, since I think, uh, according to the API, it says since October 2019, we've had, well, in fact, this was the number I showed in the Japan track this morning that I'd plucked off the stats a couple of days ago. I thought I'd better check it. We've now hit yeah, in the in the last three days, we've breached 238 million Docker pools of the core Node Red image, and that yeah, that number just blows my mind. For effectively three years of of existence of that particular image, it just uh, yeah, it blows my mind. It's incredible. Um, so there's clearly a lot of people out there doing some really cool stuff with Node Red, and that's one of the great things about this event today is an opportunity to hear from people who do stuff with Node-RED um, and yeah, just hear, hear their stories as well. And it's not just the core of Node-RED, um, the modules, uh, the, yeah, the main way that people contribute outside of the core is by publishing modules. Uh, so this is showing the growth of nodes listed in our flow library based on when they were first added. And you'd see we, we've, um, early, well, only a couple of months ago, we hit 4,000 third-party nodes on the Flow Library, a steady growth, not seeing any, any drop-off at the rate of people are continuing to share things on the Flow Library. The blue line here is looking at uh, just a particular data point I've, I pulled out related to um, something I'm coming on to, which is around the naming of those modules. So if you've been uh, a node user for some time, you'll be familiar that we the naming we we advise, we we strongly urge people to follow would be to call their modules node red contrib something to help distinguish it from the core stuff. Well, one of the things we sort of brought in a, a a change to that recommendation at the start of this year to recommend you take advantage of NPM scoped names. So that's where you can have like at flowforge slash module name, which um, has a whole bunch of good reasons for it helps identify who, where the node has come from. It avoids clashes, ambiguity, all, all this sort of stuff. So that blue line just shows as nodes have been added to the flow library, have they been using a scope name or not? And you can see at the, since the start of 2022, a very slight uptick of, of nodes starting to use scope names following our guidelines, which is awesome to see. Um, and it'll be great to see that in, that increase to to match the the growth of, of the nodes themselves. So this relates back to the scorecards. Now I, I know Pablo's going, doing a talk around the module ecosystem, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Um, I don't want to uh, take away from anything that he's going to talk to you about. But just in terms of some raw stats, since since we added the scorecards to the Flow Library in January 2022. We've had, um, again, as of, I think, Tuesday this week, when I pulled this number out, 878 scorecards generated. So we, we're only generating the scorecards when a node gets updated. Uh, we, we haven't gone back and retrospectively generated scorecards for, for older nodes. But um, So we've had 878 nodes either added or updated on the Flow Library this year. And I thought it was interesting just to have a quick breakdown of... Um, some of the numbers behind that of some of the tests that the scorecard looks at. Um, so um, again, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, 
Um, there's a lot more about the scorecard on the on the Node Red blog. And in fact, you can go look at the flow library and start looking at nodes and and their, the scorecards and and it's got explanations for what all the different th things mean. But um, I just wanted to highlight here yeah, the bars which are shorter than perhaps we would like, which is to say, um, in terms of just raw percentage of how many of the nodes are passing this test versus the others. And the, the ones that highlighted that clearly, I think we could do some more work around is nodes that include examples. So the ability to, in the import dialog in the node red editor, there's an example section and it's possible for any node to include example flows to help demonstrate its use. Um, so, you know, we see about 30% of nodes actually include examples. So I think that that's one of the things I, I think we should take some reflect on perhaps why, why is that number as low as it is, or why isn't it higher, I should say. Um, yeah, what more can we do to help uh, encourage people to include examples, both within the editor? You know, is it intuitive enough or discoverable enough that the examples are there, or, or what else we could do? The other one is around identifying minimum Node-RED and Node.js versions. Now, nodes written for Node-RED 0.1 or whatever version we introduced um, uh, third-party nodes in, they should pretty much just work in Node-RED today. And we go to great lengths to maintain backward compatibility in that sense. But equally, we add new features to Node-RED, so newer nodes might want to start taking advantage of those new features. So the no, whilst Node-RED might be compatible with old nodes, new nodes might not be compatible with old versions of Node-RED. So it's, um, whilst there aren't lots of examples of that, um, it's it's an important feature for node authors to recognize they, they can specify these things. And again, help users avoid installing a node that, that isn't going to work because they're on an older version of something. So again, but otherwise, a lot of the other criteria, I think we've seen, um, I, I as I watch nodes get published and their scorecards generated, I've certainly seen it's had a positive effect. Um, you know, often I'll see, a node get published and it might fail two or three things on the scorecard and about half an hour later they'll publish another version and it's passing those things so i think it is having a um a net benefit to to what is being produced but there's a lot more data for us to dig into to learn from but i think um i i will yeah leave that for for another time node red 3.0 so this we released in july um as we mentioned, and I'm sure many of you watching this now, node Red fans, uh, you will already be well familiar with what's there. But I thought, you know, be for those people joining for for who may not keep us up to date with the project as as you or I, then um, just want to say a few bits. You know, what did we get into three point zero? Again, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and, you know, thank you to all the contributors who made all this possible. Um, the the headline, well, the headline, the, the the, the single breaking change we made was dropping support for Node 12 because it had reached end of life. Um, but a lot of other stuff, new features, things like the Monaco text editor, the, which gives you really rich content assist in the function node. We've now made that the default text editor if your settings file doesn't specify anything. Um, you know, we've, we've had it for a year or more and it's been very stable for you know, we we haven't had issues with nodes being incompatible with it. It's it just works. So we've now made that the default. Other features again. I'm, I'm not going to go through all these in great detail. Context menu and edit editor. I mean, it's it's such a common standard expected bit of user interface. Um, but it took us nine years to get there. But it unlocks so much capability in the editor that that's always been there or you know has grown over time but it just helps users discover features that are available, which is half the battle. You know, we spend a lot of time adding new features to the editor, but if a user doesn't know it's there, then it um, doesn't help them. So, yeah, again, sound, I know it sounds so simple, but it does actually unlock a lot of potential. Node junctions, um, 
So the, the new junction node allows you to simplify the wiring to try and avoid some of the nests of spaghetti you can get. Um, now, there's more improvements to come. Um, I think they help in some scenarios. They don't always work as well as they might. Um, and before people ask, um, they don't work on touch screens and we have an issue and, and we will get that solved. But um, certainly laying the groundwork for just trying to trying to help manage what can otherwise get quite complicated in the visual visual flow. Debug path tooltips, um, you know, in the debug node, hopefully you're familiar, any debug node, you can click its name in the top right corner and it takes you to that node. We've added a tooltip which actually shows you exactly where that node is. You know, maybe you don't want to jump to it, maybe you just need to know where it's coming from, or maybe you want to, um, if it, particularly when you've got subflows and you might have lots of nested subflows, it um, really makes it easy to to see just where that node is. And you can click on any of those entries in the tooltip and it takes you to that thing. So again, just helping users navigate the editor. Continuous search, another feature that you know we're all used to having in different applications. Now you have it in Node-RED. So when you search for something in the editor, um, you can now navigate the search results without having to reopen the search, do the search again, remember which one you'd got to last time, and then go to the next. So it makes it much easier to navigate around. I'm just, yeah. There we are. Um, so Node-RED 3.0 and a bunch of other stuff. I mean, like I said, I'm not going to get into the detail. There is the blog post if, if you haven't seen it yet. There's a video with me talking at you about these features and demoing a lot more of them. So please do take a look. So what's next? That's 3.0. Um, I talked a bit about the timeline. We've got 3.1 uh, coming in the next month or so would be my guess. We've not, I mean, we try to do these releases every three months. So much is dependent on uh, on the people who are available to spend time delivering these features. So um, that's that's kind of our main limiting factor at the uh, how how we can schedule the Node-RED releases. Um, but you know, we we say we try and do one of these releases every three months just to give us a focal point for trying to pull together and and get get things merged and get things delivered. And there's you know a lot of good stuff on its way. And I uh, just wanted to touch on some of the stuff that's being developed or not even developed yet. Some stuff we've, we've started talking about in the community and a couple of things that are sort of on my mind in particular that, that we, I think we as a project should start addressing for ourselves. Um, so, yeah, this is, again, just a, a sampling of the stuff kind of actively being worked on actively being thought about um, uh, there yeah this isn't an exhaustive list there's always more stuff than um, than we could just list out here but but yeah let's let's touch on some of these for a bit so first up is the ability to lock flows we've over the life of the project we've often been asked questions around user permissions within the editor that um, people would like the ability for a user to uh, be prevented from cha making changes to certain parts of the flows. And um, I think, well, we haven't gone down that route because our, our permissions model didn't necessarily work well with trying to lock, trying to prevent changes to individual things in the flow. Um, but a discussion with the Japan user group, in fact, led us to this approach, which kind of changes it on its head slightly, which is to say, rather than trying to use user permissions to lock things, what if you can just lock a flow in the flow format, just like you can disable nodes and flows. So just have a simple locked um, property of the flow. And if it's locked, then it can't be changed. So that's the piece of work we're doing at the moment. Um, 
In fact, this, this is the one I've been tackling on my weekly Twitch live stream for the last couple of weeks and will continue to. The idea here is um, any flow in the editor, in its edit dialog, it, like it has the enable disable toggle, it has a lock or unlock toggle. And if it's locked, then you can't make any changes to any of the nodes on it. Now, there are a couple of different reasons or use cases for this. As an individual developer, you might want to prevent yourself from accidentally making changes to a critical set of flows. Um, just, uh, yeah, just by adding this lock, it adds an extra step that you actually have to unlock it in order to make changes. So you, you can't accidentally deploy something that you didn't mean to. Um, so that works well for an individual. When you have a team of users, or perhaps you want to have more control, um, something we will look at, probably not in 3.1, but as a follow-on piece of work, this would enable, is with the Node-RED security we have, where you can give users permissions. Right now, those permissions are simply read-only or write. Um, that's, that's as uh, fine-grained as our permissions extend. But the technology is there to be able to add different other scopes of permission. So uh, one potential development on this feature in the future will be um, to have a user who is allowed to make changes, they have write permission, but they aren't allowed to unlock anything. So there you would have, particularly in a cloud environment where you know, they don't have command line access, um, you can have an environment where some users then are prevented from modifying flows and nor can they unlock it. So that gets interesting in environments like, you know, perhaps in education settings where you're trying to teach someone something and you have some, some flows that they shouldn't modify and some flows they should, and you just want to avoid them you know, breaking things, as well as in production environments. Again, you can have some protection around the critical parts of your flow. And a lot of this work can then also feed into the read-only user. The current user experience for read-only users is not ideal in that the user doesn't know they're a read-only user until they try hitting the deploy button to make some changes. At which point the runtime says, no, nope, you're not allowed to change anything. Now, if you've logged in as the wrong user unaware and you've just spent half an hour making a whole bunch of changes and suddenly you find yourself unable to write those changes, that isn't ideal. So a lot of the work around locking flows and preventing any editor actions in the editor is something we could look at reusing for when a user is logged in as read-only so that they can't make any changes. They can't accidentally spend a bunch of time doing work only to find it gets rejected by the deploy button. So we can improve that user experience. Um, again, I don't know if that will be incorporated into 3.1, but that's these are the sorts of things this work is going to unlock. Oh, and, and I should add, um, each of these slides, I've, I've put the link at the top to where the, the discussion about the items happening. Um, so in our designs repository, there's a, a, uh, a GitHub discussions forum where we post discussions around these sort of high level design features, um, either as discussions in that forum or as pull requests in that repository with more formal sort of design notes. So you'll see a bit of a mix between those two approaches in, in that forum, but um, yeah. So global environment variables, uh, this is another piece of work already in development. So Node-RED does let you set environment variables on individual flows or groups or subflows. This is kind of filling in the missing piece, which is being able to set global environment variables from within the editor. You can do it today by editing your settings file, but again, each time you have to edit your settings file, you sort of lose a lot of that low code nature of Node-RED. And it also makes it more difficult in cloud hosted environments where 
you don't have access to the settings file. So the idea here is um, either in the user settings or somewhere else. Um, yeah, that it's currently in user settings. I'm not sure that's quite the right place, but anyway, point being, somewhere you'll be able to edit a list of environment variables that will get applied across all the flows. And then this work will introduce a new configuration node type, a global config node, that will store these environment variables actually in your flow. So when you export your flows, um, these envirs can come with it. Now that's really useful and it's a neat feature. What, because I'm always looking at, you know, if, if we add this feature, what does it enable? What, what, what else does it unlock? Adding in the concept of this global config configuration node to store these environment variables actually gives us a space to hold other metadata about your flows as a whole, which we haven't had before. Um, so um, again, no specific plans about what that means, but it means we've got this ability that we've not had before to store metadata that applies to the whole set of flows. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what that unlocks in terms of other features. Splitting up the flow file. So I mean, this is one that has been on our backlog for a long, 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 long time. Um, we recognize you know, storing the flows as a single JSON blob um, has its conveniences when it's just a single file, but it does also cause some challenges, particularly around version control. And you know, if you're not, even if you're using the projects feature we provide in Node-RED with, with version control integrated, it's still, once you're outside of Node-RED, managing a single blob of JSON in a version control system is not ideal, particularly when you've then got to deal with um, other people merging changes. Merging changes in a JSON file is not fun. Um, things like the func, because it's JSON, the function node with all its nice you know, laid out code um, is in the JSON file as a single single line of text. There's no you know, line breaks getting coded. So you lose all the ability. You know, if you've got a long function node and another colleague deploys a change which makes some changes to that code, well, you, you end up having to merge changes in single lines of text, which is, is not a great user experience. Now we've seen the community address this in different ways. Uh, for themselves from things like, I think Node-RED Contrib Flow Manager that does the work to split flows out into individual files. We've seen, I know there are people in the community who have a bunch of custom scripts, bash scripts and the like that um, they run as a pre or post processor on the JSON file before they put it into version control that does the work to split it out and bring it back together. Um, yeah. so. It's great that people are able to come up with their own solutions, but it does kind of feel like something Node-RED ought to help you do for yourself. So this isn't one we've got a specific plan on, um, but I did want to just highlight it as it's one of those that has sort of cropped, finds itself nearing the top of my mental list of where, where to spend some energy trying to come up with an approach that's going to be suitable for the different use cases. Another issue, um, another item, this one's already merged. So this will be in 3.1. Again, came out of feedback from the Node-RED Japan Enterprise User Group. So uh, you, you will have already noticed, I hope, when using Node-RED, that we changed the URL um, fragment, the bit at the end after the hash, with the ID of whatever flow you're on. So that um, it means you can come back to the editor and it opens up the appropriate flow. Well, what we've added in, in this particular pull request is the ability to pretty much do that for nodes and groups. So by using a fragment of hash node and then its ID or hash group and its ID, when you open up the editor, the editor will find that node or group and make sure it's in the center of your view, wherever it might be. So that's really handy if you're, for example, writing a tutorial or you're collaborating with someone and you want them to have a look at a particular node, you can. You don't have to tell them, right, it's on this flow, it's scroll down to the bottom, go into the right corner. Yeah, you can send them a link 
to link straight to it. And what we've also added for both flows, nodes, and groups is if you add slash edit to the end of the URL, it will um, not only take you to that thing, but it will then open up the edit dialog for that thing. Again, useful for if you're building a tutorial or something like that, and you want to direct a user to a particular node's configuration. And to help with this, in the uh, info sidebar, whenever you've got a node selected, we've added this new button, um, which will copy to your clipboard the URL for that node, um, making it, yeah, again, super easy to start accessing this. And as I mentioned, that's already merged. So if you're if you are using Node-RED from Git, make sure you're in the dev branch where we work on 3.1, and you can already see that in action. And then one more, um, the Node-RED flow testing framework. So <laughs> this is an identical slide that I presented a year ago at Node-RED Con 2021. Um, this has been a piece of work in discussion for a long time, as you can see. Those. That photo is from a whiteboard in my office at um, at IBM when I was there, but from you know, almost three years ago, where we sort of sketched out what the flow testing framework should be. And this is very much about Node-RED is a low code environment. And just because it's low code, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be testing your code. It doesn't mean you don't want the ability to build unit tests, um, be able to have some sort of test automation to verify your flows are working, all that good stuff. Now you can do that in code. Um, we provide the node test helper, which um, does let you write tests for flows, but, but you're writing it in code. So it kind of gets you out of the low code environment of Node-RED. So this will be tooling within the editor um, as a plugin that actually lets you create test cases uh, within the editor. Um, and uh, you, know, you define test cases, you define inputs and outputs and what sort of tests to verify things looking good. Um, there's some development work has been done on it, but I think there's, there's quite a bit more to be done. Um, and it's kind of dropped off uh, the priority list in terms of getting 3.0 out and, and a whole bunch of other concerns. But it, it's still, I wanted to bring it up because it's it still, I see as an important missing piece of, of the overall story of Node-RED and something that can actually help differentiate it from a lot of the other low-code platforms out there in terms of, um, you know, it's all well and good, making it super easy to create flows, but you as developers, we know the importance of having tests and the importance of verif verifying the behavior of your system. Um, so yeah, I think this, it'll be awesome when we get it. And that's it really. Like I said, this was a bit of a reflection on Node-RED as a project, what have we achieved in this year? Um, and uh, some of the stuff we've been actively thinking about, um, but, yeah, you know, I really wanted to say thank you, not not just the who's watching now, thank you for you know, coming and watching the talk, but you know, thank you to everyone in the Node-RED community for the contributions you make, um, whatever you know, whatever that contribution might be, from uh, you know, helping helping make code contributions, getting involved in the forum, supporting other users in the community. Um, writing nodes, sharing them, whatever it might be. You know, you, you've all made a huge difference to, to what Node-RED, my, you know, my little side project from 10 years ago, um, which has long since outgrown me. Um, you know, you've all made and continue to make a big difference. So, um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, if, well, I'm sure many of you, if you're familiar with Node-RED, know how to get hold of me and, and get in touch. But you know, again, I'll plug, I do live stream 8 p.m. UK time every Monday, um, pretty much. And I spend an hour or so just doing some Node-RED development work. And again, that's that's grown into quite a, a nice little group of people who are there each week in the chat. And we, we just have a chat about what we're doing and People watch me f open up cans of worms of issues that I really regret doing on a live stream in public, but 
it's all good <laughs> and it's all good fun. So um, yeah, if you're interested in seeing more, please do join there. Otherwise, enjoy the rest of this stream. Um, you know, there's plenty of awesome talks to come. Um, yeah, uh, a big, if I don't get an opportunity to drop back on towards the end, you know, a huge thank you to everyone for giving up their time to, to make today possible. Um, and thank you all for, for watching the stream. And with that, I will cool. hand over. Well timed. Perfect. I got that right. Cool. Thank you, Nick. Um, excellent. So we've got a few questions. Um, we're going to start with a, with an icebreaker and so I can test. Yes, that works. <laughs> From Pablo. Is Nick's jacket color node red red? What I was actually wondering is what came first, the project or the hoodie? Was it more you had the hoodie, we'll name the project, it matches? Or? <laughs> uh, you know what? In in If you go back and watch the node red release videos, Nine times out of ten, I am wearing this red hoodie, and that that isn't accidental. Um, but I will admit, I bought this hoodie after. Yeah, th this is not a ten-year-old hoodie. <laughs> um, it is not quite the right shade of red, but um, yeah, uh, it's it matches. But no, it is um, okay. my own <laughs> subtle little. Nod little, to, little to the it's, the bra it's the branding. <laughs> um, okay, so on to some more uh, more detailed questions. So from Shan D. Hi, Nick. Uh, is there some roadmap on whether the Node Red editor would support a federated approach, single editor on device, showing flows from different devices without logging into these devices? So this is, uh, I guess, that separation of of editor and runtime um, and editing in different places. Yeah. I, so well, I, I will say. From to directly answer the question, uh, no, that, that's not something we've got a, a roadmap for, <laughs> but it, it is certainly something we've um, talked about and has, has you know, had some different amounts of discussion in the community. I think uh, Sam alluded to some of the work around splitting the editor from the runtime, so you can uh, run the editor as a sort of a standalone application and be able to point it to Node-RED instances elsewhere to actually edit their flows there's and we did do you know a lot of engineering a few years ago to to go a long way to enabling that but um i think it, there remain some challenges challenges we've not necessarily gone back to revisit and also uh it kind of needs a specific use case to build for um rather than the very trying to build a very general solution. And I think that that's the bit um, kind of lacked lacked the justification, if you like, for to spend time trying to solve that very specific problem when we have just so much other things we could do with Node Red. But you know, I'd love always love to hear what sorts of ideas the community have in that space. Um, you know, I I would sort of say, you know, with my day job hat on at Flowforge, this is something with, again, not not quite fully federated, but thinking about how you can manage editing flows that you then want to push out to multiple devices. You know, I know there are other platforms who who offer that type of thing. So, yeah, I think it's it's interesting. Um, Definitely yeah. stuff stuff in that space. It's just which way around it's done. Cool. Okay. Uh, next one, very quickly. Uh, a plus one for global variables. I think it was the environment variables. Definitely. Um, lots of lots of positive comments on on that one. Really, it seems something people are excited about. Uh, okay. A more question. Uh, question. So this was talking about the the locked flows mm -hmm. tab. Um, and actually, it was a, a yeah. It's an interesting question to me. Do the blocked or locked flows apply to a full deploy so if you i guess does that mean they restart when you do a full deploy if they're locked still so um that's that is a good question um i i don't think we've particularly put any thought as to why if they should behave any differently so um an important point would be um the runtime so if it was simply the editor stopped you making changes, that would go so far. But it's going to be an important part of this that the runtime API, the sort of the, the HTTP endpoint that the editor sends flows to, it will prevent changes being made to locked flows as well. Because um, otherwise, someone could just handcraft 
an appropriate request to the API to update whatever they wanted. So to make sure this is has some degree of security involved, um, we will be updating the runtime API to prevent updates to flows. Now, we haven't quite got that figured out yet, but um, yeah. And then to your question about whether it applies to a full deploy, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm currently of the mind that at that point, it's the same as any other flow. So if you do a full deploy, everything gets stopped and, and restarted. Um, and if you wanted to do a more selective deploy, then you would use one of the other existing modes we have. Yep, absolutely. I think there's a lot of people that even realize that there is that ability in the deploy menu to to only deploy your changed nodes. Um, until if you don't, if you're not familiar with it, yeah, if you if you're on the drop down on the the red deploy button, there's a couple of uh, a couple of other options in there. So next time, go and have a play. Um, it amazes me still. I I still find stuff. I've been using Node Red daily for I don't know how many years now, and there's still things where I discover. Oh, didn't know that was there. Uh, okay, um, a similar actually from the same uh, same poster, clear. Um, uh, but it's a related question, which I thought was quite interesting. So could we lock a flow with a password? So this was when you were talking about the sort of the user permissions and users being able to not edit specific flows or classes of users. And yeah, just the idea of maybe maybe a simple password on a flow. We've chosen not to take that approach, certainly for this initial piece of work, um, which you know, doesn't prevent us from exploring that in the future. But um from having looked at password securing things like subflows, we, we spent a bunch of time looking at uh, a couple of years ago now, before, before we introduced subflow modules, the ability to publish a subflow as an NPM node, um, there was quite a lot of discussion around password securing them, encrypting them, all, all these sorts of things. And um, it gets quite hard to do that right to, for it to be actually secure, um, because um, yeah, it's it. Given a user can just copy the JSON by hand and remove whatever flag you've put on it, um, you know, we've got to be mindful of how far this actually secures things, and be careful not to add something that makes you feel like it's more secure than it actually is if that makes sense yeah, so, yeah so that's why i sort of emphasized the um the locking primarily will be just helps you avoid accidental modification of flows once you get to password type stuff then you've got to be much more rigorous and it's got to be much more uh you you you're at that point you're trying to stop malicious changes and Yes, it, it yeah. gets much more complicated. <laughs> it's, it's it's not just one of those uh, you know these little suitcase lock type of <laughs> things that doesn't really stop anybody. Uh, okay, next one. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly which piece this is up, but talking about the history of changes in nodes. I think this was when you were talking about splitting the flow file and that sort of diffing and, and spotting what's gone on. So um, I think yeah, that's something related to version control and stuff. Yeah. So. I Certainly one of the discussions that is on the design designs forum that I alluded to is improving the storage API that sits underneath Node-RED to provide, well, to, to learn from, from the shortcomings of our existing storage API, which is invisible to many end users. But one of the things I learned when we introduced the projects feature in Node-RED this, this optional mode that gives you version control of flows in the editor is um, that's done outside of our normal storage API, which makes it not very portable for when you want to run Node-RED, perhaps with a database behind it rather than a local file system. Um, so this is one of those aspects of splitting the flows file is actually how much of that is how much do we, of that do we just do in our local file system storage implementation? Or is there actually something at the API level between Node-RED and the storage that helps, um, in, including is there a, what can we learn from the projects feature to improve that API so we can have version control 
that doesn't rely on files on disk, that, that it could be a database, but you can still get in the Node-RED editor a history of changes and all that sort of stuff. So that is one of the design discussions I've, I've kicked off in the, in the designs repository. And I would, um, yeah, um, I've kicked off, but then other things have taken over. It's, it's part of the splitting the flow files conversation to go back and revisit some of the discussion there. Cool. Okay. Uh, another one from Shan. So lots of comments. <laughs> Is there a discussion around credentials in exported flows? That's something we know we've talked about a little bit in the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah, credentials are re removed for security purposes. Uh, again, well, back to the security questions. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> credentials and exports. Yes. So I mean, you've you've touched on. Uh, it, it's an important point, and we we made the decision very early on that we would never return credentials back to the editor just so that we would never accidentally leak a password or an API token. Um, if, if someone hadn't secured the editor properly and they put it on the internet, then um, we provide some amount of protection. Um, that said, I absolutely understand the, the pain that can then cause of when you want to take you, know, you might be in your own entirely secure lockdown environment and you want to export your flows from one place to another and the credentials don't come with you. I'm, yeah, I'm, I think we are very aware of that as a limitation. Yes. And, and yes, there have been some discussions around, okay, what can we do in the editor to support you exporting your credentials in a secure way? Um, so, uh, again, I, I don't have a specific piece to report back to you, but it is one I'm aware of, and it is one we've been talking about. Um, so, yeah, I, I expect some movement in that um, in the near future as well. Cool. Okay, uh, we've we've got to go into a break, but we'll carry on if you're all right with a couple of a couple of others. Because yeah, all right. uh, so end to end tests from mm -hmm. Tobias. <laughs> yes, how to eat. This was again talking about the node testing framework, but the flow testing framework, sorry. Yeah, I, look, te te testing is a huge subject. Um, I think we're going to be realistic as to how much we can achieve in a low code environment. But the the model we're exp with, um, yeah, the, the model we're taking is a case of, given my flows, I will define a test case. And in this test case, I want, I will simulate inserting a message at this point with these properties and, um, and then add a, add a, you know, when it gets, when it gets to this other point in the flow, verify that the message looks, you know, has these other properties set or whatever, whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, when you talk end-to-end -end testing, I guess it depends what, what ends you mean. <laughs> um, but we, we want to try and build something that is flexible enough for you to create simple tests that can inject a message at one end, check what it looks like at the other end, the ability to stub nodes in the middle of a flow. So you might have a database node in the middle. And in, when you run your tests, you don't want to actually talk into that database. So be able to tell Node-RED replace that node with a uh, with this behavior so maybe say you know instead of called instead of calling that database node if you receive a message that looks like this send on a message that looks like that um, you know for those familiar with testing effectively writing a stub module for, for, for a node but doing again doing that in a low code accessible way, I mean, that, that's some of the real user experience UX design challenges around the test framework. But um, yeah, I, I think those sorts of tests would go a long way to plugging some of the gaps. Um, but I do recognize it will have its limitations at the level at which it just makes more sense to write tests in the more traditional way and you know, whatever framework you, you choose to write them in. But um, yeah, we're, we're trying trying to explore that space to see what makes sense. Cool. Uh, okay, uh, let's pick a just like out order, but um, 
Another another new comment, Mahmoud. Uh, hi from Turkey. I uh, wonder about the future of Turkish language interface mm -hmm. development and documentation. Um, he needs this. I think we may you may have just volunteered yourself, Mahmoud. But, uh, I'll let, <laughs> yeah, I'll let Nick. yeah. Uh, as again, as, as a community, we have no dedicated resources for for producing translations. So um, that's one in particular where we do appeal to to the community for your support, your help. If if you know you want to. Um, get involved by spending a couple of evenings <laughs> translating a few hundred thousand, oh, sorry, not, uh, not a hundred thousand, a few a hundred, maybe a thousand strings into your preferred language, then we would love that. And, and even help, if we can help facilitate bringing people, multiple people together of, from a particular, lang you know, interest in a particular mm -hmm. language, then that's something we, we would happily try and help help you guys coordinate absolutely and it definitely helps to have have a couple of people working on that just because trying to review a pr for translation when it's you don't speak the language is a bit it, <laughs> a bit of a guess as that well. is something we say that that you know we do occasionally get people who do this and we do say to them you know, thank you for your pull request um we would like to get someone else who natively speaks that language to cast an eye over it otherwise yeah we're we're very conscious of um, just, I and mean, it's inter always interesting to see, even in the st established languages like the, the German translations, how much iteration they go through in terms of trying to find the most appropriate translation of a term that, that and then getting it consistent across the whole platform. It, it, it's a real challenge, but um, you know, we, we look to the community to help us. Okay, uh, we'll we'll whiz through the last couple very quickly because only two, and they've probably okay. kept very short. Uh, then we we'll try and finish in two minutes. So, oops, I accept I've just deleted that one, but it was asking about WebAssembly uh, and NodeRed. Uh, so, if you want to, uh, any there we go. Show uh, and NodeRed and WebAssembly are they a match <laughs> band to happen? Have we done anything with with WebAssembly and NodeRed? Um, I, I'm not sure there's anything particular we would do in the core for it, um, but certainly. It's a really interesting space being able to create nodes in WebAssembly. Um, you know, there's nothing stopping people from doing that today. The main, one of the main challenges, and it applies to WebAssembly, it applies to worker threads, all these other things that enable you to get more performance, is actually often for Node-RED, the overhead is the data passing through the flow. And if you've got a really large message, if you have a WebAssembly node, there is going to, always going to be a cost getting that data into the WebAssembly. The WebAssembly might be super fast, but there's always going to be this barrier cost. Um, so, uh, yeah, but it, anyway, sorry, I, I could go on about that for hours and I, really, I, should, I should, shouldn't. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a good a good Monday night stream on, yeah, <laughs> yeah or something on WebAssembly. Sure. Cool. Okay, uh, I think that's pretty much it for you. Um, I was just going to do a quick shout. There's one... Um, Live up member has asked about uh, Laura Wan, um, and I thought maybe I'd, uh, I just while you would, while the question was there, I was going to bring up. Uh, so obviously, Node-RED huge third party ecosystem. So quick search on on flows.node-red.org for Laura it does show a couple of nodes there. Uh, Live up rainbow. So hopefully there's there's something for your I think or you know jump on the forums, ask ask questions there. Um, on that, cool. Awesome. Uh, okay, oops, let's bring that one off. Right, I shall uh, I shall say goodbye to you, Nick, and. Uh, We've got about a quick five minute uh, five minute break before we bring Sahil on the next talk. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the stream. Thanks, Nick. Bye. Cool. Uh, and okay, so just one more uh, bit of housekeeping question. Uh, I did answer in the thread, but Alan has pointed out here: Will these sessions be recorded? Uh, yes, Alan. We they they should be being recorded. YouTube. We're streaming out to YouTube live, which I believe keeps the record. Uh, but also, the intention is to try and break them up so that we won large video, youtube video of the whole event um the, the seven or eight hours worth but then uh, my plan for the weekend is to try and download that and slice it up and republish the individual talks so uh yes absolutely we want to uh, want to make as much of it accessible as possible um okay so say so we're going to have a quick five minute break and then we're going to be back with sahil talking about the microphone and camera node browser utilities so uh, see you in a bit
Hello, welcome back. Still getting the hang of this uh, <laughs> driving the stream yard here, so uh, not quite as seamless as I'd like. We'll get better next time. Um, okay, so uh, our next speaker is uh, Sahil Chugdai, who works for IBM Software uh, as a, an architect, I believe, or an engineer. I'm trying to remember now your title. <laughs> I did have all my oh, notes, so I just lost the browser page. <laughs> an architect. Architect, engineer, makes things work. <laughs> he does a bit yeah, of makes things work. Um, That's it. So, so he's going to be doing uh, a talk to us on the microphone and camera nodes. So uh, without much ado, I shall hand it over to you. Thanks, Sahil. All right. Hi there. Uh, can I do a, a live check? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we're all good. Excellent. Thanks. <laughs> right. So I'm going to be – my name is Sahil Choktai. I'm actually – I used to be a, a, an application architect, but I'm actually currently um, – part of the DevEx, the developer experience team. So I'm a developer advocate for IBM MQ. And, you know, we're, we're trying to add in some Node-RED stuff into MQ as well. And um, hopefully we'll have a video out to show some of the exciting things we're doing there. But um, I'm going to start this talk with a demonstration. The reason why I want to start with a demonstration is that I want to use the camera and I want to use the microphone. Um, and I'm already using it. Um, so it can be sometimes a bit tricky when you're doing this. So hopefully here, I mean, the two nodes I want to be talking about, the microphone and the camera, they are a form, a group with the file inject called the browser utilities. And I'll come to explain why we created these. But a simple demo of the camera node, um, for example, you know, I can just uh, take a, a shelfies, uh, and there you are, there's this picture. Um, and that's actually been saved away as well. Um, and that's that's how easy it is to get a picture, an image uh, into your flow um, and the Babel. So maybe I could have been on the Japanese stream. Now, I have no idea. I don't speak Japanese, so I don't know whether that was good or not, but I'm hoping it was. Um, and, the, you know, maybe if I was speaking to a wide group of uh, people, now this demo takes um, about a minute to run. Um, so this is a multi-language demonstration. So once this is running, I'll switch over to my deck. That was Arabic. This is also a multilingual demonstration. Así que esta es una demostración de varios idiomas. Così si tratta di una manifestazione multilingua. Il s'agit donc d'une démonstration multilingue. Dus dit is een demonstratie met meerdere talen. And this will be the final one, I think. So I talked over her then. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the Chinese one. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's what I'm going to be doing is a demonstration, which I've already done. I'm going to give you a background as to why we created these nodes, um, what they are and how they were created, and also some of the uh, issues we see um, and yeah, maybe a call for action. It's open source and it would be great to get some of the community to help us uh, uh, when issues are found to, to help us solve some of them. So uh, let me just go into full screen in here. So the background. Um, when we developed these nodes, I was the um, beta program manager for a whole series of machine learning based um, APIs, um, such as speech recognition and visual recognition. Um, and that's really, I mean, if I'm looking at APIs, if you're a de developer advocate, sorry, if you're a beta program manager for APIs, you're really a developer advocate. Um, and because it's machine learning, we were, we're getting interest from both developers and non-developers. Um, and when they wanted to use it, you know, 
it's speech recognition. You've got to get some speech to be able to recognize and decipher and visual recognition. You've got to get some images, capture some images to be able to recognize um, and you know, identify, you know, character recognition, facial recognition, all this kind of stuff that um, visual, visual a recognition APIs uh, promised. Um, so, so what we wanted to do was to be able to capture the images and voices so that we could feed them into the APIs, feed them into machine learning, you know, feed them into um, AI uh, capabilities. Um, and it's all possible with JavaScript. It's you know, not too difficult, but it's not trivial and it's not repeatable. Um, and you have to go um, and you know, learn some incantations, so that's the word, incantations you know, that have been created by um, web, web kits, browser web kits, uh, not gurus, but priests. Um, and you've got to make sure that you've uh, yeah, recite them correctly so that the, everything works. Um, and occasionally you might be able to work out how it's working as well. So it is not trivial, it's non-repeatable. And for non-developers, um, it's impossible. For developers, it's hard. Um, and what it does, is if you're having to write uh, the code to capture the images, to capture the voice, to capture sound, um, that's what you're concentrating on. And you're not concentrating on the usage um, of, of those. Um, and that's what NoBread provides. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, provides an, uh, a canvas for you to, to be able to reuse elements easily and then concentrate on the big problem. There are a lot of, a lot of small areas, speech to text, translate, text to speech, uh, yeah, yes, making, uh, playing sound and capturing sound uh, have been done for you. You can actually go, uh, go away and put that together as an application, maybe create some other capabilities or you know, create some other uh, uh, applications or usages of those uh, capabilities. So, yeah, you know, we, we were sh we were sharing um, essentially JavaScript and HTML with everyone, and saying, you know, this is what you've got to include into your uh, template node, and you know, include this, bring this uh, uh, JavaScript in, and and it will work, and you can capture. And wasn't wasn't working. So, we, I set up a, a workshop challenge, um, and these are the all the contributors to. Um, just the browser nodes. There were other things that we created uh, were created by other people, but these were the people that created the uh, the three browser nodes. Uh, in principle, principally, it was Chris and Yassine. Um, and the challenge I gave them, because I, you know, I was the sponsor for the for the challenge, um, was to capture image and speech. Um, they actually managed to capture videos as well, but we only wanted. Uh, uh, images, um, feed those into the flow um, so that anyone that's wants, that needs to be able to use images or voice or sound um, in an application building on Node-RED, um, it's just a case of you know, put it onto the palette, grab it from the palette, put it onto your flow editor, onto your canvas, um, and then yeah, it's, it's working. So it saves time. Um, and I was thinking at the time that it would become something like a web part. Um, but Chris and Yassine had other ideas. Um, so they created um, inject nodes. Now, um, this is a snippet of code from the... Um, sorry, Sahil, uh, sorry, sorry, I think I think we're still on your... I don't know if it's, it's the slides haven't incremented. <laughs> we're still on the, the main PowerPoint. I don't know if you're... We're still seeing the title slide. You still only seen the title side. Yes. Let me end the show. So, uh, can you see the agenda one? Now? It's, it's not. I think it's sharing the wrong screen then, because we're just seeing the the PowerPoint. Um, you know, slide uh, editor. Okay, right. So that's the title <laughs> slide. That's the agenda. Can you see the agenda? Uh, no, no, it's not changing. It's 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 just frozen on the PowerPoint editor. Right. So let's remove you from the stream and add you back in just in case. It was... <laughs> ah, and I've got your, your desktop window. I wonder if that was. 
I'm just so going to minimize yeah, how it's moving at least. Yeah, now we can we can see it moving and things. I don't know whether that was StreamYard that froze or something, maybe. I, I don't know. So so I won't go anyway, into Anyway, it's moving now. I'll just, I'll just uh, clip through them. Oh, by yep. the way, this, this, was the, this, was, uh, this was the image that I captured. Yeah, we saw we saw that. The, the demo all worked. It was just when you, <laughs> went, to, when you right. went to PowerPoint. Right, so Stop you can them. see the background? Yep, that's good. Yep, that's working. Right, we'll that's the background. This is the Y. Yep. Okay. Um, I could go over those again. And this is the the what. So as I said, the the main contributors for those those three nodes were, were Chris and Yassin. Um, and the challenge that I gave them as the sponsor was to, to be able to capture image and sound, uh, feed that into a flow through node red, um, so that you know anyone that wanted to be able to use uh, you know, sound or images uh, in an in an application, principally a Node Red application, could do it very quickly, and they didn't have to be a developer as well. You know, uh, anyone anyone with a you know, a bit of business uh, uh, knowledge could be able to could come in and actually create something, um, and maybe even innovate. Um, and at the time. And when I set them challenge, uh, I was envisaging that they would be they would be creating a web part, um, but they didn't. They created inject nodes, um, and they this there you can see the um, <laughs> the uh, a snippet of code from the the browser. So this is the re the start recording, um, and you'll see that it's actually using the audio context. context. So if you look up you know, JavaScript audio context, this you can find code uh, very easily. But, you know, you have to be able to you know, <laughs> put the the same uh, the right to recipe together. Sometimes you might even be able to follow what's going on, um, but but you can get that to work. Um, and the, and what they did, what you've seen in Chris did, was to to use that to actually capture the image or the um, the sound, uh, because essentially they function in, in a very, very similar way, um, and then capture them as a blob. And now it's in as a blob in the um, in the browser, um, and it's got to get into the flow. So to get into the flow, it's got to be passed into Node-RED running on the server, um, and they do that through, um, and they did that through an HTTP request. Um, and that gets injected into the flow. Um, and the way it's done is you can have multiple instances. So if you, if you noted on my demo, there were two different uh, microphones. Um, and, it, and what you could do, and this is what they had in the, at the beginning, was that you know, if you had two different microphones and you clicked on one, um, the output was sent to both, uh, and both flows were initiated. And you don't want that. You want to be able to yeah, send send the uh, uh, for example the the soundtrack to the the right microphone so it goes through into the into the 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 correct flow. Um, so yeah, you know, over here you can see that. Uh, uh, Last week we had six and a half thousand downloads. I mean, it's nothing compared with uh, the number of downloads that Node-RED has, but th this is uh, this is qu quite significant. Uh, this week is um, it's tailed down, but on an average, it's about six and a half thousand. If you if you go across, sometimes it's a bit more, sometimes it's a bit less. Um, it is open source. You can uh, grab hold of the the code, um, and the biggest challenge for for us or for me. Is is maintenance um, bump releases? You know, catching up, catching up, staying uh, with the the right version of Node Red, uh, the right version, the current version of uh, Node JS, um, changes in the browser support, and when they, when breaking changes happen, um, it, it becomes quite difficult to um, <laughs> to to work out what's going on, and then you have to go. Go through and do some testing, um, and some code changes, and a lot of the time, because it's um, changes in how the WebKit works. 
um, you have to go in and you know, again go back to these the WebKit priests uh, and find out find out what they've done, what what changes in the uh, the strict incantation you need to make, um, see if they work, and then just try them across browsers. So we this works on um, Safari, works on Chrome, works on Firefox, and just to make sure that it still works across all those browsers, um, and it can be quite a quite quite a headache. So. One of the great things is if you do find something, you can fix it as well. That would be much appreciated. Um, and maybe some of the uh, other features. As I said, when the guys were actually developing it, they did actually have a, a mechanism to actually capture um, video. But we decided not to, uh, to pursue that um, because of the way we capture the blob and we send the blob through an HTTP request. Now, if everything is running on your browser, on your own machine, like I've got Node-RED running locally now, it's not such a problem. But if you're sending this, yeah, a, a massive uh, video recording uh, through HTTP um, to the server, and it, it can be quite a, a big latency. So that's why we didn't do it. So that maybe, um, you know, we could add that in the uh, in the future. Um, and that's, that's brought me to an end. I think I'm a bit early. I spoke too fast. Sam? That's okay. Sorry. I'm catching up. <laughs> it caught me out of my, head. <laughs> my headphones in. Um, cool. No, that's, um, that's cool. We're, uh, where are we for time? So, um, okay. Yeah, we've got, we've got about 10 minutes uh, before the next speaker. So um, I'm just looking. I don't think we've had any specific questions on this some recordings. Um, but uh, maybe maybe if you want to go back um, to to the demo, so well, I'm trying to think of things, things that would be. So you you showed the um, obviously the, the microphone, the camera as they're using the get user media. So obviously you have to have the editor open um, to, yes. to tr tr need to inject those. So the, these work through the editor um, if you wanted to run it, but it does mean that you can run it. So no dread can be running wherever, and it's just you know you you can run no dread in the cloud and access them from. The, the oh, local right. camera is, is the camera of the machine that the browser you're using the editor on. Yeah. That's, this is exactly how it works. And also the file inject works in exactly the same way. Um, so with the file inject, uh, let's just put a, a debug mode in. I didn't say, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd missed this. I've seen the camera. I don't think I've seen the file inject. It's quite interesting actually to me for, for something yeah, so, else. So. <laughs> um, yeah, let's just join the two together. Um, so again, Actually, the interesting thing is, I could uh, I could inject an image. Let's do the uh, the one you just took. It all gets a bit circular. <laughs> yeah, I could inject an image into the into here as well. Um, let's go in there instead of here. Um, if I deploy that again, the the other uh, file node that comes it comes with uh, Node Red only works if this file so, mode, so yeah, yeah. That, that, that works off the that local file system or on Node Red where Node Red is running. Yeah, on your same machine, but the file inject um, works. Upload, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, it works in exactly the same way. Um, in that you go away and you pick a picture, same one, and it sends it through. And it, um, and it so uploads. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really it's a file. It's a file upload node as much as a, a file upload and an object. Yeah, yeah. But again, oh, yeah, it, it works in in exactly mm. the same way, which is why there were the three nodes were grouped together. Mm. Um, so what? Um, presumably, I'm just trying to think what the what the limiting factor on the size of that upload is. That's going to be on the. Um, I think the um, node red has a max pay, payload size, max post size. Somewhere yeah. configured to a default, which is normal. I think five meg by by default off the of my head, but you can obviously tweak that. So it's 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 obviously going to be constrained by by the maximum upload. But then I think that would apply to your to a to a rest endpoint or something as well. So that's right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'll show you the code. Um, so the that's so I'll show you the the JavaScript for the camera node. You'll see. Um, this is where the yep. uh, the image is being sent. Cool. So yeah, so it's it's yeah, it's posting to a but on the on admins. Obviously, yeah, it's got to be 
you've got to have um you'll be logged into the editor so it's a it's a secured endpoint if you like for exactly um, yes cool. yep and and yeah and that's and then it's got to be you know because it's going over there um over http uh, into into node red then then it has to yeah be limited in terms of size uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'm just looking. So we maybe I think we've got a question from from Pablo um, about that saying it's a bit buggy. Uh, hang on, let's see if we can bring it on screen. Um, if you're injecting, <laughs> yeah. So if you're injecting a JSON, if you upload a JSON file, but it's 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 va invalid JSON, it it fails apparently. So that's I guess is that the node or is that the okay? Yeah, so so we, we, where are you injecting it into? I think he's saying sorry with the file inject node. So if you yeah. if you inject if you upload it I don't know yeah so I'm saying Pablo if you upload a JSON file does it 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 doesn't output or I mean if it's because it's passing the file inject node will be treating it as just a string will it as what what it outputs I guess okay let's see what it does uh, you just need a JSON file to. Mm -hmm. Well, well, I think he said an in an invalid JSON file. So <laughs> okay, um, well, okay. If you send an invalid yeah. JSON, file, it shows an error in the browser console. Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's that's the yeah. Um, okay, all right. Um, let's have a look. See what happens. If I can find a JSON file, um, that's a JSON file. My package it's a JSON. JSON file. Perfect. That's a good one to. So that's a valid. Presumably, is a is a valid JSON file. Yeah. Um, and that's what's come in. That that's looks correct, like it's parsed it. Yeah. And that's it as a string. So that's coming, yeah, straight off the. So I can't quite see the um, screen, right? But yeah, no, that, that, so that seems to work. I think it's, it's, it's specifically, yeah, now go, go and break the JSON file, put a comma somewhere. <laughs> you want me to break? Um, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> right, let's find. So I think this is the JSON file that was grabbing, wasn't it? Um, Gosh, yeah, it's it's the one with no, it's the one with no drag. It was the package dot JSON. Yeah, you don't really want to break your. <laughs> just make sure. uh, it's, it's. I'm just trying to work out where that. It's not in here. That's the problem. That's looking oh, just, somewhere just, else. Yeah, um, chuck it. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have <laughs> to try that yeah. separately. Yeah, well, um, yeah, definitely. I think uh, so. You can go away and uh, yeah, up. So I'm guessing. I mean, it should just be a the file inject should be quite happy with it just as a as a string, and then it, if it's text or or um, binary, it should just output whatever's been uploaded, and then it's yeah, up to the I mean, flow. It, it gets captured as as a blob, and it gets just uh, right. sent through. I wonder if it's so, something uh, something in in the message dot. I suppose making the payload, whether it's trying, message dot payload, trying to parse it and make it a uh, parse it as JSON, and that's what's failing. So interesting. Oh well, there's definitely a, and I'm assuming you you it's on um. You've got the GitHub repo with issues, so we can for this project, have you? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a GitHub. Uh, we can raise yeah, an issue. <laughs> oh yeah, you can find it. Um, so if you go to uh, Node Red Flows, the question is: let's 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 see your scorecard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, that's in browser utility. File inject, was it? Oh. I like dipping. Yeah. Very oh. contrary browser utils, that's your... Scorecard is... Okay, so yeah, you got the view get card, GitHub. Yeah. So on GitHub, we should, you should be the links to the issues there, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so there's, there's two open yeah. issues. Cool. Okay, so yeah. Audio yeah, streaming, issue yeah. on Chromium um, and audio streaming. Audio. As well. Interesting one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, well, um, yeah, definitely. Maybe Pablo chuck an issue on there, or, or see he's going to look at it now. But um, yeah, I think, I, think <laughs> I, can, I can understand what you. I'm going to go and have a play with that node this evening or something. Anyway. So. Um, yeah. This. I mean, there's there's a whole series of other nodes that. Uh, I mean, if you go into this uh, this group here, which is uh, which is why the lettuce or the green water. Um, as an in joke, is uh, our our symbol, but this is a whole series of things that we created um, that get used uh, as well. Cool. 
Awesome. Okay. Well, we are. I can see our next speaker is is ready. So perhaps we'll. Uh, if unless there's any more questions, I'm just going to quickly look at the YouTube thread as well because there's a bit of lag. Otherwise, we'll um, we'll wrap it up there. Yeah, and obviously, when I when I ask the questions, we then have to wait a few seconds for the stream to catch up and, uh, <laughs> and see if there's anything from anywhere else. But uh, some great comments. We say we've still got. We've got just under 100 people on the stream now, so it's uh, doing pretty well today. I'm pretty pleased with that. I think we had about we peaked at about 120, obviously for Nick's keynote and uh, things. Again, all the talks are going to be recorded. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping all the talks are recorded. <laughs> it should be. It should be YouTube. YouTube and Streamyard should be capturing them. So we'll uh, we'll do some some editing and things and uh, and get those up as soon as we can. But uh, okay, well I'll say goodbye then. Thank you very much, Sahil, and uh, yeah. enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers, mate. Okay, so um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but uh, I can say see our next uh, our next speaker is uh, is waiting. So Mark can give us a thumbs up. <laughs> if, yep, he can uh, he can hear me. Uh, Mark, can you share your share your screen as well into this one? Ready for um, ready for things, and uh, yeah, we go. Yep, we've got your slides. Okay, so oops, now so he'll just be. Let's bring Mark on. Hello, Mark. Hey, how are you? Can you hear Good, me well? Thanks. Yep, audio is good. Awesome. Okay, so uh, Mark is a. I've I've completely lost the list of people's job titles. Are you an advocate at Palina? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, oh. I work at Palina as developer advocate. Cool. Okay, um, and you're going to talk to us about Ming. <laughs> um, yeah. Which yeah, I don't know if that's it's a bit of a British kid slang for Ming is a is a term of you know something's minging. It's not very uh, <laughs> not very good. But yeah. Uh, yeah, an open source an open source lamps up. So Ming is. Uh, yeah, please don't spoil it, people. Please, yeah, please, we won't spoil it. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk about that. But uh, okay, so I'll uh, I'll bring your slides on. And, Thank uh, you. Whoop, then we have the inception yeah, moment. <laughs> so, yeah, let me know if the okay. slides go. Uh, yeah, well. that's all working. You're presenting, so I shall uh, hand okay, it over to you. So, uh, actually, okay. you will need uh, I will need your help for oh, so don't go, okay. please, <laughs> because I have a question for the audience, and I not I will not be able to see the the. Uh, okay, yep. The chat, but yeah, I would like to ask to everyone, please. Uh, how did you learn programming? What did you? Yeah, what was your first language, or how did you learn programming, Sam? Uh, for, so, for, oh, for, for me, so, yeah. Um, good question. So I, I always like to say to people, I'm not a developer. Um, I, okay. I, I came at this from. I didn't train as a developer. Um, my background is in, I guess, system administration um, okay. originally. So I, I got into it from sort of scripting. Um, so I guess my first. Other than, I mean, I suppose as, as a kid, like bits of basic on a computer, but but professionally, um, it was really sort of Bash, um, and I was writing Bash, I was writing bits of bash okay. scripts, um, and then awesome. I went to Bash, to Perl, to PHP, really show my age here now, um, <laughs> Bash, PHP, Bash, nice. Perl, PHP, Python, and then I ran out of languages that began with P, um, and, and then I'm doing Node, so... Um, Nice. But uh, other things from people. So say we've got a few comments. Uh, C plus plus C C nice. uh, assembly at school. Wow. wow. Okay. That was uh, a really nice school. Basic in a TI clone. Or not? I don't know. <laughs> be fair. Yeah. Well, if, or, uh, yeah. If you're still I did, here, did yeah. do some. I did do a little bit of assembly at college. Actually, I remember on it. I J A T. Uh, yeah. Java, sure. Minecraft. That's interesting. Oh, so cool. yeah, what, what you built it for is the um, Pascal. Okay, so yeah, let me show you how I learn programming. I, I learned programming with this uh, Amstrad CPC that I have at home that my parents bought to my sister. And I started learning basic uh, with this user guide. Uh, I don't know if anyone here had a similar thing at home, but yeah, this is how I start. Maybe this is why I'm not a, an excellent programmer because I started learning basic. <laughs> but I really love some actually how you differentiate between like um, kids programming with professional programming because when I, I'm a computer engineer as well, but um, when I start to learn uh, professional programming, actually, I start with something as, as, um, whoop, as you mentioned, uh, which is this, which is uh, I start learning PHP. And when I start like uh, making websites for people, I needed a stack or something to really use the friction that I had to publish those websites for my customers. So I start using a stack uh, called LAMP which is for Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. Well, some people can say Python or Perl or something else, the P. Yeah, that's uh, we can have a discussion here. But this is actually, yeah, the 
on on my professional no uh, programming um, part what I use to reduce the friction to start doing things more professionally okay and but and then uh, actually this this talk I shouldn't be doing this talk it should be a Belen ambassador giving this talk but I'm going to talk about him in a sec but we, we were speaking with some Belen ambassadors so what can we do for the Internet of Things okay and yeah so most of us yeah we love node red and and i think it's it's a great contribution to yeah for for the new iot developers to get introduced to something like node red but can we help them to just um for example simplify or reduce the friction to create uh, new iot projects as as i was doing in the past with a lamp stack so it's not just i deploy php and apache on my on my laptop and it works uh, and at, at Belena, oops, I work as well with a lot of developers from the community who just have a Raspberry Pi or a single port computer in their hands, and they just don't know how to start using it. So we were thinking with this ambassador, okay, can we create something to reduce friction to these users to just start with something that it's open source and can just, uh, yeah, reduce this friction and, and can make things that are completely awesome? And, and this is why we got into this. Okay, so we both started with this lamp uh, for a web development 30 years ago. Why don't we create something uh, for the IoT? And actually, this um, this developer is you can find it on Twitter. It's embedded IoT. He's uh, Alex Lennon. He's actually now the being the Red Sea. This is why he's not here. Um, but you can find him, yeah, on on Twitter on embedded um, IoT or uh, well underscore IoT, sorry or you can yeah you can just google him he's uh, he has a company called dynamic devices and he's a, a really fan of north red um but he so he introduced me to this concept of ming okay so ming means uh mqtt influxdb north red and grafana and basically what he's advocating is okay these should be like the lamb stack uh that it was 30 years ago for web developers and help a lot of people to get into the web development world, it should be like the open source the stack for IoT developers today. So basically, yeah, probably most of you know this, but in case that you don't know MQTT, it's a PubSub um, pro communication protocol. So this is the data communication. I'm gonna show some examples that MQTT is used like for industrial purposes in, in some minutes. Uh, InfluxDB for data storage node red for data processing, acquisition, et cetera, and Grafana for data visualization. I know that some people can tell me that, yeah, we can visualize as well on node red, uh, et cetera, but yeah, I don't want to get into these. I don't want to compare products. It's just, yeah, something that, that we got, um, that we think that it makes sense and can help a lot of new IoT developers or web developers, for example, that are trying to get into the IoT these days. And yeah, if, if you want to add new alternative or you want to change InfluxDB for Redis or whatever, yeah, that's fantastic. Please uh, contribute. I will, show, I, I will show you in a second the GitHub repositories. Um, but yeah, if you are uh, asking yourself, okay, yeah, this sounds good. How can I get started? Okay, so uh, this is what we did. Actually, I work at Belena. I'm not sure if anyone knows what is Belena, um, but Belena, maybe anyone use this? I don't know. Uh, Feel free to tell it on the chat. I'm not reading the chat, but uh, if you use this software called Belina Etcher that we make for, it's an open source uh, project to flash SD cards and USB drives, um, you already use Belina software. So why, what we try to do is just to reduce friction for IoT uh, developers to manage their fleets of devices. And for managing fleets of devices, we mean that we help um, developers and companies to update the software of IoT devices remotely Give, and we provide as well fleet management tools to um, access remotely to device over SSH. Uh, we create VPNs to connect with the devices, and we have a, a tool and APIs to access remotely to all of these devices as well that are deployed all around the world. I'm not going to get uh, a lot into that, but something that it's different actually from how you use probably not red these days, if you don't use Belena or maybe you already is using this way, is that Belena only works on containers. So for running um, an, an IoT device with Belena, you need to deploy Belena OS, which is a Linux open source operating system 
which is running on Yocto. And the different thing of Belina OS, it, it only runs containers. You, you cannot run anything on the host OS. So probably, yeah, you are, I don't know, if you're running not right on your device, on your laptop, and yeah, uh, and you install just new things and, and access to the GPIO of your device uh, automatically, this is a bit different because we want to take the advantage of containers in the edge um, for because yeah to to enable new developers as I'm going to show you in a second. But actually, what I did is just to try to simplify this and create a project which, in a really easy way, if there are no containers, can um, can provide a Belina device with uh, an MQTT container, InfluxDB container, Node-RED running on a container, and Grafana running on another container, and each other can talk. Okay. I'm going to show you this in a second. So for this, I created um, yeah the Ming uh, application. Actually, we have uh, let's see if this works. Um, we have something called Belina Hub, Hub Belina.io, which is a marketplace for IoT and, and edge applications. I created this project. So if you have a Raspberry Pi for three, two, one, zero, in theory, that's, this might work. You just click deploy. And this will deploy you an application, and you will be able to add your Raspberry Pi to that fleet and, and do what I'm going to show you in a second. OK, actually, the code is here. Whoops, I didn't need to open. It's it's on my GitHub repository, mpous uh, slash ming. Um, and actually, clicking Deploy with Belena, you as well can, can use it. But I'm running a lot because I'm going to, to do a, a live uh, demo, actually. Um, so yeah, some examples of Ming. So maybe you're saying, okay, this guy, yeah, it's so it worked. But actually, yeah, yeah, if you deploy this, basically you have Node-RED, well, InfluxDB running on the port 8086, MQTT on the 1883, Node-RED on the 80, and Grafana on the 8080. Okay, I have it here running. Actually, this is how it would look like. Uh, and then if you click public device URL, you open the port 80, you have a shiny new not red ready to rock and you have a grafana on the port 8080 if you can see here okay and uh with mqtt influx etc ready to to start connecting things but <clears throat> i was thinking okay so let me let's show some examples that uh because i'm actually using ming for most of the projects i'm doing these days uh, to show millennia projects because i think it's it's awesome uh, we just actually, honestly, uh, we used to use like a year ago Telegraph, but I felt that it was super magic. So I decided to stop using Telegraph. I don't have anything against Telegraph, sorry. But um, so start using Node-RED because yeah, it's it's more simple to to developers and people to understand what's happening behind the scenes, or kind of, or at least you, there is a way to see it. So one of the examples, and actually it was on the comments on the chat uh, some minutes ago. It was okay, how to connect a LoRa device. Uh, with no red. So I have a potential solution here. Probably um, it's not perfect, but uh, uh, it will give you an idea. For the people who don't know what is LoRa, LoRa is a radio um, communication system uh, which uses free bands uh, available on the spectrum of 800, 900 megahertz, depending on where you are based. And basically, it's a low power weight area network technology. Uh, that means that you can have a LoRa node which is usually a microcontroller sending LoRa radio packages. Um, so these are the devices here on the on the left. I hope that you can see my mouse. Then we see we have the gateways, which are devices, usually single board computers as well, uh, microcontrollers could be or microprocessors, uh, which are devices that has a LoRa interface and just catch all the LoRa radio packages and convert them into IP messages. OK, and these messages are being sent to the LoRa network server, which is, uh, in this case, I'm going to show the things, the stack, which is an open source uh, LoRa network server. But there are others like Chirp stack, Helium, et cetera. And finally, from the things stack, you can just send the data to, yeah, I don't know, IoT platforms, such as UbiDots, Datacake, AWS, whatever. Or actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you right now an example. It was, it was not working since. It worked two days ago. It was not working yesterday, and I hope it's working now because it started to work five minutes ago. But I'm going to show you how you can, in one Raspberry Pi, deploy all the um, all the uh, containers needed uh, to have all the LoRa um, stack, all the LoRa one stack from gateway 
to uh, the, the stack for the LoRa network server and all and all, how all the Ming below help you to have like a private LoRa one network in one embedded device in the edge where you have everything that you need. Okay, so basically we have here the things the stack that I mentioned. It's a, as you can see, it's on a Raspberry Pi next to me. I cannot show you because it's working now. Uh, and I, uh, I'm in a room. Actually, I'm in Mexico in a, a hotel with a. Uh, we are doing the Valena summit here, so it's 22.2 degrees. So what I want to do is I want to send this data to Grafana. So what we are going to do is we are going to use NodeRed. So NodeRed in this case it's on port 1880. So as as I mentioned before, and uh, we are going to um, use the containers. Uh, that are, are running on this device. So every container, um, instead of using localhost, I can just call stack. It's that it's the name of the container. Uh, well, I have it on the slide. I don't want to show you now. Open in a cloud, but as you can see, the container is called stack. Um, so I'm gonna um, stack. It's actually running an MQTT um, um, system. So subscribe to single topic. The topic is V3. At all the devices, uh, let me check oh, my notes here. So I'm, I'm going to do this live. Uh, V3 plus devices plus app. So I'm saying that any device that it's sending data here uh, to any topic that it's an app link, I want to get, uh, and this is a JSON. OK, done. But probably I need as well the security. So I need to go here, security. And if you run the things the stack, you go to integrations, MQTT. And this is my username. Let's hope that it works. And this is the password, which is super long. Update, done. Let's click deploy. Yeah, okay, it's connected. Awesome. Uh, actually, if I, okay, now what I'm going to do, it's I'm going to change this. Um, oopa. So I want to say that the message payload, it's message, uh, let me check as well my notes, sorry for that, I don't remember that. Okay, measurement and payload, I need, okay. Oppa, not here. So I need measurement, okay, I'm going to do something I'm gonna put the bar here so we're gonna get the messages if it works let's hope that it's working if not we go to the next one might be working or not okay I need to deploy come on <laughs> sorry for that Uh, meanwhile, I will add InfluxDB on the other side. Okay. So it's a plain message. Okay, end device ID. Okay, so I want actually the end device ID as measurement. And then I want to add another one. Sorry for this which is the message and the message is um let me find the coded payload okay this one this is super handful so who created this uh, way to copy and paste it in the json uh, path it's incredible um okay i have this so let's go to influx as i mentioned before so we have uh we don't go to the local host we go to the container called InfluxDB, and I already created a database there. It's called Balena. Uh, it's super secure, no username, no password. OK, this is just for demo purposes. So let's see if we can deploy this. I'm going to kill this and add this. And I want to see on the message. Opa. Yeah, let's try this. Let's... OK, let's see if it works. OK, so we are sending this. And if it's working well, let me. OK, so we are getting temperature, humidity, like the first values here. 
Uh, so wow, it worked. Uh, so at the end of the session, I'm gonna see if we can get if we saw more information. But you can see how actually it's very easy if we have all of these tools: MQTT, Influx, Node-RED, and Grafana, just to yeah make everything run in, in just a second um, for a for an IoT developer. Okay. Another uh, example that I want to show you. So I have some friends who are using uh, Nordred and actually all the mink stack for industrial IoT gateways and put them on on real factories to to work on the yeah on, on industrial IoT. I'm not sure if you are aware of this concept of industrial IoT, but most of the industries have like old um, protocols like Modbus, Modbus TCP, etc. So in this case, yeah, probably it's very small, but I'm going to publish these slides later and you can watch it on YouTube later. So here in this example, we made a workshop with, um, yeah, uh, an edge device, an IoT gateway running all the Ming stack and just getting access to the Modbus TCP of a factory. In this case, it was a simulated factory and just having the Modbus flows on, on the Node-RED, it was so easy to just get all the data. Uh, in this case, uh, yeah, InfluxDB was not here on uh, directly on this flow. It was on other flows because we were using MQTT for an, a new a kind of a new concept uh, of that it's on the industrial IoT, which is it's not new, but uh, it's, a, it's a marketing concept called unified namespace. So the idea it was everything was going to MQTT broker. And then from the MQTT broker, it was going to other places like, okay, this goes to the InfluxDB, this goes to that machine. On, or everyone can subscribe to this. Okay. So not sure if I'm running out of time, but yeah, let's kind of wrap up or why I'm here explaining this. So um, first of all, as a Belen mission, it's to reduce friction to IoT developers or fleet owners uh, to yeah scale their number of uh, connected IoT. I want to as well reduce friction of developers who want to get started with uh, IoT and as something like LAMP helped me actually to yeah, reduce my friction when I started on the web development uh, like 20 years ago. I think something like Ming uh, can help to, to reduce this friction to all of these developers. And as I show you, it, it's not only for like newbies or for beginners. I think yeah, it's a tool that it's a start that I started to be to see on professional projects like yeah, a private LoRaWAN network deployed on a farm or for example, yeah, on, on a, in industries that, uh, yeah, they have like um, old technologies like Modbus uh, devices, et cetera. And they want just to access to the data on in the edge with no need to use any cloud or anything. So devices are already available to, to run all of this information. And yeah, and, and we are looking for uh, to have people who would like, would love to have contributors helping us to make this uh, bigger or to just expand the world to not to use Node-RED on with all of these other systems. So I created yeah, this Ming. Uh, you can find everything on my GitHub repository as well and probably Alex Lennon, Lennon uh, GitHub repository very soon. And yeah, if you have any questions or anything, just you can contact me. These are my credentials and let me check if we have more information here from the last uh, five minutes. So yeah, temperature is rising. So, wow, it worked, the demo. I, I didn't expect that uh, an hour ago. So that was it. I was running a lot. Questions, please. Let me get uh, back here. Sorry for that. There we go. That's OK. You can hear me now because I think I was muted. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yes. Cool. That's right. Um, yeah, it's very brave running a live demo, um, especially with hardware. Um, yeah. No, uh, to be honest, I demo for my talk and I might or might not. <laughs> yesterday it didn't work, actually. So, yeah, it's uh, it, I just refreshed it again. I tried. Uh, meanwhile, I was listening to Nick and, and the other speakers. So, uh, actually, it started to work. Like I, I told to Nick, like, what, five minutes ago, like 10 minutes before um, the presentation. So, yeah, the demo gods were with me today. In, especially especially with hardware in a hotel room in a foreign country that's yeah yeah well yeah well i'm in the convention center of this hotel okay. so yeah well 
it, it, the, the Wi-Fi is, is working, so but I don't know. It's, the, the problem was not any, anything. The, the problem, actually, it, it, just to explain all the technicities, it was, so I'm creating this private LoRaWAN network. Actually, I'm in Mexico. I'm using the European version, so I'm not sure if the concentrator is very happy. <laughs> Sometimes there is a bug on the gateway that gives some time uh, problems with time synchronization between the server and the uh, and, uh, radio that it's running on the device. So actually, that was the problem. Everything was working, but it was giving me this time synchronization thing that you cannot do much. Oh, um, yeah. But yeah, sorry. OK, okay. Um, so I think we've got a couple of questions coming in. But say, if anyone's got any questions for the speakers, please put them in the Slack, uh, sorry, in the uh, YouTube comments, and uh, and I'll bring them in. Um, a quick one from me, actually. I mi maybe missed this, but in your the stack you're running on the Pi, so the MQTT broker that you're running on there, is that Mosquito, or is that...? Uh, yeah, let me check. I uh, I think uh, let, let me share this with. Uh, uh, let me so everyone can see the the Docker Compose. Uh, I kind of publish this. On, oh, on. Uh, let me share my screen again. Yeah, if that's okay, with you. I can bring you in. Yeah, that's fine. Is it? It's still here. No, I stop. Sorry. Uh, yeah, you just hit publish and it'll. Okay, give me a sec. Uh, by the way, everything that I show that it's working with Valena, actually, it's working with container. So it, in theory, it, this might work with Docker. If it doesn't work with Docker, just let me know. Just put a, an issue on the on the repo. OK, but yeah, just as well to mention that Valena has an end to a, an end to an open source stack. So and you can connect up to 10 devices for free as well on Valena Cloud. So yeah, no, um, um, that was not pretended to be like uh, an advertisement for Valena, but <laughs> we just tried to people anyone to do it in one click. Um, you mentioned, sorry, what? Uh, so was it with you running the broker? Are you running a broker I, on the? So I'm using Eclipse. Yeah, it is Mosquito. Mosquito. Yeah, Eclipse Mosquito. Image. Yeah. And then I write as well Influx DB2. I'm using the 1.7. But yeah, uh, let's give yeah. it a try later. Yeah. OK, that's cool. Uh, that like probably it. actually leads us on nicely to another question. Um, does it support Influx DB2? So I think you are using near your image. Indeed. Can, can you see my screen? Uh, so yes. I'm showing right. the Docker Compose here. Seven. So I'm using the 1.711. Uh, I haven't used the 2, but I um, yeah. can give it a try. Yeah. I guess. I don't know whether there's some, some big changes in 2 maybe that uh, if it's on Logger Hub, maybe we can try it. Uh, the only thing that we need to see if it's compatible with ARM devices. In my case, I'm yeah. running this on a Raspberry Pi, which is an ARM uh, processor. Um, sometimes, yeah, yeah some. I, I'm not sure about Influx. It probably it works with ARM because yeah. I think I think now that especially now that Apple have moved to ARM and Windows and things and developer machines, a lot more stuff is is being built for ARM, which which seems to be helping. Uh, okay, uh, one more question. Um, has thought been given to Podman? I guess this is from a, a Bellina, so you're you're running Docker instead of but Podman. I think is an alternative to Docker. It's another uh, containerization. Well, oh, so, oh, you put the question here. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, this is as I said, uh, this might be compatible with any Docker device. So if Podman, uh, I haven't, I, I never use Podman. Sorry. No, but, no, I, I had a, did a quick Google. I've got a feeling it's an alternative. I think it is an a Docker alternative, or is it a was it an alternative re, um, repository or whether it's a completely alternative technology? I'm not sure. So, so if it supports Docker Compose too, yeah, um, yeah, that might work. Okay. If please, Max, if give not. it a try. <laughs> if you want to add a pull request on the GitHub repo, I'm happy to as well make it compatible with Podman. Cool. Uh, someone's saying Influx DB work two works great with Node Red. Yeah, so cool. Uh, and uh, what's another one? One from Pablo. Um, yeah, there's the the AIDS AEDS node, which is a a broker inside Node Red. I think it's maybe mm -hmm. used. You can actually, yeah, which is good for especially for testing and stuff. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, no. As I mentioned at the beginning as well, uh, with the Grafana mm -hmm. thing and ah. Node Red visualization, right? Uh, so there are mm -hmm. multiple uh, ways to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, Nick's Nick's chiming in. So on on Red Hat, I guess yeah, builds. Uh, you can do alias Docker equals Podman. So yes, that sounds like. <laughs> Although he, that is followed up with the if I remember correctly comment. So. <laughs> <laughs> just to, just to get Nick's disclaimer in there, uh, and oh yeah, we got all the answers from the community here. Influx, yeah, okay. Influx supports ARM sixty four, no thirty two. So, so maybe that's the case. Actually, uh, I'm running. Um, yeah, I didn't show the. Well, I showed the other demo uh, at home in Barcelona. I'm running uh, an ARM v seven device, building a thing on with Ming with the Ming that I published. Yeah. So probably this is why. Yeah, we are using. Yeah, why well, you using one point seven? So yeah, I think is it the ARM? The ARM eight is in the Pi. 
four, but previous to that, the, the Pi 3 was ARM 7, and obviously the Pi 0 is ARM 7, I think. Can I remember? Uh, yeah, I think I the Pi 4 supports ARM 8. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, about but the, and the previous, first. yeah. The, if anyone knows in the chat, please. Like yeah. it's hard to, these these days, it's whatever Pi you can get. People people are selling Pi V ones for for good money. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, there are no Raspberry Pis. Uh, but yeah, uh, it spoiled my it's a, fitting it's more around the house. Tricky. Yeah. Cool. Right. Okay. Well, I think we'll um, yeah, Pi is first sixty four bit car. Thank you, Pablo. Um, so yeah, that's the yeah. MVM machine. Yeah. It's um, cool. Okay. Well, we got we got a couple of minutes, but um. I think we'll uh, we'll look at maybe wrapping it up there. Oh, hang on, we have got a question. Uh, what we got? Can, we, can you show more platforms to graph the data? Uh, so, are there more more alternatives to Grafana? Is that? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, you, you can name. Uh, uh, for example, on the um, on the industrial demo, we were using Grafana, but as well, we were sending data using the MQTT um, on Node-RED to. To that was that a cake, I guess. So an IoT platform, but I I hope I think you missed you mean in the in the edge, right? So in the edge, I think you can use the no right visual no visualization tool. You can use uh, I think Telegraph has as well a visualization tool. You can use Prometheus. You can use a lot of things. For simplification, actually we we use something on Balina Hub that it's called blocks. So are like Lego blocks. So actually, to make this Docker Compose, if you go to the to the Docker Compose from my repo, you will see that they are basically <clears throat> they are coming from the Docker Hub or they are coming from the Belina Hub. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm just putting blocks. I'm saying what ports they are going to use. For Node-RED, of course, I say <clears throat> what extra uh, permissions the container needs. And yeah, with that works. But yeah, I'm sure that you can change <clears throat> uh, Grafana for Prometheus or for another visualization yeah. in the edge. And the magic thing as well of running containers and using new tools, that this is something that I'm as well preaching, like IoT developers, we start, we must start using like 21st century tools instead. <laughs> Actually, two weeks ago, I was on a conference that some people were talking that they were sending data over FTP. Like, what? <laughs> what I was using, no? With the, when I was using, go, ah, but no, don't do this on 2022, right? Um, so least least you can start adding new containers and do more things on these devices. I show you on the LoRa one, for example. Cool. Uh, okay, a few more questions coming in. So we've got a couple of we'll, we'll do these. Uh, some of the distributed use cases with Belina. So maybe, yeah, what what kind of, how is Belina used in mm -hmm. production? So at the end, Belina, yeah, we help um, f companies that or developers who have fleets of devices um, that are, yeah, spread remotely, basically to update the software, update the operating system, and then see if they are online, offline, um, send diagnostics, uh, access to SSH to the containers, etc. Uh, so, examples. So we have a lot of um, machine learning devices where you need, for example, to update the machine learning model remotely to the devices, like cameras, parkings, uh, these type of devices. Then we have a lot of gateways, like uh, LoRaWAN gateways, um, Zigbee gateways for home, for connected homes, etc. That maybe you need to update the software remotely. Yeah, we have a lot of devices uh, connected. And okay. um, um, possibly leading on to that. So. Uh, there's some issues with BLE. Is this the case? Is this so? I'm guessing maybe using BLE through Node Red, running on a Bellina device. I'm thinking, yeah, the container. I, I can see. I can think about the stack. There's going to be kind of accessing the BLE hardware from the container, definitely. Yeah. Actually, yeah. So yeah, let me just try to share a screen. I'm not sure if you are out of time or not, but uh, because yeah, this is uh, interesting. <laughs> so as as I mentioned, so there is a Bellina hub, and we have what we call the blocks. So imagine like Lego blocks. Okay, so I want to use Bluetooth, for example, no? Ask this question. So can I use BLE? So you go here and you say, okay, I'm ARC64, so I have a Raspberry Pi here, and I want to use Bluetooth. So the only thing that you need to use is just to add this new container. You just copy here the image oh, reference. Okay. And just, yeah, we can have more, we will have more documentation on, on. but just have adding this, um, this part on your Docker Compose, you are just enabling uh, to to expose the Bluetooth on. So your yeah, you've 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 added added components to to map the Bluetooth through. So yeah, maybe that's uh, exactly. That's so cool. you just come to you go to main uh, Docker Compose and you want to add Bluetooth. Fantastic. So you just need to uh, add a new a new container here, that, like yeah. the Bluetooth container that I show you. Um, 
and yeah, that that might work or that might give you access to Bluetooth, and then maybe uh, uh, from Node-RED just get that Bluetooth uh, interface and play with it. But that's that's the magic of the blocks that uh, that we are cool. showing these days. Excellent. Uh, okay. Uh, very last, last, very quick question. Uh, time stamping solutions. Ooh. Um, mm -hmm. What time resolution? Mm -hmm. uh, is what the uh, I don't get the context. Is some, yeah, is there some timestamp solution or procedure implemented? What timestamps are available? Um, so yeah, we use NTP. Uh, so we have yeah, uh, time yeah. Uh, on the example that I show on the LoRa. Yeah, so the the LoRa network server gets the, the timestamp of the message received over the LoRa radio and. And this is how it's it's going to be down to the time the time on the underlying platform. But yeah, I mean, time resolution in Nova is pretty good. Okay, brilliant. I think we're going to need to wrap it up there because we've got our next speaker waiting uh, in the virtual <laughs> wings. That's okay. It's fine. All the questions the questions are always good. We um yep yeah, and uh, fantastic. So you details there so people can contact you. Okay, thanks a lot, Mark. Have a good day. <laughs> Bye. Cool. Okay, so moving swiftly on, uh, I'm not going to hang around too much because we we've got three speakers back to back. Uh, but then we'll have a break. This is uh, this is a talk I'm particularly excited to hear. So we've got Peter Hoddy, who is the CEO and founder at Modable, I think. That's um, right. Yeah. Um, so Modable is uh, doing some interesting stuff with JavaScript on microcontrollers. I've actually got my, I went to find my little Modable 2 board here, which oh, wow. I've done some prototyping with, but uh, I haven't, I haven't really, I, yeah, I haven't got the Node-RED stuff. I think I tried one of the early builds, but I, I just need to have the time. It sits on my desk and stares at me with a Spend some time doing things with me, <laughs> like all the other projects. But um, so yeah, really looking forward to this talk. So we're going to talk about uh, Node Red on microcontrollers. So let's bring your yeah, video in. Cool, and I'll Thank leave you. It okay, very cheap, Peter. Thank you. And hopefully, uh, Sam, this will inspire you to uh, you know dust the board off and uh, and give it a try. Um, so this is going to be a, a really um, high level, rapid fire introduction to uh, Node Red on microcontrollers. Um, this is really about as uh, far in the opposite direction as you can go from all the talk we've heard uh, today about Node-RED on servers. Um, let me uh, just really briefly introduce myself. I'm uh, an engineer first, an entrepreneur second. Uh, I helped to found, uh, found Modable. We are kind of leaders in embedded JavaScript. Uh, we are trying to put JavaScript into as many devices as you could possibly imagine, and hopefully this talk will expand your imagination a little bit. Um, in furtherance of that goal, I'm the chair of a standards committee called TC53, where we're creating standard JavaScript APIs um, for embedded devices um, so that there's a way to build JavaScript software for embedded that ports across hardware from different uh, manufacturers. I'm also a member of the JavaScript Language Committee, an author of a book about embedded JavaScript. And um, the reason I'm here today is uh, I am the uh, creator of Node-RED MCU edition, um, though a bunch of other people have jumped in and helped since. Um, People ask me uh, this question that I say should never be asked, why would you want to combine JavaScript and embedded? Um, and uh, you know, great products make our lives better. Um, and uh, uh, the best way to get a great product to people is to have it available at an incredibly good price. And embedded hardware, low-cost embedded hardware makes that possible. Um, but to build those products well, the firmware is so complicated that doing it kind of with traditional uh, traditional techniques uh, is failing. And we've all been frustrated with IoT devices that just don't work well or don't work the way we think they should. Um, so JavaScript really helps with that. And if, if you think about it, JavaScript is really the only universal language that we have for code. It runs on servers, runs in the browser, and now runs on embedded devices, of course, runs on your computers and your phones. So my mission... Um, is to really make every device that we use in our lives programmable, just like our phones and PCs are programmable, so that we can make these devices do what we want. And um, it turns out Node-RED is a really fantastic way to, to help us uh, to get there. Um, to get Node-RED running on a microcontroller is uh, really requires like rethinking everything, uh, starting with your expectations. So if you're not super familiar with microcontrollers, these things are um, uh, 
designed to be low cost. They're designed for very specific uses. So they're not really general purpose in the same way as a computer. Um, often designed for mass market. They can cost as a little as a dollar a piece. And, and that's what's uh, so exciting about them is, is you know, at a dollar, you can put them into just about any product. Um, and they're often very small, which I, I think opens up some new horizons for literally where you could put Node-RED uh, into, your, into your life and into your home. Um, but of course, that small size and low cost doesn't come uh, without some penalty, and uh, it really hits you on performance. Um, this, it's, it's always hard to, to kind of characterize performance, but if you look at it, a typical target that we use for microcontrollers has less than 10% of the CPU power, um, about a thousand times less RAM, about 2000 times less storage, about 1% the graphics performance. So this isn't about, oh, it'll run a little slower on the microcontroller. It's like, no, it, it just won't run at all unless we do something radically different. And so in this talk, I'll show you what we can do with Node-RED on these little devices and, and how I'll give you a, a glimpse of how we're achieving that. Um, but since we have such uh, small devices, we have to rethink what software we can use. Um, Node-RED kind of just assumes that things like Linux uh, and V8 and Node.js and even HTML are there. Um, and, and they are if you have a powerful enough device. But on a microcontroller, we don't have those. We have free RTOS typically or another RTOS. We have the XS JavaScript engine, uh, which is uh, the engine module makes. And that's optimized for small size. Uh, and small memory use, whereas V8 is optimized for performance. Um, instead of Node, we have the Modable SDK. Instead of HTML, we have Pew, which is a user interface framework that Modable's created. And then, of course, we have a, a different version of uh, Node-RED. So can it really actually run flows on these things? And it, it really can. Um, we just kind of have to do it a little differently. We don't try to emulate Node.js. People have tried. They failed. It's been painful. Um, and so instead, uh, I began Node-RED MCU edition from scratch, literally an empty file, and just started uh, re-implementing the Node-RED runtime from scratch, um, really rethinking the architecture um, to work within the constraints of what an MCU requires. Um, so if you do that, does it, does it work well? Again, it, it turns out actually, yeah, for a lot of flows, it works, works very well. Um, surprisingly well, honestly. Um, but part of that is adjusting your goals, right? You're not going to take the same flows that run on a quad core Linux box and run them well on a single core, you know, 80 megahertz, $1 microcontroller. So, um, you know, we want to transfer as much of the, the goodness of Node-RED in terms of the developer experience, in terms of the knowledge, um, in terms of the low code aspects to microcontrollers, but we won't do exactly the same things. So uh, a question from any Node-RED user that comes up is, so which nodes can I use on a microcontroller? And um, I'm pleased to say we've been making really great progress on the, um, the core nodes. So this is kind of a summary. Um, anything with a check mark, uh, which includes all of kind of the common nodes, for example, um, is actually working pretty much just the same as in Node-RED. I, I won't claim 100%. Um, a lot of the function nodes, you see exec is crossed out because, of course, we don't have Linux. Um, a lot of the network stuff is there. All the sequence nodes are there. The sequence nodes are interesting because they actually use the Node-RED implementations, and, and I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Um, but you can see we're making nice progress on the core nodes. We, we've got a bunch of others coming um, that uh, you'll see in some of the demos. Um, so rather than try to explain all this to you, I want to show you a bit of what we're doing. So classic uh, IoT 101 is to blink a light. And so um, I'm going to do that for you using a microcontroller. You can see I'm actually using the Raspberry Pi GPI nodes. These are pre-recorded, of course. Um, and so uh, I'm just entering the pin numbers that happen to correspond to my device. Um, and then I export that flow uh, onto the clipboard. Uh, and this part's a little messy, but uh, you know we're just getting started. And then I open up uh, flows JSON in the uh, MCU edition, paste it in, and then I uh, build that using the model SDK for uh, the ESP8266 node MCU board. And uh, that will build it and download it to device and start it running. And here you see our debugger, which then shows you the output of the button being clicked. And if I just hop to the next slide, here's that device. 
And um, you can see when you press the button, the light turns on and off. Um, not, you know, the best thing in the world, uh, except that it's really all done in just standard node red. So if you could do that on Raspberry Pi, you can do that on uh, an ESP8266 now. Um, and it turns out that you can run it on any other microcontroller that the uh, Modable SDK supports, um, for example, the Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, and so we actually are running these on the Pico W. The only thing you have to do differently uh, is when you build, you have to say that you want to build for the Pico W instead of the Pi, uh, instead of the 8266. And then the Modable SDK kind of magically snaps into action and um, will run that for you uh, on the device. So um, all of a sudden you have access to, to a whole lot of uh, new places where you can run flows. And you're thinking, that's great. It works. It looks complicated. Could you make that easier? Um, you know, copying, pasting JSON flows is, is uh, proof of concept stuff, but um, yeah. And so, um, so it's been some really interesting work done um, coming, out of, coming out of our community where in the editor, there's now an, uh, an MCU tab you can install. And then you can set up build configurations. So this is setting up the same one I had in the command line, ESP8266 node MCU. You hit build, and then behind the scenes, which you can see in the console, it goes ahead and runs the same build that we did in the terminal, but you don't actually have to see it. Um, and then when it's done, um, you'll see that that um, same flow is now running on the microcontroller, but triggered um, entirely without ever leaving the node MCU environment. So this is really exciting. This is uh, not only can you deploy, but uh, things like the debug node output will go to the D do go to the node red debug window. Status updates are displayed in the node red editor. The inject button works, so you can trigger things in real time. Um, and using our JavaScript debugger, you can actually single step through JavaScript functions, uh, which is incredibly useful. Um, this is uh, this work is almost entirely by uh, Ralph Wetzel. Um, who uh, just you know took one look at what we were doing with the command line and said you've got to be kidding and so he took it on himself to uh, to make this work directly in Node Red and it, it's an awesome piece of work and so thank you to Ralph. Um, I wanted to show you what we can do on real devices and so this is a, a Wi-Fi light bulb and uh, you know they show all the things they're compatible with like Next and Alexa and we thought oh, it should be compatible with Node Red too. If you look inside of that light bulb, you'll see a chip that is just a variation of that um, 8266 that I was showing you earlier. So uh, one of my colleagues soldered in a uh, programming connector for me. And then um, I was able to build node red flows. And so what you see here is we have a mosquito input. Um, and that mosquito input is uh, connected to a function node. The function node opens up the driver for the LED bulb, which is a JavaScript driver, and uh, initializes it, and then waits for MQTT messages, um, which it uses to update the color of the light bulb and the brightness of the light bulb. And then the second flow below is just to keep alive so that the light bulb every 10 seconds sends a message so that I know that it's still running. Um, and so that flow is an entire light bulb controller uh, written in Node Red. And so then I can come here and um, use that as a light switch. And so you see I've got another little device there. That is um, uh, another commercial piece of hardware called uh, an M5 uh, Atom Light. Um, and we're using that as a light switch. It's available for about seven and a half dollars. And so these two things connect by MQTT, which is of course the way everybody likes to use Node Red. Um, and um, they, they, you have a light switch and a light bulb both of which are completely powered by Node Red. Um, we could also communicate by UDP um, or TCP, but uh, MQTT was a nice fit here. So the flow for that light switch is, is, is quite simple. Um, there's a GPIO input. There is a change node to um, format the message the way MQTT wants it. There's, a, there's an LED control node, which is a function to, to turn the light on and off. And then it just sends a, an MQTT update. Um, so incredibly simple stuff if you've been working with MQTT. But now instead of being limited to uh, your computer, you can take this stuff literally out into the world. Um, we wanted to be able to control the color. So we got another little switch here. Um, this one has a gyroscope in it or an accelerometer. And so you can see as we turn the switch, that's the color controller. 
And so again, it's just another simple little flow that watches for the motion of the accelerometer, does some mapping to a color, and then sends that out over the network. And since it's MQTT, you see it's controlling two light bulbs at once um, because they're both listening. So following this example, uh, we thought, oh, we could do even more with light controllers. Um, and so we, uh, we got a Modable 2, just like Sam has sitting on his desk, actually. Um, and we put a UI on it. Um, and so that UI can control light bulb, um, you know, control the color in real time. And then um, it actually performs very nicely. Um, and uh, also there's a brightness control. You'll see Chris move his finger up there in a moment. Um, so we can move, we can adjust those as well. But so this flow um, was built using um, the, uh, the Node-RED dashboard. Um, so this is a series of UI controls that are available in Node-RED that render in the browser using HTML. Um, and a colleague of mine, Patrick Soke, did a full implementation or uh, an implementation of these things using our Pew user interface framework. And so that same flow, which runs in the browser um, using dashboard, can run on a microcontroller um, that has a screen. And so this goes quite a bit further. This is a, a much more ambitious flow um, that uses all kinds of features. And um, you, know, you can see here's what it looks like in Node-RED, um, rendered in the browser. And um, if I bring this now over to uh, Modable 2, this little board that we have here. Um, it now has a touchscreen interface. We can go ahead and um, control all the different pieces. And what's, um, what's kind of fun here is it really looks and feels the same. Um, so you can build these things and test them in your browser and then deploy them across to uh, a microcontroller. And this is, of course, um, you know, one of the most difficult things for a microcontroller is building a great UI. And um, here we've completely uh, automated that. Um, the gauges are the best part, so I'm just going to jump to that. But you can see here, uh, for example, all these same pieces work. Um, we also have a, uh, we did a version with open weather where we can do UI templates. Um, and so um, this, instead of using HTML to render the templates, uses Pew. So how do we pull all this off? Like what's going on behind the scenes? First thing to understand in um, embedded, the main thing you want to do is as much work as possible at build time when you're running on a fast computer instead of running, uh, instead of on the device. And so we created this tool called Node MCU, uh, Node Red to MCU, that pre-processes the flow as much as possible to reduce startup time, code size, memory use. Um, just a quick example because it's, it's fun to see. This is the change node. This just sets the payload to twelve. In Node-RED itself, this is the change node code, which is, is pretty considerable. Um, does a lot. That's you know, it's reasonable that it's this big. Among things it does, of course, is it calls set message property, which is a big function, um, and then that calls normalized property expression, which is, is another big function. If we could run this on a microcontroller, but it would just be painfully slow and way too big. And of course, it turns out that all that this one thing is doing is um, setting message.payload to 12. And so here you see the output of node red to MCU. Instead of all those hundreds, maybe thousands of lines of code that have to be executed in full node red, we just have two lines, set the message payload and, and return it so that it transfers onto the next flow. And so this lets us run incredibly fast for nodes where this kind of optimization is possible. We've also re-implemented some nodes for the MCU, like the networking ones, using the ECMA 419 standard. Um, so they behave the same, but it's an embedded specific implementation. And then finally, we um, also can just run some of the uh, source code um, straight out of Node-RED, uh, unmodified or lightly modified, um, whether it's just standard JavaScript. So um, there's some interesting compatibility capabilities uh, there. Um, on our roadmap, we, we've got a lot of work left to do. Um, on the core, you know, there's still things like TCP and hopefully XML. Um, we'll get to TLS shortly. JSON auto looks intimidating, but possible. Um, and we'll see about sub subflows. Um, of course, the dashboard with the UI has, a, has lots of potential. But I think the most important work that we have in front of us is really on the integration um, so that it's as easy as possible for people to use microcontroller support 
from inside the Node-RED editor itself um, to do that in a way that feels really reliable and secure. Um, and, and to be able to grab nodes and uh, have confidence that they're going to work. And so that, that's something that we're looking forward to engaging um, with, the, with the larger Node-RED community on uh, how we might do. Um, and so you should get involved. You, we really could use help. This is a really big, ambitious project. It brings Node-RED and, and all the goodness uh, that it has um, to a whole new class of devices. Um, we're, we're just getting started. I hadn't used Node-RED ever before in June of this year. So um, it's, it's really brand new. And any expertise you have is going to help us. Um, it's a fun project. There's tons of things to learn. Um, and we want to make the MCU edition work as easily as Node-RED does. It, it's, it's incredible the work that, that everyone has done to make Node-RED so smooth and simple and easy to use. And, and we want the MCU edition to have that. So give it a try. Tell us how it goes, good or bad. Ask questions, report bugs, try implementing a node, teach other people. We could really use the help. Um, at this stage, every little bit makes a huge difference. Um, and I want to thank the people who have gotten involved early. The, the folks like Nick, um, Dave Conway-Jones, and Sam Manchin have been generous in their, uh, their support and their encouragement. Um, folks in the community have kind of nudged us in the right direction, and it's been it's been really fun and really helpful. Um, and uh, if you want to follow up, um, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub, and, and here's some links uh, to some of the uh, bits and pieces that I've uh, mentioned. So that's the talk. Sam? Cool. Thank you very much, Peter. Yes. Um, yeah, awesome. Uh, the, 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 the comments, I won't throw, throw every single comment up, but there's various explosion head explosion type mind blown <laughs> uh, i think i think at the point at which it's like oh so no dreads running on your light bulb was <laughs> that's uh -huh. that, that, that's pretty insane yeah pulling apart the um the light bulb and flushing it but i'm just thinking i have a house full of smart bulbs with like 20 30 bulbs around the house so mm -hmm. if i could run no dread on each one of those that would just be <laughs> probably yeah, i mean i think but, that's i think that's what's so exciting i think you know everybody who's used an iot product is on you know has the same thoughts first oh this is kind of cool and second i know how to make it better and you know <laughs> if if we could just get inside to do that um it could be so much more interesting and powerful for for a lot of people instead of just relying on the manufacturers and so i, I think node red yeah. layered on top of all the other work we've done with javascript really really opens that up to a huge number of people absolutely yeah and i think that you know the stuff you've, if you've moved on with the tooling and things that um plug in because that's that's absolutely and the thing with all with all iot hardware is the, the tooling is the the piece that's really hard to often get get started so there's some, some yeah. great work there um okay so we've got a few questions um i'll start off with one from pablo um uh so have you got some nodes for some of the the unique features on a microcontroller so like adcs and stuff i think yeah it's a great question it's the um so that's work that we, we've started. Um, the GPIO nodes was one very simple example of that. Um, you saw the accelerometer where turning the, um, turning the device changed the uh, light bulb color. That was integrating a sensor node um, that, that's part of the MCU repository um, that uses any standard ECMA 419 compatible JavaScript driver. Um, and so you can bring in all kinds of sensors using that from moisture sensors to barometers, uh, temperature sensors, uh, gas sensors. Mm -hmm. um, so all those things are there. Haven't specifically done ADCs, but, uh, but that's supported by the ECMA 419 spec. And uh, my hope is to go and spend some time kind of scouring the uh, Node-RED contributed nodes and find, for example, a good example of an ADC node and just re-implement that uh, for the microcontrollers, because I'm sure somebody's done that for Raspberry Pi already. So we want to kind of keep as much compatibility and similarity there as possible so people coming from one device can move to an MCU and have the same thing. Yeah, I think so. I think there's definitely going to be some interesting stuff we can do in the in the ecosystem around sort of MCU ready, MCU compatible devices mm -hmm. and, and things there. Um, yeah. Okay, next question uh, from David. David, uh, is it WIO terminal compatible? You might have to remind you. I'm assuming you know what why WIO is. I have heard of it. <laughs> it's. Um, I think it's a real tech based part. If I'm if I'm remembering correctly, um, it's not yet. But there's no reason it couldn't be. Um, basically, anything that can run the modable SDK um, can run Node Red uh, MCU. 
and uh, porting the Modable SDK isn't too bad. Um, so if you want to, you know, just hop into um, either the Modable forum on GitHub um, or uh, the the Node MCU one, um, we could we could have a chat about that. Um, but uh, but these things are definitely possible, and it's one of the things we're trying to do by building on standards is really make it uh, as painless. Um, and reliable as possible to port this to new targets. So we, we don't want it to be tied to any single piece of hardware or, um, or class of devices. Cool. Okay. Um, and probably another follow-up question, but um, Cortex M0 chips. Uh... Yeah, runs happily on ARM uh, and doesn't make any particular requirements. So um, so it'll run there. Uh, it's just a question of getting kind of the build, the build squared away for your particular target. Um, but the Raspberry Pi, for example, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico is uh, is an ARM-based part, and uh, that runs fine. You know, we run on M0, so it can be done. Again, just really a device porting yep. question. Cool. Yeah, and as I... Um... Casito just asked us. You did mention, yeah, it runs on the Pico now. I think that's that's a is that a relatively recent development. I know initially it was only the the ESPs, but I did spot the Pico. I think maybe you being in the US because in the UK we got the Pico like you know day one. Um, <laughs> I, I had yeah. one kind of had one ordered and, and we get them quite early, but they took a little while to to get yep. around the world a bit more. So um, yeah, you know, no, we um, we just got the the Pico in uh, the W the Pico W in a, a few weeks ago, and my colleague yeah. Michael Kellner uh, jumped on top of it and got Wi-Fi working, and um, that's all there. Um, I think most of it's landed in the Model SDK repository, and the rest of it will in the next day or two. Um, but that's that's working that's nicely, really actually. New. Yeah, very very new. Yeah, that's that's quite cool because the uh, the Model Two is a nice little board. I really like the form factor actually with the the touchscreen. Mm -hmm. But equally, yeah, the, the Pico Ws are sort of a ten a penny. I've got plenty of those lying around, yeah. and um, and a few projects but, on those. Yeah. No, I mean, it's one of the things that's great about the embedded space. You know, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of ESP32 boards at this point, and uh, same with with the with the Pico. And you you can kind of find one that you like, and and they're all priced quite reasonably. And so it, it's really uh, it's really fun to kind of shop for you know what's the hardware you want to pair with the software that you yeah. build. It's it's finding those other consumer products that have the, the ESPs embedded in them as well that I like. I've got a yeah. one of the um, it's like a, a remote control. It's got six buttons on it, handheld like a TV remote um, that mm -hmm. has a an ESP eight two sixty six on it, which I keep meaning to try and, and reflash with something. So yeah. uh, that might be a good target. Cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I think we're just about there for questions. I'll give it um, give it a minute or two just in case there's anything else. I'm just zipping through. Uh, Lots of uh, say really really strong response. People people really like this. Um, That's and, cool. I'm, I'm super exciting. Yeah. I hope they'll I hope they'll give it a try. Cool. Um, and yeah, you've put your links up there. So um, modable mm -hmm. modable dot coms. I think the best place to start for most of this is all linked from there, isn't it? Sure. Um, yeah. It's it's in there. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, thank you. I guess you're heading home this weekend, are you? Because you're in you're in Europe somewhere at the moment. Indeed. I, indeed, I am. <laughs> thank you sam okay. take care have a good flight bye cool okay well we've got a um a short break now um so it gives it gives me a chance to have a break at least um so we're going to be back in about 15 minutes uh we've got pablo uh who's been helping organize today's uh today's event he's gonna be talking to us about the uh node red ecosystem um and then coming up after that we've got some guy called sam machin um that's doing a talk on communications so i'm gonna have to figure out how to introduce myself for that one but uh We'll, uh, we shall see you shortly.
Hello, welcome back. Um, so glad to see we haven't lost too many people during the break. Um, I'm sure everybody will, will be piling back on now. Yep, I can see the stream numbers going up. So uh, people people are coming back, which is good. Um, so we're going to move into our next speaker. Uh, we've got Pablo Acosta, who is uh, at Prescient Devices. He's going to be talking to us about uh, the contributing, uh, I'll try remember now, contributing nodes to the ecosystem. Basically, this, the the... There we go. Contributed nodes ecosystem. <laughs> so there we, uh, oh, we got it there. I remember the title. Um, so I'm quite looking forward to this one. Um, definitely because uh, it's some stuff that I've been looking at at uh, the end of last year, beginning of this year was, yeah, the, the Node-RED ecosystem. I think it's one of the most valuable things about Node-RED, but it's uh, it's definitely something which uh, which we can give a bit more a bit more love and a bit more attention to. So uh, without more, over to you, Pablo. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Uh, yeah, so I will be talking about the uh, the state of the Node-RED ecosystems and giving some observations, data, and, and suggestions uh, about that. So I, I'm Pablo Costa, as, as I mentioned, I'm the VP of Engineering at Prescient. And uh, at Prescient, we build a uh, H2 Cloud data system uh, on top of Node-RED, and, and we use that to deliver real-time operational business insights. Um, so if uh, you or your company have any data, data ops, uh, or distributed IoT systems, um, yeah, feel free to link, to reach out. Uh, my LinkedIn information is there. And we're happy to see if we can help you. Uh, but so so our, our system is, is based on no red, and that's where sort of my bias is coming from and why I'm interested in this. Uh, so the motivation for this talk is the following. Either, you know, your I, um, or one of our customers, uh, when you are developing a, a flow, I uh, said, so, hey, does no red do X? And uh, so you do two, one of two things. Uh, Sam has done this uh, quite a few times uh, in this morning. You either go to the um, flow page in the no red uh, website, or you go to the palette manager and search for, X, search for X. And more often than not, you'll find that there are many results, right? One or many nodes that uh, purportedly do X. So it's like, awesome. Uh, but are they any good? Will they crash your uh, uh, no red? Who knows? Uh, so um, that's that's kind of the motivation and that's what uh, prompted me to, to start looking at this. So let me give you a lay of the land. I think uh, Nick uh, earlier today alluded to this uh, as of late September, when I um, crawled all this data, there are more than 4,000 packages in contributed uh, nodes. And out of those 350 are scoped, um, and this is by no means perfect, but that gives you some sense of which ones are supported by, um, uh, which ones are corporate. Uh, this is not perfect, you know, obviously there are individuals that, that anyone can, can create a scope package, but, and certainly there are some nodes that are supported or, or developed by, by um, corporate entities that are not scoped, but roughly you're talking about hundreds of packages that are um, supported by corporations, so the rest are community packages. And really cool to see that there are almost 2,500 authors at least listed in the uh, uh, as authors in, in the packages. So that's a quite sizable uh, community there. And, you know, there are packages being submitted every day and the oldest, at least based on, on GitHub commits are 2014, but I'm sure, I'm sure there are uh, older packages than that. So let me give you a lay of the land, set the stage of uh, where all those nodes are, uh, you can find nodes for. Uh, and you can see in the work cloud, this is just looking at tags that authors have um, have used for their nodes. Um, all sorts of applications, which is great, which is one of the strengths of Node-RED is that it has a nodes for pretty much um, anything. And the histogram, you, should, you see that um, kind of how many nodes have um, used a, a particular tag. And then I took a, a crack at um, putting those tags into broad categories so that we can see where um, where you can expect to find um, nodes and what are the strengths of Node-RED. Given the how Node-RED started, it's not surprising to see that IoT has about a quarter of, of the nodes. Um, any cloud infrastructure 
uh, takes a huge part of, of the node ecosystem too. Home and industrial automation follow. Um, comms, any communication now like MQTT, BACnet, uh, Modbus is also well represented and then smaller categories. Um, and by the way, the UI category there is almost exclusively the dashboard. So um, part of the things that I uh, uh, I notice while looking at, uh, at the tags is that um, it would be nice to um, to be able to see all the keywords so that there's no repetition or, or no, uh, so not, not repetition, like, but calling essentially the same thing by different tags. Um, and it would be nice to sort of have a committed effort to, to clean up the keywords in, in the uh, and tags in the nodes. Uh, and it also would be kind of nice to be able to search by keyword in the palette manager. But so this is the, this is kind of where all the, where you can expect to find nodes. So one way to measure quality, and Nick, uh, Nick uh, talked about this earlier today, is a report card or the scorecard. And this is an awesome initiative that was started, uh, I believe, in January or early uh, this year. Uh, and so it's it's only covering, as Nick mentioned, uh, new nodes and nodes that receive an update. So that's why only about 20% of, of the nodes have, score, have a scorecard. Um, but if you look at all the nodes that do have a scorecard, only 8% of those have a perfect scorecard, meaning that they, they comply with all the categories. And I think actually it was kind of funny, uh, Nick also showed a, a chart like this or the histogram of uh, plotting how many nodes comply with each category. And you see the laggards are the examples, the and the no red and no JS version. Uh, now the, the bottom two, you know, it comply with this is, is complying with this is just a, a kind of a two line change in the uh, in the package of JSON file. This, it's a little bit more uh, than that in the sense of just making sure that it actually works with whatever minimum version you have. And then the examples is, is actually the, the other one that seems to be the most difficult to comply with. All the other ones are, are much, much higher, right? So um, so that's an interesting observation that uh, the examples, which by the way, it's, it's, it's kind of key also for people that are new to Node-RED or, or want to find a deeper understanding of how to use the node. I think it's really interesting that um, it's it's one of the laggards. So uh, having said that, this is, I think, I, I, I consider this, uh, it's a it's newish uh, initiative, and I would say this is a baseline, but it's not, um, obviously, this is not the, the only thing that you might uh, want to consider when you're trying to see if a node is, is, is uh, good or not. That one is, an obvious one is the version number. So if you look at all the packages, more than uh, half are in version zero, in between zero and 1.0. And then the rest is 1.0 and higher. Now, I don't, th if, if you traditionally, one, version one was is considered, A, this is ready for production, it would be stable. Uh, there are not going to be any breaking changes. You can use it. I don't think that's representative of uh, of the stage of those in those sixty uh, two thousand nodes that are in version zero or between zero and one. Uh, there's many that are being used in production and they're ready uh, for production and stable and usable. So I think this is more a call to action. I think the the version number of a lot of packages do not reflect the reality of the usage, the stability, and the worthiness of the package. So this is more like call to action to um, the node authors to uh, you know take a second look at, at what the node version is and, and update it if, if it's called for. Um, particularly coming from, um, you know, I, I see a lot of our customers, that's, Sometimes the the first thing that they give them pause, like oh, this is not version 1.0, and you know nothing to do with the quality. As I said, there's there's notes that we use every day and we rely on every day that less than 1.0, and um, so um, this is more of a suggestion. It's like if you are not author and your package is not version 1.0, take a second look uh, and and really evaluate whether whether it's um, appropriate to to bump up the version. The, another metric that you can think of is uh, popularity. So there's almost half a million downloads, uh, weekly downloads of nodes. And you can see here the, the, the top 10, uh, kudos to the Node-RED dashboard. It completely dwarfs uh, the downloads of anything else. 
Uh, but again, to the theme of, of the versions, you can see five out of the top 10 are version, uh, are in the zero point something uh, version. So, uh, but here you also see that if you look at the uh, first quartile in terms of download, meaning, uh, you know, 25% of the downloads are um, represented by 13 packages. So, in another word, 13 packages account for 25% of the uh, of the downloads. Then the, the next 25% is 42 packages. The next 25% is 180 packages. So 75% of all the downloads are roughly 200 packages. So in a way, uh, increasing the the quality of the packages, uh, it's not a 4,000 uh, um, package problem. It's mostly a hundredth package problem. Uh, because you can see that then on, the 3,800 packages only account for 25% of the downloads. Now, of course, having a long tail packages is beneficial because uh, if you're trying to do something that's niche uh, or you know it's it's not you know, I don't know MQTT, but it's really important to you. It's it's really great that No Red has a package for that. Uh, but in terms of the overall quality. Um, it's not like you have to work on thousands of packages. Maybe you know, we can, as a community, we can focus on, on uh, at least from a popularity perspective, on, on hundreds of packages. Another um, me measure of quality that uh, you can think of is the ratings. If you go to the uh, node page in the, uh, in the, flow, in the uh, node red uh, website, you'll see this actions box. And by the way, if you don't see it, just it's, it's turn on the uh, uh, the features, uh, the functionality cookies, and you will see this action box. So you can rate the package, and you can see here too, and it it, it offers you what's the rating and how many people have voted. And here you see uh, the top ten uh, packages. They're all five star rating, but I, I sorted them by uh, number of votes. And again, here in a recurring theme, five out of the top ten are in version less than 1.0. So about 1,500 packages have been rated, uh, and there have been 3,700 uh, votes. And it's good to see that out of those votes, most are five and four star. Uh, but here's a, it's a, it's a call to action too. Um, and, and I'm speaking also to myself. If, if you use a node, regardless of version, regardless of popularity, if you use a node, it's stable. It does what it says in the tin. Uh, you have no problems with it, you're happy with it, take a few minutes and, and just rate them. It, it will greatly help, I think, the, all of us, the community to, to ascertain whether um, it's, it's okay to use a, a package. Lastly, um, another measure of, of um, quality, if you think about it, is whether the package is actively maintain, maintained or not. Um, and I'll make the provision that some packages are feature complete and they don't have any bugs. And so they, they might not receive updates or anything else. And you know that's, that's fine too. But I think for the most part, um, software always, always evolves and, and uh, bugs are fixed. So uh, here I'm showing three plots. Uh, the, the top one is, the week since the last update um, and number of packages that are you know within that week. The second one is what's the age of the oldest PR that's open? And the last one is what's the age of the oldest issue that's open. So a third about a third of the packages uh, have been updated in the last year, a somewhat arbitrary uh, timeline, but uh, it's that's that's the the number. Um, and then you you see the number of uh, packages that have PRs and issues. Uh, I, I was sort of comforted in the way, in, in the sense that uh, a lot of people seem to have the skill, the bandwidth, and the inclination to submit PRs, but even more people have, uh, at least um, if, if they don't have any of those or for whatever reason they cannot submit a PR, at least they, they also um, tell authors, uh, not authors, um, about issues or suggestions uh, of their packages. So if you uh, adopt a certain criteria and say, okay, accounting for the version issues that, I, that I've um, uh, mentioned, uh, if you say, okay, what 
packages have version greater than or equal than 0.6 that are four or five stars that are within the 50% of most downloaded and been latent last year, drum roll, no red node email is the one that satisfies that criteria, the only one. Um, and then if you increase the popularity a little bit to say, okay, how, it, it, it's one of those uh, hundreds of packages that are in the top 75% of downloaded uh, popularity, there's a few more. Um, so it's my hope that, you know, if, if we revisit this um, next year or, or in, 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 in whatever given time frame, then more and more packages will be able to, to be in, in, in this list. And, and this is, of course, an arbitrary criteria and, and there's um, software quality. It's, uh, it's quite an interesting topic. There's lots of things you can look at. Uh, but uh, I urge uh, me and everybody in the community to, to uh, put yourselves in, in, in the shoes of users and say, okay, what do they look at and, and try to uh, make those uh, metrics reflect uh, reality. So um, finally, uh, I just, it's a call to action that, that us as a community to put an effort into, into measuring and improving um, quality together. Some of the suggestions, are like thinking about this, is like the report guys, I think it's a great framework to, uh, uh, and it's a very easy snapshot of, of the quality. So two things I could, uh, thought of that could be interesting uh, to see is, you know, whether the, uh, the node has a test bench, meaning like if you run NPM test, does anything happen? I mean, and of course you say, okay, well, yeah, something can happen, but um, you know, it can run a test bench of what uh, is that, you know, what is that test bench measuring? Fair, fair point, but at least, you know, the author has put together a test bench. Um, and also, uh, it's been my experience and some of our customers' experiences that you, you use a node and, you know, either it crashes no red, crashes no JS, uh, or, or, you know, something really bad happens is at least if there are examples, which is one of the criteria of this core card, is there a way to run them, you know, um, uh, automatically see if at least that uh, that works. Um, and on the point of the examples, if you're a node author, I'm sure when you're developing the node, you there is some you have some kind of flow to test the node <laughs> functionality. You know, consider that making that uh, the the example, and that would you know uh, increase the one of those uh, criteria in the scorecard that's one of the lowest. Um, and the last one, uh, the two last one is again uh, consider whether the version number of the node is reflects the reality of the popularity, usage, and stability of the node. And if it's less than 1.0, consider uh, maybe bumping up the, the version number. Uh, and the last one is, as, as mentioned before, take a minute and um, rate the nodes that you use every day and that you rely on every day. Um, I think that will be a huge help. And finally, I mean, the, the XKCD classic cartoon here is is that uh, as Nick pointed out, I think one of the strengths on Node-RED is the community. Uh, but let's make sure that, uh, uh, speaking as a as, as a commercial enterprise, that we support um, the people that do this, you know, for for free, the like open source contributors, um, by either submitting PRs, issues, or in any other way, um, so that the community still um, still uh, stays vibrant. Um, and that chart that uh, Nick showed in, in the morning where the notes, uh, the contributing notes keeps increasing, continues to be to do so, so that no red can find its way into even more applications than it does now. So um, I will, um, this, the a version, a web-friendly version of this talk uh, will be, um, it's live now in, 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 that, in the URL that you see here, at the, the QR code will get you there. Um, we are committed to um, per periodically um, update the, uh, the data that you've seen. And if you uh, want to see any other metric uh, of the node, uh, red node ecosystem, let me know. Um, we're, we're always uh, happy to consider that. And uh, meaning that this, I, my, it's my intention to make this, this uh, web page, the state of node red, is sort of a living uh, page where it gets content constantly updated, and you know uh, one can take a, a quick snapshot at what the um, what the state is. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, I will um, 
hand it off to Sam and I'm happy to answer any questions that people may have. Hey, thank you, Papa. Yeah, that's um that's really awesome, actually. That's been really I I probably should give you the background. I um so I was the one that kind of created the scorecard stuff at the end of last yep. year. Um so I say, yeah, that was that was um a project I worked on with for, with Nick, but um and it was really difficult. We're trying to trying to one do it programmatically because you know right. an open source project. <laughs> yes. We don't have the time to. We're, we're not uh, we're not Apple. We're not going to have rooms of people reviewing right. reviewing every uh, every single submission. So it was it was partly the challenge of what can you automate um, yep. and to look at. So yeah. scorecard is is by no means a perfect thing. It was, um, and also it was trying to. It's very hard to not when some, something as diverse as Node Red to not kind of. It's very hard to say what a good node looks like necessarily yep. because they can do so many different things. And even sometimes just some of the best nodes are some of the simplest nodes. There was, there's a couple of Absolutely. sort of like Q node and things out there that that doesn't have any external dependencies, doesn't do it, you know, doesn't um doesn't change, doesn't need updating. But yeah. So um the the when was it last updated was one I really um agonized over as to does this actually tell you it's a you know, is that is that a mark of quality that it's yeah, and, 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 and for as I said, uh, as I mentioned, I talked like if you know if it's feature complete, doesn't have any bugs. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason to update it, right? <laughs> yeah, if, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, for example, and, and this is sort of my pet peeve, uh, not pet peeve, but my uh, concern is with version name is like there's there's a node that which now name is version 0.6.5, it's been downloaded a gazillion times, in B, it's being used by every everybody. Yeah. And and I know it's okay. I know it's fine. I don't use it. But if if someone comes in with perhaps not a, a whole lot of uh, software development expertise and see that, I mean, they know that oh, version one point oh, that that you know, that's that's, that's good. a good metric, it's, right? It's, it's so it's, it's an interesting it's, question, and I wonder if this is almost a, a wider than Node Red, whether this is a Node ecosystem or even a, a general package ecosystem, an open source thing, where maybe as developers we are overly critical or we're being, we're being careful yeah. like you, you edge on the side of caution i don't want to declare this as 1.0 because i'm exactly. kind of putting it out there and i'm saying hey look this is the best i can do if i i i, I did it with i i published the ngrok node and um for quite a long time i left that one at 0 0.7 and, and things and actually it was it was a christmas day a couple of years ago when i bumped it to 1.0 and i'm like it's christmas we're going to 1.0 right. because <laughs> it's like this is i mean steve had steve had also contributed some stuff to it at that point and i think for me, the thing that gave me the impetus to go, okay, I'm going to make this 1.0 was somebody else had come in and made quite a quite a good, quite a strong PR with they a whole bunch of the UI they'd improved on it. And it's like, okay, now, now somebody else thinks this is kind of stuff done here and, and that they think that this is good enough. So I think it's as a as a solo developer, you just have that that real kind of feeling. And it which which leads on to the the stuff about ratings, because again, that's that was what the other change that, that we made at the same time as the scorecard was moving to so ratings. You used to have to be logged in via GitHub to the flows page right. to to rate a node, which you know was done so that people couldn't can game it and things. But very few people log in. The only people that log in via GitHub to that page is when you're trying to publish a node. If you're just consuming, right. you don't even need a GitHub account, let alone being logged in on that page. So we 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 changed it to to a, put it behind a cookie and. Um, you know, it, it makes it a little bit easier to to game the rate, the votes if you want to, but I mean that would show up. But equally, yeah. it's better to have. My, my my feeling was it's better to have more more ratings, even if there's a few junk ratings than than no ratings in there. So um, yeah, I mean, but, I think it's it, it's it's a good enough community that that would be minimal, yeah. if any. Uh, what I would say, and I think I was looking at chat. I, I think something that could increase uh, the ratings is. Um, because I don't know how many people actually go to the node page. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So oh, rating. This is this is. A, there's a couple of comments on here, and and I was going to bring it up. Um, yeah. And yeah, rating rating. It would be easier to rate nodes we've installed if the link from the palette page. Ah. So okay. So this is a first piece. Yes. Um. There there was a whole there was a whole bunch of work that I had lined up after the scorecard, which which other projects got in the way of. But um, the idea that yeah the linking because once you've installed a node the link is gone currently in the palette manager to the flows page anyway um, but actually bringing it one further and bringing it to rating from within node red so actually you know you've got this installed um yeah we, we know you're using it right well if i go into a palette manager why, why if i can rate it from there because 
yeah, the, the the time at which you want to rate it is once you've used it. But once you've got it installed and used it, you hardly you're... ever go back to the page of the node, right? It would, it, you're, I guess, you're it would have reduced the friction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Apple do that annoying thing, or app developers do that annoying thing, don't they? We oh, yeah. rate this app <laughs> yes. on the App Store. I'm, I really don't think we want to go there, but um, you know, yeah, but, uh, my nose, least, my nose, but at least it will tickle your brain every time you app, open the Palette Manager and you see yeah. the notes and you know yeah. you you see the, and, the, the chance of rating. Of course, I mean, this is easy to say. I mean, it's a lot of work to to make that happen, but I think um, that would certainly help increase the number of votes. Uh, yeah, absolutely, ratings. and I think from pe from people who've actually used it, and again, we can you know um, we we can catch it. And, and Steve Steve's commenting on here, which is really interesting because I think I know who might be getting some of this work to do, Steve. Um, so <laughs> be careful what you say because you're just you're just adding stuff to your to do list at this stage. Um, but yeah, um, and and the point he made there about if you're uninstalling um, when when you rate it, because you know four five four four and five star ratings are great but actually in some ways giving something a one star rating is equally valuable to the community because if it doesn't work and you've uninstalled it you know giving it that that lower rating says yeah uh, says i've tried this and it didn't work for me and you know it, it feels harsh because we don't want to criticize open open source developers yeah. and people have yeah. put their work into it and things um and and you know absolutely at the same time i should say go and raise an issue tell people stuff doesn't work um it didn't work for, or rather, it doesn't work for you because the way you're using it, um, people people don't know. But yeah, I think I think the the general thing here is, you know, we want we want ratings in the editor, um, and it's it's nice to see actually that people have, have picked up on the work we've done, and I might even try and find some time to to look at getting some of that. Um, but even uh, even showing the scorecard, I mean, and, it, yeah, it, yeah, any information that. Um, because I, I even even uh, perhaps is all anecdotal and very personal, but I hardly ever go to the to the. I, actually, I go to the the page most of the time when I want to publish a node, right? To the to right. the uh, uh, web uh, the flow page on the website. Yeah. Uh, but I usually search with with the palette manager, not going to the to yeah the flow, yeah right? you search yeah I I I did a mock up of a like a modal that would bring up the score cut the the flows page inside the editor in a in a popover window so that it doesn't open it out to a new tab but you can mm -hmm. from the from the ins, from the palette manager you can search from there and then you can just pop up the the page that would show you the about page and the scorecard and yeah, yeah. i think more more integration between the the flows site and the editor is is something that will help there um cool i'll just say what the um just skimming through the other comments um be nice to have a view of the perfect scorecard packages. Somebody said, um, "Yeah, so, <laughs> um, so I just think, yeah. Well, um, it'd be nice to people people wanting to know how how to score if you're building a node. Um, there there is a tool. Um, it's part of the Node Red uh, admin tool. You can run the scorecard locally. So in development, you can run exactly the same code that we run on the scorecard. It's not a case of you submit your node and then you get your report. So um, all the the details of what the thing is checking should be in little tooltips on a scorecard. Um, but also, yeah, there's, um, it's, it's not a, it's a very, we're trying to be a very transparent process around the scorecard of this is what you need to do, you know, to do it. It's not a nothing, uh, nothing to catch developers out. We really want, it's more to, you know, these are best practices. Um, right. But uh, yeah, again, and the tooling, you know, and, and, and help, help is welcome with any of this tooling. Um, Somebody said, you know, once one node gets one bad vote, it will no longer be rated top using your sorting method. So I guess, uh, yeah, if, if yeah. you've got uh, all fives, it'll it'll always bring it, it down. But and by the way, it, it, the, the only reason I voted, I, I sorted by number of votes is because there's a ton of nodes that are five rated, <laughs> five star rated. So yes. I had to, yeah. I had to, I had to limit it to top ten. To top 10. Um, Absolutely, and it's. I think it's. It in some ways, you know, the the top nodes is great, but actually, just because a node is in the top nodes doesn't mean I'm going to use it because it's. You're yeah. going to search by functionality first, exactly, and exactly. then the rating is is that that guide to that. So, um, and, and so, also yeah. the 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 interesting point is like when there's several nodes that do something similar how do you choose between them right i mean it, yeah. it and, and so <laughs> having some sort of handle 
I mean, any 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 criteria would be imperfect, right? But at least have something that you can grab on and say, okay, I'm going to try this one first. <laughs> and see yeah, if that yeah, works. it's exactly. When you I've know? when I've now got, I found there's a node. Okay, there's a choice of multiple nodes. Does this this gives me an idea as to which one I'm going to try first? And yeah, yeah. Do you go with the newest? Do you go with the and you know, yeah. And that's it's really this. This is what we're trying to solve. But it's we're not there yet. But we're we're definitely there. Um, your your piece on examples as well as Nick said this morning. You know, um, yeah, the examples, the thing that are lacking. I put my hands up. I some some of my nodes i didn't have examples in until i wrote the scorecard and then thought i should better and, make sure my nodes <laughs> my notes yeah, and, well, I, and but... I put my hand up too like mm. until the scorecard i never included examples mm. in a note but as i said yeah. you usually have a, some sort of flow yeah. right because yeah. you, you're developing the, the node right you've so... got your test flows exactly and even as, um, but the other thing i was going to say is you know this is a this is actually a really good call out for people that want to contribute um if you know adding examples as a pr um, on a oh, node yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a great is, idea. Is something that's actually very easy. If you've used the node, you like the node, you had to figure it out because the examples weren't there. You've built build the examples and submit a PR. Um, you you know it's um it, it's not a, you could, if you're not sure, reach out to somebody on the forum or on Slack or something and and say you know I want to add these PRs. Even if you just email the developer the the, the flows file and say hey here's the examples. I've yeah. built some examples no, for your that, note. That, that's um, a great idea. You know it's it's Hacktoberfest in the uh, it is the season <laughs> of pull requests that yeah. most developer evangelists fear every year but that's a that's a great way to contribute and uh, and to feedback is just to add some add some examples to a node that you like and, and the other thing that also that would speak to not quality this just occurred to me i should have mentioned this <laughs> uh that maybe it's e relatively easy to do automated uh, uh, automatically is uh see if the node has any documentation uh and again it's like maybe if the file is there i mean okay, yeah it, yeah it, we that can't. was i think i think there was a test i started writing a check to look at the readme and um i mean i think because you kind of have to have a readme virtually to even publish something on github or it guides you but then we started oh, no, no, I, I meant the oh. the the the, the, flow, oh, the, the help uh, text the, the, yes the, in the locales uh, uh, uh well, yeah, that, the, the, the help help text, the HTML help text. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that was another one there of of checking it. That was just, I think, yeah, that was that was on the on the wish list. And it, again, it's probably the next thing we'd add in is is trying to look at the docs and say, is there something written here? Trying to trying to work out a sort of average amount of um, you know text. So it's not just, obviously if it's just one line, maybe you know, a title. Not yeah, that, I mean, I, yeah. Again, this kind of automated things is hard to ascertain. We we know. did some work to look at the um, I can't remember which test it was, but there was one uh, the number of dependencies. That was it, which is an interesting one because it's saying, well, yeah. if they've got a lot of dependencies, it can be a red flag. But so actually, I the, the value we set was based on the ninetieth percentile. So ninety percent of nodes have less than six dependencies. So anything with more than six will. We won't say that's bad, but we'll warn that hey, this is this is a lot. It might be a you know a node with a lot of things in there. Yeah. Um, yep. So uh, anyway, we should uh, we should move on. So um, thank you, Pablo. I shall yeah, uh, speak to you soon. All right. Cool. All right. So now comes the uh, the interesting switch because I have to introduce the next speaker, and the next speaker is me. So I think the best way to do this is I'll change my name from host. Um, and uh, and then I shall bring in my slides. Oops, window. I should have prepared this before. Share screen. Window. There's my slides. Cool. Uh, so our next speaker is me. Um, <laughs> my name's Sam Machin. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, this. is This is kind of how I got into Node Red, actually. Um, so for those of you that don't know, my um, my day job now is I work for Flowforge as a product manager. Um, so really, you know, within the Node Red ecosystem and, and all this kind of thing, and how we can how we can run Node Red. But uh, my my original background is telecoms and specifically uh, APIs and, and controlling phone calls and text messages and things through that. Um, and that's yeah, what what led me to Node Red. I think about four, maybe five years ago now. Um, so as a, as a really useful way to just you know control and, and manage APIs. Um, so yeah, programmable communications. What what is programmable comms? Um, for those of you that so when I say communications, so I'm talking basically about about phone numbers, phone calls, text messages, and this kind of thing. Um, so what we have today, you know, on your mobile, um, and it's interacting with the phone system. So the phone network is a massive, you know, massive distributed network of computers really these days, um, and end user devices. There's you know, something like six and a half billion phone numbers or something in the in the world. Um, each one of those represents a represents a user's device, and 
they they can all communicate via each other. They have an addressing scheme, um, so the, the phone number scheme. We you know the country code, area code, and, and number. You can you can address them, and then you can do voice text messages, at least on mobile phones. Um, but it, this goes way back to you know the the same principles of the system have been there for getting on for 140 years. 1883, I think, was the first mechanical phone exchange, and you know not a lot has. It hasn't radically changed. There's there's a hell of a lot of backward compatibility in that. Um, so in you know the last 10, 10 and a bit years though, this concept of programmable communications really came out, um, and this is interacting with the phone system using web technologies. Um, so APIs, REST, um, you know, web hooks, JSON, XML, all these kind of technologies we use for um, you know, control, talking to an API like the Twitter API or uh, indeed, the Node Red API, and, and these days, what makes everything run? A few companies started to emerge, which were giving you access to the phone system via these friendly APIs. Um, anybody that before that was doing it, you know, there, there were ways to hook into the phone system, but they were weird proprietary protocols. Um, you had to get you know custom connectivity. Um, you, we, you were talking a, a five-figure sum to get started. So, um, really, the, the, these companies kind of changed the changed the game in terms of making it accessible. Um, Say so primarily, the original implementation was um, text messages, SMS, and phone calls. Um, and then as that world has evolved and fewer people make regular phone calls these days um, and, and send messages, um, it's expanded. So the the over-the-top services like WhatsApp, like Viber, Telegram, the messages, um, there's APIs to those. Fundamentally, they're, they're still kind of like a text message. It's just a slightly different network. Um, and then, you know, real-time video, WebRTC. So, so what we're using here in StreamYard is based on WebRTC. I'm, I'm talking to you through a browser. Um, and there are platforms out there, the, these programmable communication platforms that will let you build things with video um, and chat. Uh, I say they've been around since about 2008. Um, is probably the, the, the first um, real kind of genesis of, of that or the, the milestone. Um, and, you know, there, there's lots of companies out there. I'm just going to call out three of the... Three of the big ones. I'm trying to keep this a, a vendor agnostic talk, but um, probably three of the the top ones today. There's a company called Vonage who acquired another company called Nexmo, which was a programmable communications platform um, that where I used to work. Uh, so you see Nexmo Vonage used interchangeably sometimes. Uh, Messagebird, another one uh, based in the Netherlands, and then Twilio, um, which probably most people have, if, if they've done anything in this space, will have at least heard of Twilio. Um, they, I think, really may open the, created the market. So they were sort of 2008, I believe, was the early days of them. And, and this idea of, hey, we've got an API to the phone system. Um, and then there's a long tail of probably literally hundreds, hundreds more out there today. Um, and, you know, regional ones, localized ones in specific countries. Um, there's some open source stuff, uh, which we'll, I'll talk about a little bit in, uh, later. Um, and, you know, th there's hundreds of different ways to, to get an API connection into the phone system today um so why is this interesting relevant to node red um well node red is program uh, visual programming for event driven applications as we now call it um we used to say for the internet of things and i used to have to then try and explain how telephony uh, was an internet of things type device in uh, in this sense because a phone is just another thing connected to the internet but it's event driven um and communications is inherently event driven uh you you send a text message. That's an event. Um, you you die, you you get a phone call. Your phone rings. That's an event. Um, and what these providers do is turn these uh, events into or these in, these communications events into webhooks, which means you can then consume them as events in Node Red and do what you want with them. Um, so how how does this work? Well, typically um, a te text message simplest. So when a user sends a text message to one of your programmable numbers. So in this sense, we get new phone numbers um, for our applications. And from my phone, I send a, to a text message to a number which is linked to my application. That makes an HTTP request to the app. Um, and that contains that HTTP post will, will contain the body of the message. It'll say, this is the text message that who sent it. This is the number they sent it to. This is what the message says. Um, so you've just got a, a little bit of input. Um, and then you can just... You can just act that back and say, you know, 200 OK um, and do something with that message in your in your flow or you can choose to reply to it. So either depending on the platform, you can reply to the HTTP request 
with a correctly formatted body that will be sent back as a new text message to the person that sent it, like a reply, or you you make a new request. Um, so that can be something as simple as I think you know food trucks and things will will do a what's our daily specials. So you text a specials or you you text something like you know a word to a number and it replies back with the the special taco of the day or or whatever that kind of thing is. Um, so really simple little services, but actually really useful for businesses. Um, phone calls, again, they work in a similar way. Um, incoming call makes a request um, and you decide how to proceed. So a little bit more complex phone calls, but we'll uh, we'll come on to that because there's not more you can do to it. Um, this is something, so so to explain one of the, one of the things that people have uh, sometimes get, get a little bit confused with, so I'm just finding my slides, um, a little bit confused with in terms of programmable communications. Um, so we all understand the idea of sending a text message from my phone to your phone, from a person to person. Um, you know, each phone has a number. But these, th in, in programmable communications, we talk about person to application or application to person because it's a separate flow. You are interacting from the point of view of the phone call or the point of view of the text message, you're interacting with a service. So I'm sending the message from from my phone as the user here to the number of the application or the application is sending the message to me. Now, I suspect everybody has has had some interaction with this because all of those package delivery notifications, your parcel will be delivered between nine and 12 tomorrow. Your, you know, your driver is on the way. Um, these are application to person type messages. Um, so these are the, the two main models in programmable communications of person to app. You, somebody sends something in app to person and it may come out what we don't have control of is you don't have programmable control of person to person messages so i can't sort of hook an app in that says when anybody sends a text message to my mobile number i want to do something with it um, however there is a, a way to create these person to uh, person to person kind of exchanges where you send it into the application and the application forwards it on um, again a very common use of this is Things like the the ride sharing driver. So if you're you're talking to your Uber driver and you call a number that's um yeah you you and you talk to your Uber driver. What you're the number you're calling is an application number, and what that number is doing is looking up in the system who the driver that's currently assigned to pick you up is based on the the caller ID and connecting you to the right the right driver. But it hides the number of both you as the caller, so the driver doesn't see your number and you don't see the driver's number. And it's it's part of the ride-sharing kind of staying in the in the loop, uh, making sure that, you know, protects privacy, but also protects their business model because you can't cut the platform out and just sort of phone the driver directly and pay cash. Um, so, you know, that, it's kind of a concept that's important to uh, to remember in this. Um, so this uh, this example flow here, this is a simple, simple way of handling an SMS. Um, hopefully you can just about see that, but... I've got a screenshot here, my iPhone just sending a, a hello world text message to a number um, and a simple node red flow just using the core nodes where we, we've got an incoming webhook on, on get slash SMS and what's in the payload of that message, we're just logging it out here, but um, we've got the the object which contains this this funny thing here, MSISDN, which is telco speak for the phone number of the person that spent it to you, so that's my mobile number, hence I've, I've blurred the last bit out. Uh, the number it's two, so really that should be considered the from, the first one. Uh, the two, that's the number I sent it to, uh, an ID, um, the text of the message, uh, the type of message it was text, a timestamp, and a few other sort of internal things, the account it was it was sent on and stuff. So handling a text message in Node-RED is, is kind of that easy. Um, all you, you really need to also do um, is you'll need to configure the number. So going to the provider's platform, um, buying renting a number so they're typically it depends on the country in the uk i think they're about a dollar a month um you get your phone number you pick a new number um and you set up your webhook url where where should messages be sent hit save away you go any messages sent to that number will go to uh, go to your to your application cool okay so moving on as you said to phone calls um and and the like. For those that maybe aren't, aren't from the UK, that's that's the original kind of what what phones looked like when I was a child, at least back in the in the eighties and things. This was the standard phone that uh, that British Telecom gave every household with the old rotary dial. Um, but a lot of this would still work with one of those rotary dial phones today. Um, so, as, as I said earlier, phone calls are 
more complex. Uh, they're more, they're more, there's more to them. Um, a call has a number of events. So it can go through initially that stage of, you know, you dial the number, the call is ringing, then the call gets answered by the application. Um, or if you're making a call to a person, the phone rings and then the, the person answers. So you get an event when it answers. Uh, and then within that call, you can do um, ha capture input. So, you know, please leave a message after the beep, beep, chunk of recording. And then that recording is sent to your application. Uh, DTMF input, which for those of you that aren't familiar, DTMF is uh, dual tone multi-frequency. It's the, the, the tones, the buttons on the phone. So if somebody presses five, that plays a tone down the line. That's an event. So you can capture the the input either as a sequence of digits or as one-off digits. So press one for sales, press two for support, um, that kind of thing. Or, you know, please enter your account number, uh, anything like that. And then the call has ended. So there's a number of, of events that come through. And the way that most of the providers use is they use some kind of markup language scripting type of, of context for making these, uh, controlling the call. So the initial call comes in, um, you know, ringing and you, your application gets a webhook and responds back with a piece of script that says, okay, answer the call, play a bit of text to speech, and then wait for the user to press a button. And then when they press that button, send it to this endpoint. And then you get another event that says the user pressed three and you decide what to do. And that can be connect, you know, forward the call on to another endpoint. So like they've pressed three, connect them to sales, or it can be play a record, another different recording. So you can, you can interact with it. Um, and so it's that combination of the markup language and webhooks um, are the fundamental sort of building blocks of, of programming a call. Uh, and I say they've all got a slightly, slightly customized platform specific language. Uh, Twilio calls theirs Twimmel, uh, Twilio markup language, and that's an XML based uh, language. Ironically, most people probably, you know, would veer back from XML, but it's f for the way that calls work, it's actually quite nice because you can nest stuff and things. Um, Vonage uses a, a scheme called NCCO, uh, which is a JSON based, uh, so an array with a list of, of JSON objects in there as, as, as actions. Um, MessageBird has both XML and JSON. I think JSON originally, and they seem to be introducing XML as a as a parallel, so depending on your on your platform. Um, and actually, as I'll show you in a minute, Node-RED handles both of these quite well. Um, and yeah, so here's just some little examples of, of what that looks like. Um, so this is at the top, some Twili Twi Twilio Twimmel. Um, so we have an XML declaration, and then ooh, let's go back one. Uh, we wrap it in a, um, a response and then gather, which is their verb for collecting input, either via speech or via tones. Um, we're looking for a timeout of three seconds. So wait, if they haven't pressed anything within three seconds, move on. Um, and we're capturing just one digit. So then, yeah, please press one or say sales for sales through the speech wrapped in that. Um, similarly, Vonage uh, has it slightly more uh longer more more uh, more lines but actually the same information we're doing some speech to text here that says please enter a digit and then we're collecting that digit one digit through dtmf and sending it to this this endpoint this event url um, and again yeah message bird uh kind of similar to the twilio um lots more sort of markups and uh and options in there but fundamentally we have a say that says welcome to message bird press one or press two so you're giving the user some kind of instruction and then you're waiting for some input. Um, and this is, you know, this is reasonably similar. You, it, once you kind of get the, read the documentation, you start to play around, you can see what it's doing. So uh, doing this in Node-RED though, so we know Node-RED, it's visual. We don't want to be writing too much script. Um, so you can, to some extent, depending on the platform, um, this this is the actually the Nexmo platform, uh, Nexmo nodes, or this is what, what is now the Vonage API. Um, I actually built these in my in my previous job. Um, I don't think they've, they've been updated since I left, unfortunately, but uh, they still have the old branding, but it all still, the API is the same. So this would be a call flow of what we saw earlier in that uh, in that Vonage NCCO. So the webhook comes in for answer. That's, that's where we've directed the phone number when it rings to make a request to slash answer. And we respond back with a talk action and then an input action to capture the data. And, and inside, uh, these are just screenshots, but inside the config for this node, you can set up what you say in the talk. You can choose the voice you want to use, all that kind of thing. Um, and again, in the input, you set up how many digits you're expecting. Are you just collecting one digit or is it a 10 digit number? Um, you know, when should you time out, all that kind of thing. Um, and then the input comes in, 
Um, so this is our, our next webhook, which this input has told it where to go to. Um, and we will inspect that payload to say what, what digit did they press? If they pressed one, we'll play a message and then we'll use this connect action to forward the call on to somewhere. Um, if they press two, we'll play a slightly different message and forward the call on to somewhere else. Um, and because these are these are webhooks, we have this closing return return action here. So it's much like an HTTP request response node. Um, doing it in, in Twilio. Um, so the Twilio node, I think Pablo mentioned is actually one of the most one of the most popular ones. And I think it's pre-installed on, on an environment, which is probably why. But um, that one, that, that node mostly handles SMS. If you want to do the voice, um, you both good and bad. There aren't any custom nodes at the moment for doing Twimmel, but you can just write XML straight away in the uh, in the in the template nodes. Um, so this is just some Twimmel with templating, where I'm just reading back the name, uh, the, sorry, the number that you're calling from. Uh, okay. So I mentioned webhooks um, a minute ago. Uh, so this is uh, sorry, the. Um, one of the one of the challenges, if you're running Node Red locally, um, and you're running Node Red on on your laptop on a Raspberry Pi at home, you know that kind of thing getting started, as quite a lot of people are, um, you need to. It needs to be able to be accessible as a server from these from these webhooks from these services. Um, now, you know, if you're kind of technically minded and things, maybe you've you you know how to do port forwarding on your router, um, so you can turn on the from your external IP address, you can say, "Oh, forward all the traffic to this port to port eighteen eighty on the IP address of my Raspberry Pi or whatever." Um, but that also, you know, then you've got things like DNS. Do I want a host name? Security. It, it's all a little bit. Um, a little bit clunky. So a quick call shout out for um, a, another package out there or a service called Ngrok, um, which kind of solves a lot of that. It lets you run an agent on your local machine, which tunnels out through your network at home to the point on the internet and gives you a consistent host name and forwards the traffic straight away to a port, in this case, to Node-RED. Um, so Ngrok is that there is a free tier where you're, you don't get a persistent address or, uh, or it changes. But uh, yeah, Ngrok will will really was originally created for web for handling webhooks, um, especially in in development environments. Um, and there is an Ngrok package out there as well that you can drop on. Um, it's a it's a node I created as a simple wrapper around the Ngrok service, so you can just drop that into your Node Red. Click it's like an inject node. Click the start button, and it'll tell you the URL um, that that you've got, so you can send traffic straight away to there. Um, okay, and very fin finally, because uh, I think we're getting a little time, time the uh, open source. So Node-RED is an open source project. We love open source. Um, you know, it gives us a lot of control. A lot of people use Node-RED because it's open source and because they can run it wherever they like. Um, and you might be sort of concerned around using the proprietary commercial third-party services for the phone calls, which you can't then sort of control uh, control what it comes from. There is a fantastic project uh, out there called Jambones, jambons.org, um, which is a open source, um, it's an open source programmable communications platform. So it's a run your own Twilio, message bird, Vonage, whatever. Um, it's, it's not a beginner project. Um, it does kind of rely on you having a bit of experience with things like SIP and voice over IP. Um, so if you've done stuff like setting up asterisk before, maybe the the little home PBX, um, that will that will help on there. But uh, yeah, it's uh, you you then bring your own VoIP service, so you can just get phone numbers from from anywhere um, from sort of tele commercial providers, or even run it in a in a private network. But uh, cool. So there we are. Um, I can see Nick's now joined, so I'm hoping Nick might be. Hey Nick, have <laughs> you come to do the questions? <laughs> so I, I thought to... it, it would only be fair for me for to give you a hand rather than you have to. Um, although do the double, <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me just have a scan through. Uh, yes, I was just questions. Uh... I, I, the one that has jumped out was, um, "Do I hear a dog?" <laughs> yes surprisingly he's been really good all day and then he's just woken up and and is scratching at the door to the office because he's got this <laughs> shut out so awesome um, um so yeah um, there have been a few fairly general questions come through um let me just 
just proofreading them before I show them. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, this this one's coming, which I, I guess is a little tangential. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah. As, as we're both here. <laughs> um, so what's the noted roadmap for large scale requests? The event driven app will be able to deal with massive requests, for example, a thousand devices requesting at the same time. Well, so I mean, it depends on the request. I mean, I, I guess when you even look at the sort of the telecom stuff, you've got to think about what's the actual size of the request you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Are you dealing with a large scale of tiny messages, a large scale of big messages, um, and and what are you doing with those messages? The amount of the amount of processing you do on it is is often the the deciding factor. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I think the, the node red answer has always been, yeah, that uh, you you kind of you need to scale your your environment to handle the sorts of workloads you care about, as you would any application, any Node.js application, um, you know, be able to do, put multiple node instances behind a load balancer if you're dealing with HTTP. Um, yeah, again, it, it depends on so many variables, but I don't think there's anything inherent in Node.red that's different to a normal application architecture for how you would choose to scale it. Um, and again, there's always going to be a limit as to what an individual Node.red instance can do to, to help address that. But, um, you know, it, it's the type of thing we, we are looking at in a bigger picture, um, more, you know, thinking about how do you take Node-RED from, you know, the, a single instance app to something you want to scale much more broadly, um, and whether, whether there's more that can be done in the core of Node-RED to help that. I was at NodeConf EU, uh, Node.js conference this week, and there were some really interesting talks around um, performance and uh, optimizations and that type of stuff, and it, it's sparked some ideas in my head of some some areas of performance we can improve. Um, yeah, and I absolutely. thought, I mean, I've yeah. some of the stuff I've been playing with has been with um with doing voice through Node Red, so I've been some some walkie talkies and and even some stuff with Alexa. If I say it very carefully, it won't trigger. Um, but actually, you know, and and you've got audio streams coming through, so twenty millisecond uh, frames of audio into node red and just just really rooting them not doing a massive amount of processing but if you've got 50 messages a second um from a, from an endpoint it still amazes me that it's uh, it's quite comfortable with that as long as i'm just sort of sending them from one point to another um, yes awesome cool well i'm gonna drop out as i can oh, see our next yes. speaker is in the way oh. yeah group. you go and sort them we've got a we've got another quick break so uh i think we're back at uh at four thirty, uh, yes, four thirty-five uh, UTC. So uh, just uh, say 10, 15 minute break, and then we've got Jesse from Wago, um, who's going to be talking about industrial automation. Thanks, everyone.
turn that one off. I'll get the hang of this by the end of today. <laughs> Hello, welcome back. Um, so we are moving ahead. Uh, I don't know how we are. We are just over halfway, I think. We've had one, two, three, four, five, six speakers. Uh, yeah, we've had six, uh, five speakers, sorry. Uh, we've got four more to go. So uh, our next speaker is Jesse Cox. Uh, Let's bring Jesse onto the stream. Hi, Jesse. Um, your title is, I think you have the you have the longest job title of all the speakers because I remember this when trying to edit the edit the cards on the website, and it was the one that made me go into three lines. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you are director of automation sales engineering and development, or automation sales engineering. There should, there should be a comma there, but I'm guessing sales, not all of sales. sales engineering. Yeah, sales engineering and yeah. development. Automation, yes. <laughs> Um, Indeed, at Wago yeah. Corp, so uh, so I I know Wago for for creating the little um, connectors and things, but uh, right. I've yeah. discovered you do a lot more than that. So I shall these, uh, hand these it little guys right here. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know, the same technology that we bring to the to the connections, we we bring it to automation as well. Cool. We've been a, a long established automation company, and I'll kind of I'll do a bit of a flyover of who we are as a company, but for now, let's just. Um, yeah, let's jump right in. Hey, Thanks for having yours. me, Sam. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, I've been a, a big fan and a big proponent of the Node-RED platform for several years now. And it's a tool that we've embraced really uh, deeply here at Wago in trying to, trying to bring along the industrial automation world into, um, you know, into the open source realm. And so that's what I'd like to talk about today. So we'll do a little introduction to start. Uh, we'll talk about hyper automation and the things that Node-RED brings to um, our industry. Talk about a little bit of portability and then deployment and some, some really neat tools and partners that we use for this. So just to jump into it, I do have a long job title. Um, I usually just introduce myself as an automation guy at Wago. Um, but um, I oversee the, the sales engineering group as well as the development group at Wago in the U.S. and work closely with our manufacturing in Germany um, for product development, software development. I've been with Wago for 10 years. Um, I'm, I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, most of us in the U.S. are, are uh, distributed. I'm a software engineer who's worked in industrial automation my whole career. And uh, I was lucky enough to come up through industrial automation while there was a bit of a migration towards more open platforms. And I have uh, deployed tons of different tools, whether open source tools or closed source tools on thousands of machines. Um, and anybody that, that uh, interfaces me, whether in my professional life or my personal life, knows that I just dearly love industrial automation. So um, I also really love contributing to communities. And it's the thing that really drew me to Node-RED in the first place was the strong community and the community contributions um, and the ability to also contribute to that community. But um, you know, when I talk a little about Wago, uh, it'll, it'll make sense of how we can leverage these platforms so, so nicely. But um, I have a pretty deep uh, GitHub um, presence. I, Love to make YouTube videos on fun little tools and tricks that I had learned throughout my, my travels. And I also um, have published nodes in the Node-RED um, repos as well. So just a, a little bit about Wago. Um, I, I, I didn't want to make this a, a sales presentation, but I think it's interesting to, to learn the backstory. Our history in the automation space is really in modularity and in um, this platform agnostic approach to uh, industrial field bus communications and um, programming in general. We released our first automation products in the mid 90s. Um, we made the first protocol agnostic field bus IO system and made it also completely modular from a, from a hardware standpoint. So we could just kind of trim the fat and, and put stuff together kind of like Legos in order to create the right IO profile. Um, later on, uh, we released one of the first uh, industry, um, yeah, industry available Ethernet based PLCs, which um, had a web server, which was fairly revolutionary at the time. And later on, um, in the, the early 2010s, we released the first Linux based PLC to the market. 
And what that brought with it was quite a bit of, of networking capability. It brought uh, some the ability to, to do things modularly from a software standpoint as well. And so we leverage this in some really interesting ways. I, I loved the, the um, presentation earlier on the um, on the Ming server. I think this is something that's been top of mind for the industry, my industry for quite a while, but um, several years ago, we started to uh, support, officially support the Docker engine on our platform. And what Docker brought with it was the ability to containerize and modularize software. Um, the most prevalent tool um, that we apply this, this Docker engine to is Node-RED. And we have leveraged Node-RED in so many different interesting ways running on um, in, in, in industrial automation systems and on automated machines. We often pair this with other softwares like Nflux and Grafana, um, but we've really learned how to make the most of this kind of tool on um, an industrial control system. The new landscape of automation is, is getting pretty wild. And this is maybe the most exciting time, I think, in, in my lifetime to be part of uh, the automation realm. Um, it's because we have so many things at our fingertips and so much of this is community-based and so much of this requires a bit of, of kind of creative thought, how, how it's applied, a little bit of discipline and how you step into these projects. But, but you know, the, the, the world, of, uh, the ocean of, of automation now is deep um, and it can get fairly confusing. And I think it's one of the, one of the reasons that we tend to gravitate towards no bread is because it really tends to um, flatten out the learning curve for some of these other technologies and makes it a lot more accessible to, um, to users. So um, you can see we have a pretty deep menu of things that we can use here. Um, Node-RED definitely stands out as uh, one of the tools that we gravitate towards. Because of this, um, we've developed quite a bit on the platform to cater to this. Uh, a lot of these are, well, all of these are um, open source and no cost um, software tools that can be used with our with our products. So um, last year, uh, I finally published uh, a production ready or a late beta, I guess we can call it uh, API to the IO system, which works directly with some node red um, nodes that were also published. So this allows you to interact with the controllers uh, directly without having to use some sort of interface or IO driver from the from the PLC runtime. So this has started, uh, this has allowed us to step out of the, the traditional PLC, um, you know, the, the traditional PLC programming paradigms and start to leverage these platforms directly without uh, requiring some closed source or proprietary runtime. All right, now I'm going to kind of fly here because um, I know that time is going to be Time's going to be tight already, and there's some interesting things to show. So let's just kind of step through what what an automation, what an industrial control system looks like. Um, you've typically got a programming IDE. Uh, the 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 common thread in in industry is that these are proprietary. They're usually target or platform specific. Um, they almost always require licensing of some sort, whether it's on the, the target or whether it's the IDE itself. And uh, these are Almost all, I think, without exception, compiled, and they're compiled for the target, so they're rarely portable. There's an I/O system involved, almost always. Uh, the I/O system um, typically is platform specific too, and is locked to an internal protocol. Uh, there are field bus protocols that we deal with, so some of these were brought up earlier, things like Modbus or Ethernet IP or Profinet. Um, these are very common in industry and. I'd say they're almost required still. Um, they can be library based, which means you can use function blocks to interface with them, but you're building those things programmatically. You can use configurator based um, networking managers. Those are typically locked to a platform and they're often vendor specific in their implementation. Uh, there's uh, typically an HMI involved in here or some sort of visualization. More and more there's a there's a bit of a bring your own device trend happening where these things are deployed either on phones or tablets, which require some HTML5 or some sort of web-based uh, HMI. But when those things are um, 
used from a like a runtime IDE, they're follow the, the path of like a WYSIWYG type of um, development tool, which does things to lock scales, etc. So they're not necessarily as scalable as um, something that's built on a more modern web framework. There's a data uh, and database component almost always to control systems now, which means they need to be able to inter interface with databases. And more and more we see this, especially in, in our world, there are connected clouds. And this is where things get a little bit tricky because uh, the way I like to phrase it is that JSON and IEC 611.31 are not friends. Um, we can kind of take a look at the, at the logic um, flow of a control system and just see typically what's needed. So I pulled a use case here because um, we, we've recently been working with some, some projects on doing full machine control with Node-RED. And this is a bit of an abstracted um, use case, but we're, we've um, been able to kind of glean some, some general logic here. So we look at the workflow from the IC standpoint. Um, and our RFID scan typically takes about two hours to code. The database queries, roughly two hours. Uh, we're often dealing with strings here, which become arrays of ASCII bytes. And you're doing quite a bit of manipulation of, of arrays here. We have to weigh the package. This is going to be, um, let's say, Modbus, and we need to, to scale some values from here. We need to write some logic to divert the package by weight. We need to write the conveyor logic for um, each downstream conveyor. We need to manifest this, this data uh, to a couple of places, in this case, AWS and, and MongoDB. But let's look at the same kind of time required for something like Node-RED, and this is where hyper automation comes in. The RFID scan is roughly five minutes. This is the benefit you get from a, a low code, no code kind of scenario. Query the database, uh, 20 minutes. Wait the package is an hour. The logic is 30 minutes. Conveyor logic is 30 minutes. These are typically about the same efforts uh, with both of them. Manifesting this data, um, packaging this data up into some tidy JSON uh, structure is a 10 minute event. And it's about 10 minutes to port that data to uh, AWS or Mongo. So this is what we typically refer to as hyper automation, where we can select these, um, these components of a project and we can streamline them or, or make the development or prototyping of them um, extremely fast and extremely clean by implementing a, a no code or a low code type solution like node -red. Just to kind of get a little granular with this, um, when I talk about uh, IEC languages and um, JSON not being friends, it really is because uh, there's very there are very few mechanisms built into an IEC environment that allow you to just easily parse or build JSON structures. They, they always become strings, and those strings always become arrays of ASCII bytes. So when they get parsed, for example, um, it requires you to step through character by character. Unless you have a, a library, which there are more and more of um, every day, but the libraries still require a, a bit of um, IC knowledge and quite a bit of manipulation here. So contrast that against Node-RED, where it's, it's really, I hate the word easy, but I'm going to use it here. Now, portability is just as important in modern control systems, especially um, as of late with everybody seeing supply chain issues. If you try to buy a Raspberry Pi, for example, you know uh, what I'm talking about, or any other in, um, any industrial control platform. Um, portability means everything right now, and the ability to um, free free yourself from from being a, a one vendor type of operation. So this is another area where Node-RED really shines. Um, what I mean by that is that essentially we can run this tool on anything. And I, I would imagine that most people uh, here watching this understand exactly what that means moving from device to device. But um, especially when it's containerized, we can run it on a directly on a web panel. Um, or any Linux-based panel. 
we can run this directly on the PLC if this is a Linux based PLC and we can also run these on um, computers in you know, in that control network. Um, these typically can also be run on microcontrollers, local PCs or VMs, an on-premise server, cloud servers, etc. And since the code lives on the device and the code is, is um, you know, that this is the advantage obviously of it being scripted, uh, it can be portable from device to device and it can run on almost anything that would live in an industrial control system. Now, the topic comes up quite a bit of DevOps and deployment and how this works within an industrial control environment. More and more platforms um, like Code Assist, um, and there are other companies that are, that are embracing the idea of um, revision control and, and more DevOps-based practices around, um, around a control system, but they're typically adapted to the IDE or adapted to the development tool not necessarily intrinsic from the beginning. And this is another area where no red really shines within our industry. So we've all, we've all seen this. If you're in the industrial controls world, you've seen this a million times of um, best practice of naming your projects with a version and then working and then final and then final, final and use this, et cetera. Um, this, is a, this is a bit of a, a plague across the industry and um, it's it's becoming better and better but um, just given the structure of IDEs typically this is this has been the practice maybe not best practice but the practice across the industry for quite a while yeah and the deployment challenge is real the deployment challenge is um, maybe the biggest one the biggest topic right now and how we can um, combat you know, geographic challenges, um, technology challenges, security challenges, et cetera. So right now, um, the, even some of the best tools require um, IDE specific programming ports to be open on an, uh, on a target. They require some sort of VPN or natting of a, of a network so that you can gain access to it remotely. And any workarounds on this typically will institute an on-premise computer with proprietary software that has to be licensed and it has to be managed just like you'd manage your local development machine. So this becomes um, very tricky to, to manage remotely. Um, and when we think about this kind of platform agnostic, you know, feature or, or um, yeah, uh, attribute that Node-RED brings, we can start to, to shed some of those things. So we can use tools like NPM to deploy the resources, the infrastructure and the dependencies for, um, for systems. We can leverage tools like Prescient. Um, I know Pablo was on here earlier, Prescient's been just a fantastic partner of ours um, in helping us to overcome some of these deployment and, and remote code management challenges. So, we can leverage Prescient for continuous deployment, flow development, um, cloud-based management, dashboarding, et cetera. Um, and then it allows us to also use Git in ways that Git was intended to be used with a, a true version control um, and a true uh, yeah, collaboration tool so we can follow proper Git flow behaviors and we can properly document our systems. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna fly through this last bit because I want to show just a really quick demo. So the question becomes, can Node Red control my entire machine? Uh, the answer is maybe. Um, I have a quick demo that I want to show, which is a sort by weight conveyor that uses um, a control panel interface. This is all virtualized. It's got some discrete sensors, some Modbus data coming from a scale and RFID controlling a bunch of conveyors. Um, it's got database hooks as well as AWS hooks and a very simple visualization. But really what it comes down to is, is working through the project and looking at the, the components that can be, uh, that, that you can leverage Node-RED and you can start to step through those things. And what we're finding more and more is that we can use Node-RED to do, to do more tasks uh, and deeper in a, in a project. So. If I can stop sharing real quick, I'm gonna share another screen.
fact, let's just share this whole thing here. So what I've got here, hopefully you can see this just fine, is a, a virtualized conveyor system. And um, I've got no, no PLC control in this whatsoever. This is running on a, um, on a, on a WAGO controller, but the runtime has been shut off and it's been replaced by the node red flow. So um, this flow here, I think it's just under 80 lines of, of logic and it's doing all of the control for the machine plus the um, databasing and the cloud interactions as well. So let's give it a go. If we hit play here and we can turn on our control panel. So here we go. We can see the sensors here lighting up in the, in the dashboard. And if I pull the flow over, you can see the data being processed through here. If we look at this in uh, AWS, we can also see the data coming through the IoT core as well. So this is just a, a really simple example of, of how we can leverage these tools to kind of streamline the, streamline the process, rapidly prototype. Um, these are the kind of ways that we're leveraging Node-RED in, um, in, in our realm. And as we do this, um, as we move through these, these applications, we tend to see more and more, it goes deeper and deep, deeper into um, how much we allow or how much we ask uh, these sorts of tools to, um, to do. All right, I came in right at 20 minutes, I think. Oh, there we go. <laughs> cool. I was just checking whether you wanted, yeah, we're fine for time, but that was that was great. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a really cool demo. I love the little actually clicking the buttons on the sort of physical panel to turn the thing on and stuff. <laughs> like, it's gotta, it's, we've got to get it as close to reality as we can, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've got, a, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, I want to find my mouse. That uh, I think maybe that, that demo almost shows, but... Um, I'm wondering is yeah so from my cash um yeah it's a generic node red red question but maybe you're well placed for this um digital twins have you does that does that kind of simulator environment ever get used for digital twin or yeah you bet yeah in fact we can because we can uh, make a lot of that logic redundant or we can we can um, split these data objects it's it's so easy to do in node red that we we often leverage it that way yeah. And is that 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 um, simulated three three D environment? You know, that's that's a Wago a Wago Wago product or is that an internal tool or? It's not. No, and I get asked about that a lot. It's actually a a, a video game developer uh, <laughs> who built this this tool. It's for for training on PLC. It's called Factory IO. It's really a great tool for you know what we try mm. so hard to remove ourselves from the abstract and start you know try to get closer to. Reality when we talk about these things, um, it, it's really helpful for that, and it's it's not limited to those components I showed. It's 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 pretty cool. powerful. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, and another one from someone uh, from Hop Road Garage. Uh, do you have any customers running Node Red in their production environment today? The question we always get. Um, yes, there are lots, but I don't know. Maybe something something from your your background. It's a hard yes. Yeah, it's a yeah. hard yes. We we have. Um, yeah, I'll do the math in my head real quick, but I, I feel confident saying dozens, if not, you know, something around 100 customers running Node Red in production. Yeah, yeah. It, it still amazes where they where it appears and things. Oh, and the dog's back. <laughs> <laughs> right on cue. So as soon as I start talking, he hears my voice. I think that's what it is. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, I don't think I'll just give it a second. Any more questions um, for Jesse? But. Uh... Scanning the um, background, but uh, no, okay. Well, we've got our next speaker, um, I think, waiting in the wings. So we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Jesse. That was great. Thanks for including me. Yeah. Okay. So uh, next speaker. Yep, there he is, Lakshankar. Are you uh, if you're ready? You might want to um, share your screen with us as well. But uh, I'll bring that in, and uh, I'll shall introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is uh, Lakshankar. Uh, 
Disanayaki. I didn't. I I got his first name right when I spoke to him yesterday. I didn't ask him about his surname, but uh, he's uh, at Siege Studio. Um, he's going to be talking to us about Node Red. Uh, sorry, No Code AI Vision at the Edge uh, with Node Red. So let's bring him on. Hey, Alexander, how are you? Hello, Sam. How are you? I'm good. good. Cool. Okay, so um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but that's fine. So you can feel free to <laughs> feel free to take uh, take a few more minutes. Uh, the longer if you want to. Um, I shall bring your slides up and over to you. Okay. So, can I start now? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this talk about uh, Node, no code AI vision at the edge with Node Red. So, I'm Lakshanta, uh, and I'm an application engineer at Siege Studio. So my, my main areas of focus are IoT, embedded systems, and AI. And I, I have also worked in the industry for about four years now. So uh, I worked as a Udemy instructor in the past as well. So if you want to connect with me, you can check my LinkedIn, Twitter, and also check my works on GitHub. So uh, I will briefly explain. Uh, I will brief, I will give a brief introduction about Seed Studio at first. So uh, Seed Studio if, is an open source hardware manufacturer, which focuses uh, mainly on manufacturing uh, from sensors to uh, microcontrollers to single board computers. So we also manufacture AI IoT enabled devices and also uh, industrial grade sensors. Uh, we we started uh, in uh, 2008, and so far we have. Um, uh, manufactured more than 2,095 modules and served more than 350,000 users. Uh, also, uh, through our agile manufacturing services, uh, you can go from a prototype uh, to mass production in a very uh, little time. Uh, we also uh, uh, have uh, strategic partners in, in, in the industry, and we have around uh, 200, uh, more than 200 partners that we partner and uh, uh, build solutions together. So these are some of the sensors uh, that we uh, manufacture. So we manufacture sensors such as uh, soil moisture, temperature, humidity, uh, different uh, sensors to uh, measure the environmental conditions, and also uh, communication devices such as the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, and LoRa devices. Also, we manufacture main boards uh, such as the uh, microcontrollers, single board computers, and uh, uh, x86 uh, boards. So for all these boards, uh, we manufacture enclosures as well, which uh, suits uh, for industrial scenarios and, and to withstand harsh environmental conditions. So if you want to learn more about Seed Studio, you can visit seed.cc or uh, you can uh, go to seedstudio.com to explore uh, all the products uh, that we uh, offer. So uh, moving on uh, to the topic today. So uh, our main topic is about no code AI vision at the edge, right? So what is this no, no code? So uh, recently, a lot of uh, uh, companies are moving to no code uh, platforms where, uh, where you don't need to uh, write a single line of code to develop applications. So you can simply use a graphical user interface to, uh, to create and build applications just like that. So uh, it's very easy to use for everyone. It's very easy to get started with these no code uh, platforms. And it's, it's easy for uh, businesses as well uh, to get started, uh, like to push uh, uh, solutions because they don't need to uh, rely on uh, engineering, uh, like a lot of engineering resources to, uh, to build these solutions. And it's also cost effective because you don't need to rely on many uh, so resources. And if you want to customize uh, these no code solutions, so for example, like uh, this, this Wix is one uh, example for a no code solution, like for uh, building a website. So you don't need to have uh, like really deep understanding about the web technologies. You can directly use a solution like Wix to uh, build a web websites. So uh, by looking at this uh, diagram, we can see that there are a lot of companies now uh, moving on to no code platforms. So we, we can see that it's kind of becoming a future of uh, software development. So when uh, when we talk about AI, so it's uh, some people think that it's very hard to get into AI. So they think that you need to learn a lot of uh, you need to have a lot of knowledge uh, 
uh, to uh, even step foot into uh, learning about AI. But if you build uh, solutions like no code solutions uh, for AI, uh, it can really break the barrier into uh, getting into AI. So for example, this is uh, the tool that uh, we are going to, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, in this uh, talk. So, so as you can see, this is the Node-RED Flow Editor. And uh, so I have just uh, dragged a couple of uh, Node-RED blocks and these are the drops, drops, uh, blocks we have developed. And using these blocks, we can directly get a video stream and then uh, perform uh, object detection on the video stream. Uh, just like that by dragging on these blocks. So as we can see, it's very easy to build these kind of uh, no-code AI solutions and uh, and you don't need to have much effort into making uh, these kind of solutions. So uh, talking about AI at the edge, because our talk, uh, now we talked about no-code AI and I will talk a little bit about AI at the edge also. So uh, when we talk about traditional computing, uh, normally, IoT devices, uh, they need to process uh, the information uh, on a data center. So they are connected uh, between a network. So, But in edge computing, there's an edge device behind the network where all the data processing happens uh, locally. So because of this, because of uh, this AI running at the edge, you can have a better data security and privacy uh, because you're not sending this data uh, uh, to the cloud for processing purposes. And also, uh, you can uh, have low latency with real-time analytics when performing AI at the edge. Also, you can uh, reduce the internet bandwidth because uh, you're not uh, sending data back and forth, as I mentioned. And also, uh, when we use uh, cloud computing for uh, like uh, something like uh, to process AI, so uh, it, it comes with a big cost. So you need to pay for like uh, on a subscription basis or like a very uh, huge amount of money to uh, have these services. But if you run uh, AI at the edge, so you can reduce these cloud costs as well. And also uh, uh, this uh, when running uh, everything at the edge means you can uh, guarantee a 24 seven reliable operation. So just in case if something wrong happens uh, at the edge you can quickly uh, get into the, uh, get into that uh, problem and solve it right there rather than relying on uh, the data uh, providers uh, the the cloud providers to uh, uh, solve the prob uh, problem for you so uh, because of uh, uh, these reasons uh, uh, it's it's very effective to run ai at the edge so uh, when looking at the evolution of uh, edge AI devices by form factor, so this is actually, uh, so NVIDIA is a very uh, famous company uh, which focuses on uh, uh, manufacturing hardware uh, suitable to run AI, like uh, perform uh, AI algorithms and stuff. So uh, this is the NVIDIA RTX 4000 platform which got released recently. And uh, so after this platform, the, in, uh, NVIDIA has this NVIDIA Jetson platform which is mainly uh, made for performing AI at the edge. So it's a single board computer platform, which consists of different uh, modules uh, to compute uh, AI uh, processing. And uh, even uh, you can go uh, even smaller, like the microcontroller unit platforms, like the bioterminal, and also even fur further smaller, such as the Grow Vision AI module. So uh, when we uh, want to perform uh, uh, like AI, uh, uh, kind of like an AI vision task, uh, you cannot run the same AI model uh, which you run on this on this small device because uh, it will not pro uh, process, uh, uh, it, the performance will be less and it will have less accuracy. But with the advancement of AI uh, algorithms and software engineering technologies, uh, these days, uh, uh, these small uh, form factor devices have uh, optimized models, uh, optimized AI models to run on these devices. So however, uh, in, in this talk, I will mainly focus on the NVIDIA Jetson platform, uh, this uh, platform. Uh, uh, so that is where we will run uh, this uh, no-code no AGI vision tool. So this is the main uh, software architecture that we will, uh, that is used. Uh, so mainly uh, the NVIDIA Jetson uh, Linux board support uh, will be uh, at the base uh, with all these components. And on top of it, uh, Docker is installed. So uh, 
inside Docker, there, there will be three containers running. So that is the Node-RED uh, Docker container uh, and a, another Docker container to grab the input video stream and uh, uh, another Docker container to uh, uh, perform the object detection itself. So why do we run Docker here? So uh, actually, uh, it's, it's easy to uh, run all these components as Docker containers because uh, the uh, inside a single host operating system, once you install Docker, uh, if each and every application can be run as a uh, isolated con container. So they are isolated and they are very lightweight to use. So compared with uh, virtual machines that we all know, so in a virtual machine, if you want to run uh, separate applications like this, uh, you need to have uh, separate guest operating systems and they will uh, consume a lot of resources. So by running all these uh, uh, applications as Docker containers, you can um, uh, you can guarantee that you can have a better performance. And also it's very easy to uh, migrate this uh, application to another de device. So for ex example, once this uh, uh, solution is done on the Jetson uh, uh, device, so you can easily transfer to another Jetson device uh, by uh, tr just transferring the Docker containers itself to that device. So uh, when we, so this is the Docker Hub. So Docker Hub is the place where you find all the Docker containers, uh, uh, pub, uh, all the public Docker containers. So uh, when we look at uh, the Node-RED Docker container, we can see that there are more than 100 million uh, pulls for the Node-RED Docker container. So from this, we can see that Node-RED is a very famous uh, Docker container and a lot of developers are moving on to using Node-RED on the Docker. Because um, as I mentioned before uh, here, because of, the, of these reasons, people tend to use uh, Node-RED as uh, Docker when uh, building solutions. So uh, this is the main uh, hardware setup uh, that is used uh, for this uh, specific tool that we are running. So uh, this is the Seed Studio Recomputer Jetson. Uh, this is Je uh, NVIDIA Jetson powered device. And it's powered and it's also connected to the ethernet and Wi-Fi to provide the internet connectivity. Also, uh, uh, you, uh, you can connect a USB webcam to this uh, device or else uh, you can uh, have the video stream uh, sent to this device via uh, the internet. So uh, there's a, a protocol called RTSP protocol, RTSP protocol. So using that protocol, you can you can send the IP camera video stream to this uh, Jetson device so that we can uh, later on perform the uh, object detection itself. So if you want to learn more about uh, the Jetson devices, the uh, Jetson uh, powered devices that are offered by Seed Studio, you can visit this uh, URL and learn more about uh, all the uh, NVIDIA Jetson powered devices offered by us. So I also want to mention that uh, we are an official partner of the NVIDIA Jetson ecosystem for Edge AI. So, uh, so this is, uh, so now I will uh, go through the tool, actual tool that uh, I just uh, mentioned. So uh, this, so this is a tool that we developed. So this is the source code uh, for the tool. So this is available publicly. If you want to access it, you can visit this uh, GitHub URL, or you can uh, scan this QR code uh, to access it. So uh, once you go into this, uh, you can uh, look through the README, and you can see how uh, it can be installed on the Jetson device. So if you if you also have a, a NVIDIA Jetson uh, Nano device with you, it doesn't have to be uh, actually uh, this particular uh, device from CH Studio. It can be either uh, uh, a device from NVIDIA itself, the NVIDIA uh, Jetson Nano Developer Kit, even you can use that uh, to uh, install this tool. So uh, so if you go through the readme, you can clearly see how uh, this tool can be installed. So you uh, just uh, two lines. Uh, so you just need to uh, git, uh, clone this uh, GitHub repo and then run this script. So we have uh, we have this special script uh, so that uh, the installation process uh, is made easier. So you can simply, uh, after running this, uh, it will take care of installing all the dependencies and everything that is needed uh, for this uh, tool to run. So uh, as you can see, it's just uh, two lines uh, for installation. And after that, so before that, I, I also want to mention this. 
So this is actually the Docker, Docker Compose file. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, here, the three Docker containers, uh, this node red and these three Docker containers are defined in this Docker Compose file. So, so this is the uh, node red Docker uh, container itself. And this is uh, the input video stream. And this is the, uh, uh, the Docker container uh, responsible to uh, do the object detection. So this file, uh, this Docker Compose file, will take care of uh, downloading all these Docker containers and setting up the Docker environment. So once uh, you uh, run this script, so actually I have uh, this, uh, I have this device now all uh, uh, up and running. So I have already SSH into this device. And uh, if we check Docker PS, we can see that the three uh, Docker containers are running. This is the node red uh, container, the uh, video stream, and the detection container. So if we uh, open uh, the web browser, and then uh, if you look at this IP address, so if I type, uh, so we are going to open the node red uh, flow editor. So 195, and if I go to the port uh, 1880, so, uh, so now we have the node red uh, flow editor uh, running. And as you can see, there are three uh, blocks here. So these are the three blocks uh, that are defined by this, uh, by the, by this, by this uh, GitHub repo after, after initializing all everything and uh, installing everything. It will uh, show you this, uh, sorry, it will uh, okay. show you this one. And then, uh, so this is the tool itself, right? So uh, this is the tool itself. So once this tool, uh, so this tool is ready to go tool. Uh, so you simply need to uh, uh, drag this block. Uh, so this is the input video block. And uh, this is the video wave block. And if you double click on this input video block, we can see that uh, under the device type, there are two options. So uh, the first option is local camera, which means uh, the webcam that I mentioned before. You can simply connect a webcam to a uh, USB webcam to the Jetson device, and then uh, use that for the, uh, to grab the input video stream. Or else uh, you can use this RTSP, uh, that is uh, if you want to uh, grab the video stream uh, via an IP camera through the RTSP protocol. So you simply need to uh, enter the RTSP URL on this uh, uh, box and click done. I will just go through uh, deploying these blocks. And this is the video view. So this is the raw video output uh, coming in from this video stream. And then uh, this is the detection uh, block. So that this block is uh, responsible to do the object detection itself. And I will drag and drop another block over here. Uh, that is uh, to uh, video view block. And then uh, I will just connect these blocks uh, together. So, so we can see that. Uh, so we can see that this video input uh, block and this object detection block are running as Docker containers, as I mentioned before. So, uh, so after you uh, deploy this, and uh, when you click deploy, so I will uh, show you a video how it looks like after you deploy it. So after after uh, finishing uh, this, and you can see that uh, this is the input video stream uh, from uh, the webcam or the IP camera, right? So uh, after obtaining the uh, video stream, this object detection uh, uh, block will uh, uh, handle all the detection work. So uh, uh, so I will play this video. And now we can see uh, uh, for, uh, all these elephants uh, being detected in this video uh, with uh, confidence score. So these are the confidence score. So it's confident that it's 88%. Uh, it's confident that it's an elephant. So uh, this is the uh, solution. And as you can see, it's very easy to deploy this. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, and also, uh, I want to mention that uh, if you uh, go to uh, this uh, URL, uh, this particular URL, and we have actually, uh, we have this program where if you want to contribute uh, to this uh, GitHub repo and maybe further uh, add more features uh, to this uh, tool itself, 
uh, you can visit uh, over here and submit your PRs. And if we approve uh, your PRs, uh, we will uh, uh, gift you with store coupons and samples. So you can uh, keep in mind about this. So, so also uh, for this, for that demo that I just mentioned, for this demo, uh, under the hood, uh, we run uh, the Ultralytics YOLO v5 object detection algorithm. So that is uh, responsible uh, to perform uh, the real-time object detection on the uh, video stream. Uh, so that is YOLO v5. Uh, and also uh, out of the box, uh, the AI model, which is uh, is trained on a Coco data set. So if you, if you go to this uh, particular URL, uh, you can learn more about this data set. So this data set is uh, able to identify more than 80 different classes. So this elephant is one of the uh, data, uh, the classes that that particular uh, data set can identify. So, so if you want to uh, train your own AI model, and if you want to deploy your own AI solution uh, with this tool, you can easily uh, change the uh, model AI model to detect anything that you want to you you want this tool to detect. So uh, I will now briefly go through some of the application ideas uh, that uh, we can implement using this tool. So so this is one idea. So uh, so using this tool, we can identify. Uh, wildfires so we can alert systems when uh, wildfires are detected and also this is another example where uh, healthy apples and defective apples can be detected and here's another example where uh, you can uh, uh, i mean you can uh, count the number of uh, items in a retail store uh, shelf like this uh, so uh, that's uh, that's about it about uh, uh, on my talk so if you uh, have um, any more questions about maybe uh, this tool or maybe uh, like seed studio products you can visit uh, these channels this uh, we have an email channel we have discord uh, channels and also we have the forum support uh, so you can uh, uh, scan this qr code as well if you want to enter our discord chat so that's uh, that uh, that's about it uh, uh, about my talk so if you want to experience this uh, no code ai vision edge ai vision tool uh, that I just uh, talked about in this. Uh, uh, in this, so you can uh, experience that uh, if you have the Nvidia Jetson platform. You can easily install on your platform on the Nvidia Jetson platform, and then you can run the tool and experience. And if you have more uh, application ideas, uh, you can uh, you can uh, implement those ideas as well and uh, go for uh, more uh, solutions. So uh, thank you all for listening uh, to my talk. Thank you very much, Lakshankar. That's awesome. Cool. Um, so I think maybe I missed it because I was I was <laughs> doing other things. With it. The the Jetson yeah. platform is uh, it's a small embedded computer. So that's the you, your your models only run on the jet. Is it is that their own right. their own CPU? It's their own ARM CPU. It's a bit like a part. Yeah, yeah. So so actually, it's based on the ARM architecture. Uh, ARM architecture, uh, and uh, the this specific tool is. Uh, uh, optimized to run on the Jetson platform itself. So because th that's why uh, uh, it's it's mainly focusing on the edge uh, AI uh, application, yeah. right? And, and so is, is Jetson, uh, yeah. Jet, yeah. the Jetson is like a, a chip, basically, or it's a platform. So is it available in like multiple different hardware modules? There are there are different vendors of, of Jetson out there, or do you, is it a, a, a un, an appliance you buy directly from NVIDIA? Oh, actually, uh, the NVIDIA themselves provide... Uh, a developer kit uh, called the uh, Nvidia Jetson Nano developer kit. So that is a small right. uh, board like this. Uh, I can show you. So this is oh, the this is like a, this one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this yeah. is the Nvidia Jetson. So it's uh, running now. So this is the Nvidia Jetson uh, Nano developer kit, right? So right. so this is uh, provided by Nvidia. Okay. Uh, cool. And, and then, this, then other this, sort yeah. of it's like a reference yeah. design, and other companies can then build. That, exactly. Uh, silicon so, into like, whatever. So yeah. we we manufacture these uh, uh, these uh, carrier boards, board. right? This is the carrier board, and this is okay. the module itself. Yeah. So this right. module yep. is made by Nvidia. This particular okay. module. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and then the breakout board. Yeah. Right. So the breakout boards are manufactured. Uh, some uh, like manufacturers manufacture the breakout boards so that uh, we can uh, put the Nvidia official uh, system on module on top of yep. the carrier board. 
Yeah. And then, yeah, with whatever sensors. Yeah. Cool. Okay. We've got a question um, from Akash. Um, how do I integrate different AI models into the node? Yeah. So you showed us like the elephants, yeah, sure. but what if I yes. want to detect <laughs> dogs? Okay. Sure. Sure. That's a good question. So uh, if you, uh, I will uh, put back the screen. Yeah. Sure. You want uh, just to show you that. Present. Uh, if you go to this, uh, okay. So actually, that was one of the questions that was asked before uh, in the issues. So if you go to the issues over here on GitHub, mm -hmm. so one of the issue was like, where should the train model be placed? So this question is already asked over here. And if you follow this, okay, these steps, you can uh, implement your own AI model uh, into this solution. Just so follow you build this the model issue. with. Yeah, is that with is that with something? I'm just reading. Trying to read Actually, to this uh, model is first trained uh, on uh, YOLO v5 using YOLO v5. So okay, YOLO yes, v5 yes, you said the YOLO v5. So, it's a, so it takes detection. a YOLO v5 model model into yes, the system. Yes, exactly. Then, yeah. So what we do is we uh, input the trained YOLO v5 model into this uh, this uh, source code, and then we run it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thanks. <laughs> Akash said thank you. Probably. Brilliant. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, I don't know if there's any more. Um, so a quick scan up. That was just, yeah, Akash liked the presentation. Uh, seeing if there's any more. We have to we have to wait for the, the stream to catch up. <laughs> okay. So, so we'll it's just, uh, and then it's all in case YouTube, there's right? anything else. Yeah, yeah. So obviously I I asked for those questions and then it takes about I think I don't know, I think we're about forty five seconds to a minute behind probably on YouTube. So Okay. time that uh, that comes back it doesn't look like we've got any more questions so uh, we shall uh, we shall leave it there okay well thank you very much yeah. uh, enjoy the rest of your your day or what's left of it <laughs> thank you thank <laughs> you very much thanks for cash thank uh, cool okay uh where are we we have got another break um so little little short breaks but uh helps to break up the day and then we've got our final two speakers coming up uh, after the break so we've got uh, klaus He's going to be talking about industrial IoT end-to-end uh, -end package testing. So uh, I think if somebody asked the question earlier um, during Pablo's talk about end-to-end -end testing. So hopefully maybe we've got some answers there. Um, and then our final speaker of the day is Andrew from Battlesnake, um, who's going to be talking about uh, how to write Battlesnake flows uh, in Node-RED or use Node-RED with Battlesnake, which is something I've played with a bit. Um, quite a lot of fun and actually teaches you. It's, it's quite a good way to learn how to do bits of programming. So... Uh, yeah, looking forward to those. Uh, we'll be back in, what are we now? 27, I've just got to do the time code here. So probably about uh, about 15 minutes or so. Thanks. Thanks.
Hello, welcome back. So we're into the uh, the final couple of speakers for the day. Um, wow, it's been a long day. Um, so uh, just been uh, been chatting to Nick about uh, about what we're going to do for dinner. I think he's going to order Chinese, and I was going to order pizza, but now I think it might have to be Chinese after this. So uh, definitely a takeaway kind of evening. Anyway, uh, let's bring our next uh, next speaker on. So we have uh, Klaus Landsdorf. I think I got that right. Um, uh -huh who is CEO and founder at Initiationware, I believe. And uh, we're going to be talking about end-to-end -end testing. So right, that's correct. Cool, we had some questions yeah. earlier on end-to-end -end testing, so hopefully, uh, <laughs> okay, then. We'll hopefully see. you can ask them. Okay, Klaus, over to you. We'll Thank you very much. Um, yeah, welcome to the talk, and I hope it's really interesting for you to uh, talk about testing for Node-RED, um, especially here in the IoT use case, um, because we have more needs in the industrial IoT for testing our software because we want to be you know, re ready to go with our software with each version and we just want to get releases um, for our software if it do what it does before and have maybe some new features or if you found a bug then the fix is inside in the best case we have also a fix for it in our tests and my name is Klaus Landstorff I'm from Germany um, I'm a, a master of science and computer science and um, yeah, I'm doing software development uh, since 2001, means more than 20 years now. I started as a user for Node-RED in 2015. And it was a project from Schneider Electric and they were really interested um, how it goes with Modbus, uh, Modbus to work uh, with Node-RED and if it is possible to use this uh, with the machines because in the industry, industry we have a lot of devices, machines which work with Modbus. Today we have more and more machines with OPC UA and that's why I started also for Modbus and OPC UA to contribute since um, 2016, early six, uh, 2016 means uh, it was now six years um, as a contributor. Uh, it's just in my spare time uh, so I get not paid for it. It's really open source and I invest all my love and time to the project um, what I maintain and I also try to um, now do some things to help people, especially with the libraries um, under the hood. I'm the founder of Ineation, where we started in 2020. And uh, this year we try also in conversation with the community and with Nick, um, hopefully a plus for Node Red. Maybe the name can change, I don't know. Uh, but that's the idea that we are, as a contributor, give more contributions, especially for industrial IoT protocols in the future from now. We started two months before and we tried to give more uh, tutorials, um, examples, especially also documentation for um, these packages, which is really interesting for the industry. But today we want to talk about um, our um, industrial IoT node red um, and the testing about this. It needs testing, as I said, especially uh, if our integration works well. We see here we have a lot of packages, um, what we contributed in the last six years and we want to give more packages in the future like the EEC SCADA um, for telecontrol here sometimes in the Europe uh, area also DNP3 which is also for the energy sector and DF1 is Alan Bradley uh, protocol so we hope that we can really provide more protocols for Node Red um, especially from the idea of the plus for Node Red but it's all about testing today not about packages um, so why testing uh, first, we have our unit tests. And this is, um, for me, it's idea to code. I have an idea what I want to implement, a feature, and first I start really to write the test in the best case. And uh, then I see that uh, my pass, uh, I, my test get passed from this uh, unit test. The next step is mostly to see how my nodes or um, the software really integrates. Uh, does it work? Uh, can we see how um, the Let's see, a connector or client works together with a read or node. Um, so that's the next step for me in testing mostly. And uh, also here why I want to see that it really works together, that the nodes are interacting great and it's integrating great with Node-RED also. But at the end, we want really to see our end-to-end -end tests. It means we really want to ask a server for data, we want to get data back and see that the payload and all the structure of our data is as expected. And that we have no problems in the real communication and, and you know, working of the package. Um, especially from a um, you know, testing perspective here, 
um, if you find an error fast or a bug, then we have um, less costs to fix this also. And also in the industry, if we f have a lot of unit tests, um, also integration tests and E2E tests, we can um, really have a great uh, package at the end for Node Red so that we really have with each release all working again what we had working before and hopefully more. That's why we test our packages. Um, this is a bit different uh, for private packages, maybe not needed um, for our home automation. Maybe it's not a difference if um, our, uh, let's say, uh, side projects working or not, but in the industry, maybe people can get hurt um, or we have some accidents in the, if people are really starting, as we heard from Vargo, more than 100 projects use um, Node-RED in production and mostly with Modbus or OPC UA in it. Um, and then we really want to be sure that we have a great state of our packages that yeah, the package works really good at the end. And also we want to give the opportunity to the community to send pull requests. So if you start to send us uh, your code or you stand, start to code for the project or you write a test for us or some documentation, uh, because documentation could also be a test. And that's also why we could do testing. Um, means really we have maybe for a problem um, really a test and we never get the problem again or we see if it um, raises again. And also in your pull request, we can really see that it's um, all working um, as we expected at the moment. So the runtime for this is the Node-RED Node Test Helper package. Um, what's really to in include in our tests and we can use Mocha or um, Jest for this for testing. And uh, it's really easy because the runtime uh, creates a sandbox uh, which we can start, stop, and load and unload and all these things, what we need to um, you know, start flows of Node-RED or also uh, nodes inside this. And this helps us with some um, you know, starting of the server and all these um, to control our tests, how it interacts with the test helper node or package at the end. And as I said, we have Mocha and Jest here working. Uh, both are integrated in, one is in uh, Modbus integrated and the other one is to see in the IIT OPC UA package uh, from uh, Bianco Royal Space, which you can find on uh, GitHub. And we really have just to say, hey, we want to uh, use the helper here in our test. That's nearly the same, it's really the same for both. And also the test naming and the start of the test is nearly the same at the end. The only difference is later after the load, which is also the same, where we have to put in all nodes what we need. That means also the nodes from Node-RED here, what we do, because we really um, put just the nodes into this array of nodes um, to have just this inside, which is needed for um, running the flow, what we gi give later here um, to the helper load. And then we can do our testing inside after the load was done well. And um, for that, we get a different language then between Mocha and Jest, because here we have more in Mocha that we should have a property with name of this one. And it uh, looks a bit different in Jest where we something expect. Now, you say expect from this as from the length here um, that it has to be 15. You know? Okay, means we have also for our packages some scripts to provide. So when you start uh, developing for our packages and start with testing, then we uh, want that you can start with NPM test or some NPM run of tests like E2E or unit or core tests that you really can start from the packages um, or package scripts. And that looks like this one here for Mocha, where we have something to do with standard to fix some issues what we have in the code where we did some formatting um, not not well at the end, so it gets fixed uh, when we start the test automatically, and then we use also npx to have uh, like also a sandbox for our mocker test um, to start with the uh, uh, right um, insights for this test, and then we have some how to do this in parallel here for um, Modbus at, at in this case to go recursive to all tests. Um, and that we have a special timeout because especially in the end-to-end -end tests, we need more time maybe 
to go through because a server has to be loaded, a connection has to be provided, and all this stuff. A unit or core test is uh, really fast. It could be uh, a different time out here, which is not uh, in this, as I see. <laughs> but uh, maybe we can adjust this in the next time to say, hey, we just expect one second for a core test, let's say two seconds for a unit test, and uh, maximum five seconds for an end to end test. In chest, it's a bit different because in chest we have a configuration file for all of this. We can uh, set some informations in the tests uh, itself, but we do the same here also in IAT OPCUA where we have standard fixes. Uh, before we start uh, just inside this NPX uh, environment, and then we give some uh, regular expression to find out which test this has to be started and to check. Nope, sorry. Those, uh, uh, Next one, yeah. Um, and also, it's interesting for us uh, to have parallel testing because we want we have 400 or so tests for IoT OPC UA and uh, 166 tests for Modbus, and uh, this should be done in parallel. That we are test really fast. That we really can go in a way like um, not waiting long for tests because uh, if people get um, are tired from starting a test again and again have to wait then they maybe don't use it or switch it off whatever so it's really interesting to um, go with parallel testing as well and in mocha we have this um, um, you know, argument here but we can send into our test and in chest we have just the opportunity to say that we have some workers which should be a minus one of your uh, cpu cores what you have and some maximum of currency concurrency tests which are running and then just organizes this um, by itself but it speeds up your tests and that may, means that uh, also your um, workflow daily uh, your daily workflow is um, well, really nice at the end hopefully but that was not enough that's really but if you are a software developer then you may say yeah it's just okay it's <laughs> every time thing what we also do but the great thing in uh, node red for us is especially for our trainees is to give them a visual flow testing. And for that, we provided a new package, which is uh, the Node Red Contrib helper package. Um, hopefully, the name was good enough for it. And especially for the OPC UA package, they, our trainees can, uh, if they program something on the package, can say npm run dev link. That means that your local Node Red gets linked to, to your code, what you have on your um, device or on your PC. And after that, you can start with the debug of uh, grabbing all from OPC UA with Node Red in the ver uh, verbose mode or verbose mode. I don't know at the moment how to say this. Um, the best case, um, yeah. And then you have this package Node Red Contrib Helper here in the version one two three. Actual, um, you can install it uh, from the manage palette in Node Red inside. It's really easy to uh, go with, and it looks like the debug node at the end. So when we have a flow here, which is really a test flow from our E2E -E testing, so this is really a copy of flow from our uh, structure in, in the E2E -E tests, then you can put this really via the import function of Node Red into Node Red, and then you can see really what's going on and what's the output of the test at the end. And that's really a visual flow testing. You can dig in, you can see what's the problem, you can fix the problem uh, really in code as well. And then you can put back with the export function of Node Red this flow to your uh, E2E testing. And then the flow gets really um, tested every time, automated also with the CI um, infrastructure in our development. So as we say, um, it's really imported and you can export it later as a flow. And th this uh, looks like uh, a name like this one. I want to switch over. Hope it's not too tiny for you. Um, so this means we have a module which is really here under E2E test. You can see this also in, on GitHub um, in our IAT OPCUA package that we have flows inside here. And you find the flow what we really saw in the picture um, here inside the flow um, file. And the idea is really that we also can go with a CLI tool or something like this to uh, maintain and to um, you know, refresh the nodes, the testing nodes for maybe a new version of Node-RED. That's the idea here also. And 
at the moment we need this helper extension to clean our flow from position data because when we put in position data to the test helper then it doesn't load the flow we didn't dig too, um, too deep in this uh, topic but um, yeah that's a point what we maybe later have to see how it goes in the in the node red node test helper why we have to clean up this data in node red you will see this uh, visual testing also with a new uh, tab here which is um yeah friendly friendly programmed by the core team of node red uh, it's really from the debug um, um we, we took this uh debug uh, integration of node red and put it into this uh again to the node that the node brings really this test helper um, tab here because we think it's really um a need for testing and visual testing that debug is debug and test is test so it means your uh, test helper node um, outputs will be uh, raised up here in the new tab with this rocket and your debugging is just in the debug um, to see uh, that's really interesting for us especially because we want to see more in our testing than in the debug at the end to check if our flow here is running well or if we have some error uh, maybe as we have it here from the core library what we use in node red to provide you with the with the nodes okay and yeah you have to click on this little icon maybe it's hidden um, because we have not all icons uh, it depends a bit on the size of your screen but when you uh, drag this line uh, to the left then it gets more and more uh, icons or you can click this uh, little triangle here to get uh, the rocket and to click on it if you give it a try okay especially back to the iot um we have an idea what we want to implement we have a plan we want to bring it into production and then release it at the end also production tests at the end also and that means that we have some long-term support thinkings and needs in industrial contribution packages for node red and especially there is a start with the versioning that we have git on it that we have some uh semantic versioning uh, for our packages that uh, people really know was it a fix was it a minor version with new features or was it really a breaking change with a major a major version and um, also for testing units uh, we want really to go every time to have testing units in our tiny pieces of functions then we have the development itself for these new ideas for these new features and we want also to provide with our packages the examples examples could be also e2e flows in our testing but without the need of the helper at the end as an ex in the difference between an example and um, the the normal uh, testing flow is really just that we don't use in the examples the um, node red control helper at the end then we go further with the integration and e2e testings um, automated with the ci also um, because we have the idea of um, doing all in the development branch and then give it to master if it's ready to go and master should check all automatically in github actions if it is ready to go um, for a release um, so we have really a deployment of continuous integration uh, means github actions will build uh, the code what we send out to master and if it's ready to go it will also publish the data means when you uh, send a pull request to us you have no access to um, publish yes but the idea is that every developer has to pass the tests of the master branch and then you get a release if you accept your pull requests and this is really important we think for the industry then as we had it before with the Modbus package, um, it's not working if we have industrial IoT packages and everybody changes things without any new test or to uh, see if all things working um, as we expected. And th this is a little door which we really should go through um, that we have for the quality of node red control packages, the um, continuous integration and continuous deployment via master branches uh, just automate it completely you have to pass the tests you have to provide tests um in the best case also for your new features and changes um and then we want to release it automatically and the best case if you have more time um not just the code then it would be really great to get also some documentation we want also to provide documentation we know how hard it is especially if it's your spare time um 
but we think that it's also possible in the future to provide the community with ebook uh, as ebooks um, about um, our packages uh, for Modbus, OPC UA, Bugnet, hope, hopefully um, more, and also in the future for uh, more, more and more um, protocols for the industrial IoT. That's uh, what I want to show you um, at the end for um, for the questions. I'm really interested about this. Um, for, well, and thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully, we have enough time. We on mute. Uh, yes, yeah, we're we're good for time. So uh, I think so. We still got to, well, we got the ten minutes window for questions. Um, I'm just looking. I think can also show we... some some more uh, really in detail in the test if somebody's interested. Yeah, I was going to say if you want to if you want to keep showing some stuff. I so said we've got we've got we've got kind of mm -hmm. ten minutes um, to go, and I don't yeah. think we have any questions yet because they've mostly been answered. And they were more more generic questions that have come on in the stream. But uh, yeah, let's uh, let's have a little bit more demo then <laughs> <laughs> okay a little bit more demo is it great enough or big enough to see it really well uh, um, code, or? it's a little bit small this one i think yeah in i'm because on a fairly big we, screen here, so because normally we should uh get rid of one of the uh, or maybe yeah. you can tell, show no, this really when we go yeah. here um with the with this flow and you see really it's a really flow with also with a name uh, then i can show you what how we can go uh, with node red really um when we see here in the manage palette we have the node installed here node red contrib uh, helper uh, in the version as i showed um and when you go really to import it then you just have to copy the e 2 um test and you can import it and just deploy it and then it should uh, work at the end and uh, so you, okay. so your tests are imported as a flow basically yeah yeah and if you have some trouble here then uh, maybe we have especially in the test really this kind of error because we want to see if this error breaks the test or really have an um, effect for the test at the end also so uh, if somebody says, oh, the test is not uh, working, <laughs> that's really as what we expect. Huh? Because we not just check that all works, we also check in our E2E tests if the software really also reacts in problems as we expected. Huh? And we see here, uh, let's take another one. Um, I believe maybe the, the test flow here before. And it could also be the, the case that we um, need some, uh, especially for the OPC UA package that we just provide with the, it's from the same flow at the end. Uh, so let's see what we have here. And uh, then we have no endpoint in this. And that's why the, the system says, hey, that's not ready to go. Huh? And um, but we have really a visual um, testing here and we have also the connection to these nodes here that the node gets deleted if you delete the um, flow means if you say here delete then we see that also the configuration disappears for the client and uh, because it's a big problem every time for people to say oh i don't know my serial port is blocked now i, I tested it with the mod bus or whatever and they forget about the uh, configuration node because it's a hidden node for many people yes far. yeah i think the latest is it node red three something one of them at some point a change was introduced to highlight it does a pop-up now saying you have unused configuration nodes with a i think node red three introduced a, a link to view them to kind of prompt you to clean up mm -hmm. um, if steve's still on the stream i'm sure i think there's a piece of work steve did but, oh. uh, but yeah the cl cleaning up of config nodes is definitely yeah to check maybe we have someone here uh, to import and also read the read uh, node here is uh, hopefully working uh, let's see Confirm. Uh, maybe there was a change in the newest version i have to check that's not expected that's how the demos go <laughs> <laughs> um but if we have it really working uh, at the end here with the port uh, let's say um five four zero i i, I know why because uh, we changed the tests to have no ports anymore because we go to parallel testing uh, that means that our um, tests have no endpoints um and uh, no opc uh, tcp and then <clears throat> put up uh, let's say local host with the port what we set and um, oh, the two was disappear <laughs> that was a change and also some point what we have in testing that we really have to see 
um, how do we organize our tests um, uh, to have a copy really fast here inside Node Red, but get no problem and overlapping if we maybe forgot to delete it here and then start our testing. That's sometimes a problem that you get an error here from the test, but it's working at the end. It's just failing because you have something working with the same port and endpoints <laughs> in, in Node Red, maybe. And that's also why we decided to say, okay, we have no uh, default port, you have just to set it. And yep. the port get really set inside the test uh, when you see our um, read yeah, test. So you pass it in as a. Yeah, then we pass it here into into it. Uh, okay, to say yeah. so, each test uh, gets its config. own uh, port um, configuration, its own endpoint, so that we have no overlapping can really go fast and parallel testing. And we see here really a working um, test now, and we can inject and and this really just appears here in the test. Um, uh, flow of we have just errors or problems or whatever we had before um normally when we do it here you see we have nothing in the debug we just get it yeah. all in the test um yeah. tab for of node red yeah it really that's helps nice. so you people, you know? keep that, that separation between your yeah and if your test fails you can then actually see the debug where you expect it to be in your yeah. in your mm -hmm. flow or whatever Maybe. cool um okay i'm just checking oh. out there's one question i don't know if you're Pablo, if this was this question related to uh, for, for Klaus, mm -hmm. it up um, workflow to export from from a flow. It's not clear to me the workflow from flow exports to CI. Um, they really have to bring it into the code. Um, so when we have, and if I understood it right, so you can go here with the export and you have created the flow. When you say, "Hey, I've every time with your package uh, a problem." then you can go with this package now to create your flow where you have the problem with because we get a lot of flow sent um, if people um, creating issues. And now people can send us flows with this test helper um, in it. And we can use this test from people now to um, if they send ah, us okay, the current sorry. flow to integrate it in our testing. And we can say, OK, that was a problem in our package. And now we can really integrate it from your visual creation into our testings and it never will happen again if you fix this problem right. then no. okay yeah so yeah it's, it's a contribution of flows cool uh -huh. okay well i think uh, i don't think there's anything else yep pablo's said that's answered his questions so uh, that's that's good but if there are more okay, questions well... i'm really open to talk about <laughs> yes <laughs> cool Somebody and you've got yep, your more. links there conversation where so uh, thanks very much class speak to you soon yeah thank you Okay, we're nearly there. Final speaker of the day. Um, so this, um, yeah, we're going to bring on bring on Andrew, um, who is community manager at Battlesnake. Um, hey Sam. Most people. Hey Andrew, how are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> I guess quite a lot of people aren't don't don't know what Battlesnake is. I I do um, because yeah, it's the kind of silly stuff I like doing. But uh, I got playing playing with it. But uh, so yeah, hopefully this will be a, a fun one to to end up the day. Um, I say it's probably I think it's really interesting for. For the Node Red users, perhaps as well, and and the mission of Battlesnake, I'm sure you probably go into this a bit, but the kind of idea of of teaching people to code because there's a lot of people coming into Node Red who certainly don't come from a coding background and a structuring background. So you know, hopefully this will uh, this will give them some uh, some food for thought on on how just to to play and learn because uh, some of us some of us learn better by playing. But, Absolutely. Uh, anyway, so I'll bring your slides up. There we go, and uh, over to you. All right, fantastic. So um, thank you so much, everybody, for sticking around until the bitter end. Um, I'm super excited to be here today um, to kind of close things off here at Node Red Con, uh, talking about uh, Node Red, uh, Battlesnake, and how you can use these two spectacular technologies um, to, to kind of level up your flow and become a better programmer. Uh, so to kick things off, I uh, just want to give a little TLDR on, uh, on what this whole talk is going to be about for anybody who's like, ah, it's the very end of the day. Um, so as I'm sure you all know, um, it's often pretty difficult for developers to find practical ways to explore new tech. Um, side projects are often used and can help, um, but they're really often uh, kind of boring, intimidating, and lonely to work on. But don't worry, there is a better way, and that's what we're going to be talking about in our talk today. Uh, so uh, a couple things we're going to be covering. Uh, learning pathways for developers, so traditional learning pathways, uh, challenges uh, to those existing pathways, 
um, a different approach to learning, uh, why Battlesnake and Node Red kind of fit together as this amazing, uh, this amazing pairing. Um, and then we're actually going to do a practical demo. If everything goes okay, um, everything goes well, we're gonna we're gonna get a practical demo in here as well. Uh, so first things first, uh, start things off. Uh, uh, Sam introduced me a little bit, um, but a little bit more. My name is Andrew McLean. Uh, I'm the community manager for Battlesnake Inc. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about in the next slide about what Battlesnake is, but then we'll spend some time a bit later. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder of High Tech U, uh, a university-based boot camp uh, for teenagers to learn uh, software development skills. Um, I'm also a middle school science and technology educator, and I, I consider myself a novice web developer. Um, I'm new to the to the learning journey. Uh, I mean, I've been learning for a decade or more, but uh, but always consider myself a novice in learning new things. And so exactly what Sam said, not everybody's coming into this as a, as a trained developer. And, and I certainly fall into that, uh, into that camp. Uh, and if you're interested in uh, connecting with me, uh, there's my details there. You can also find me on LinkedIn. So uh, what is Battlesync? Um, Cause I know uh, if I don't tell you now, you're gonna wait till the end and be like, what is this Battlesync thing? Um, so Battlesync is a multiplayer programming game uh, where your code is the controller. Uh, if you recognize this thing on the right hand side, um, this is both Battlesnake and something you may have seen in another life before, especially if you used to play the old snake game on uh, Nokia phones. Uh, Battlesnake is, is taking that concept and turning it into uh, a programming game. So each Battlesnake is controlled by a live web server. Uh, Battlesnakes move independently. They try to find food, avoid hazards, and stay alive as long as possible to be the final Battlesnake standing. And so uh, we're going to look at exactly what that means for uh, for everybody in uh, in terms of learning in, in just a couple of minutes. But I want to get started um, in terms of our actual our talk on this learning pathway bit with uh, a, a bit of a conversation and a question to everybody around how developers are often learning about new technologies. And so um, you can throw these things in the chat if you want to. I think I can see the chat. I can see the chat um, if you've got some ideas. Um, but I know there's a little bit of a lag between this, so I'll, I'll pause for just a second um, and uh, and throw out to people, what uh, are some ways that developers are often learning new tech? All right, so um, we got some answers that, that may start coming in, um, but in terms of ways that developers are often learning new tech, there's uh, sort of three big ways. Um, side projects are a big way, um, online courses, as well as coding challenges. Um, now, the downside is um, these three ways that are often being used in learning new technologies, uh, side projects are often intimidating, online courses can be lonely, and uh, code challenges are often really, really limited in scope. And I think all of those sort of intimidating, lonely, limited in scope ties into all of these uh, ties into all of these different uh, uh, these different sort of traditional learning pathways. Um, but don't worry, there is another way. Um, so built by developers for developers, uh, Battlesnake aims to uh, break this cycle of developer despair, uh, creating an innovative learning sandbox for experienced devs. So this stuff that I'm talking about with Battlesnake ties in so closely with Node Red that you can kind of use the, the two um, technologies really interchangeably. Um, but when I talk about the cycle of developer despair, what do I mean? So you want to learn a new uh, alert, a new technology. Uh, so you start a side project. Um, the side project's difficult to start. It's only to work on, or it's focusing not quite on the way that you want to uh, want to get there, and most end up going nowhere. And then you kind of repeat that cycle. So, so Battlesnake kind of sets to to um, break that cycle, and and you can see like Battlesnake fits in this really interesting space in terms of sort of uh, developer learning experience. In that you've got a lot of things. So um, side projects and open source projects and to do MVC are often really introductory, um, and uh, while they're really open-ended they're kind of they're fairly basic um now when you go into more uh you can go into more prescriptive learning that you have a little bit more direction if you're learning so you've got things like online courses and interview prep and coding puzzles um and then if you want to get more technical experience so if you're a professional developer you already know a lot of these things um that's where you move into this idea of sort of competitions and coding games and conferences and and i see books and blogs um but again those are very prescriptive so so battlesnake kind of fits in this really unique spot and I think Node Red does that. It's very self-directed, uh, but also allows for you to to cover a level of technical expertise that is far beyond the basics. 
All right. So, uh, so how could developers be learning new tech and, and kind of how do, do Node Red and Battlesnake fit into this? So Battlesnake, we kind of showed that it fits in that space, but there's some specific features of uh, both Node Red and Battlesnake that make it kind of a really great stack for learning uh, new technology. So both Battlesnake for learning Node Red and Node Red for learning Battlesnake. Um, so first thing, uh, collaborative. So uh, both Battlestick and Node Red are collaborative and supported by a global community of developers. Um, both Battlesnake and Node Red are open ended. They can be as simple or complex as you want them to be, um, as well as some um, sort of all being very open source. So, Battlesnake, uh, a lot of the snakes and a lot of the things we'll be looking at today uh, are very open ended as well, um, but, uh, but open ended and open source. Uh, and definitely that's a big piece here. Um, and accessible. So, engaging, um, accessible to developers of all skill levels, whether you're an experienced developer or, uh, or you are a new developer that's just getting into this world and wanting to explore new technologies. So um, how do we know that this is a thing that works, this sort of world of, uh, of collaborative, open-ended and accessible um, learning sandboxes and tools and platforms? Uh, well, we have statements like this. Uh, so this was actually from one of our, uh, our, um, our super users on the Battlesnake platform. So uh, they use Code of Battlesnake as the way to uh, to learn new algorithms and techniques and technologies, uh, which is great. And then we've also over the years seen a huge number of devs that are sort of indicating that they're learning about new um, platforms, languages, and tools through our platform. Um, so obviously some platforms that are there um, and then some really cool strategies and techniques that apply both in the world of Battlesnake and then more broadly in the technology space as well. All right. So uh, we're going to get into a demo in just a minute uh, that will we'll be kind of showcasing this amazing uh, way that um, amazing way that Node Red and Battlesnake uh, can work together. Uh, but to get started, uh, I actually want to give you a run through of how Battlesnake actually works. Um, so as I said before, it's a multiplayer programming game. This is actually how the, the system works. Um, so uh, the Battlesnake board the, uh, is uh, requesting uh, from your web server that you're creating. So as a developer, you are building out a Battlesnake, which is a web server, um, a really simple one. And our game engine is uh, sending uh, is sending requests to your server. So our game engine uh, is sending uh, get and post requests. And what we're doing is at the end of the day, um, sending some information about the game board and the state that it's in. And then your server, your battle snakes are responding um, in up to 500 milliseconds with uh, one of four directions to move, either left, right, up, or down. Now the stack that you use, the technology, the um, everything that sort of um, wasn't discussed here uh, is because it's very open-ended. You can do uh, use whatever technology stacks, whatever languages you want, language agnostic, plat um, platform agnostic. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, as long as you can create a web server with the technology and you can uh, return a response of up, down, left, or right, then you can play the game. All right, um, so here's a really brief overview. This is the Battlesnake API, um, and it's kind of a reverse API because again, you're building the you're building the web server that Battlesnake Game Engine is talking to. But here's the important things you need to know. Uh, we've got um, uh, these four endpoints, uh, so that is going to be more clear as we get into the demo in just a minute. Um, and uh, here is what you'll be getting if you uh, are. Uh, looking at a get response to that um, just base URL, um, you're going to receive an empty request from the game engine and you're going to respond with uh, this awesome JSON that's here. Um, and this JSON, uh, the color, will give you the color, the head and tail, we have customized, customized head and tails. Um, and then it's going to make this, uh, this JSON is going to make your battle snake look like this. Um, and then the other really important one um, is our, is the post uh, request. And so uh, when you send a po when a post request comes through, you're going to receive um, a game ID, how large the board is, the turn number, Battlesnake locations, all the rest of that stuff. And then, like I said before, you're just going to be responding with either up, down, left, or right based on the information that you receive. All right, so let's jump into a live coding tutorial. Uh, we got about 10 minutes left, which is perfect. Um, and uh, what we're going to be using today is uh, is a repository that I've open sourced that I've made available for everybody. Uh, so this is a wrapper for deploying a Node-RED-based Battlesnake into a platform called Railway. Uh, Railway is uh, is a great alternative to Heroku now that Heroku is, is phasing out their free tiers. Um, and so if you are interested in checking this out, the link to the 
repository is at the bottom there. Um, and you can also follow along, but uh, we're actually going to um, go and show you what that looks like in a second. But before we do that, I uh, want to send out some huge acknowledgements to some of the amazing open source developers that uh, uh, that uh, contributed to the code that has ultimately become this new railway quick start. Um, so the top two there uh, have contributed some of the open source logic that's used in the more advanced battle snake. And then um, both IBM, um, Atsushi and Sam, the one and only Sam uh, contributed to the, uh, the sort of base of this, which was a node red Heroku wrapper that I've just kind of converted into uh, a railway wrapper to make it nice and easy to start. Uh, so, Let's uh, let's jump over into our uh, our repo. So I'm going to get that open right now. Um, and so if you come over here, uh, we've got a deploy to railway button set up there and ready to go. And this is going to be the experience you're going through. Uh, so you're going to get your uh, GitHub. We're going to actually do all of this in real time and hope that it goes fast enough for us. And uh, thanks to Sam, all of these environment variables are already set up. So we're going to click deploy. Um, and now it becomes a little bit of a waiting game. This will take a couple of minutes to get started. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up what you'll get once you have successfully deployed your project into uh, into onto railway. And what's great about railway is uh, this is putting your server. Obviously, a lot of us do our development on node red and localhost. This is putting it up in a web server with a password and a login. Um, so you're ready to go without having to use any extra um, nodes like ngrok or anything like that. So you can see that our uh, our new Battlesnake node red wrapper is uh, is building right now, but I have already got one built and, uh, and up and running. And uh, this is what you would see if you went to that uh, the the domain that is produced the URL that's produced by this node red server once you go um, and if you look at this you might say that looks very similar to what we saw over on our initial get request and that's because it absolutely is so let's jump into our node red uh, editor and see what's going on and uh, oh amazing we have successfully built so I'm actually going to use this one which is throwing an error because there's a little bug with this where you need to reset it a couple of times just to, just to populate the database initially. But once I've done that, I'm going to leave here. I'm going to leave here. I'm going to leave here. And we're going to go to this. Uh, there we go again. And so exactly what we had before. So let's head over to the editor. And we're just going to go, we've set this up already. Um, so we're going to head over to the editor. And you'll notice here, we have got a uh, username and password set up. And just as you might imagine, uh, we were looking for a great username, very secure battle. And our password is snake. And we're going to log in here to node red. Amazing. So you'll notice this if you've set up a new node red instance, this is sort of the tutorial that you get. Um, but what we have actually put into this, uh, this initial, uh, this initial flow that has been created in here is is taking some amazing work that Sam had already done, adding a few more documents. So you kind of know what's going on in a little bit more of a meaningful way. So um, if we go back to what we were seeing over here in the uh, in that main uh, uh, domain there. So this is telling the Battlesnake uh, game engine what your Battlesnake looks like. So we're going to head over and actually create a new Battlesnake really quickly. And we're going to head into uh, build from scratch. We're going to create a name. I'm going to call this our node red Battlesnake. And we are going to toss in that same URL that is uh, that is giving us this JSON and toss it right into the URL. We'll set everything except the one thing we'll want to do is add a node red tag in there. Awesome. Save that. And uh, here we go. So uh, we've got our node red Battlesnake set up there. Uh, you'll see the latency is there. Our node red Battlesnake is in and working, but maybe uh, I want my Battlesnake to be a more intimidating color and maybe a more intimidating head or tail. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back over into our empty get request, which is where all of our Battlesnake customizations are stored. And just using the basic HTTP in, HTTP out, and our, our template nodes here, we're going to change our head to lantern fish. We're going to leave our tail as is, but I want to make him intimidating. So I'm going to set the color as jet black 
And we're going to save that. We're going to do a deploy. And then we're going to head back over to here. We should see it update. But more importantly, if we go back over to the platform, we are going to see it refresh here and update. And there we go. Now we've got our lantern fish head. We've got a jet black. And then we've got our default tail. So we've updated our metadata there. Now, you've got a Battlesnake in here. We talked about those other, the the uh, the move endpoint. So uh, we want our game engine to talk to our move endpoint. Let's see what that looks like. So we're going to head over here to our create game. We're going to create a custom game. And we're going to find uh, our node red Battlesnake, add it onto our map. Awesome. Uh, and we are going to, uh, we're going to see what happens. So I'm going to press play, start our first game. And you can see that I'm getting a uh, I'm getting a response here, bad HTTP status code. And that's because you may have noticed I had a few things disabled over here in our flow. Uh, or some of our flows, uh, uh, the, the nodes are actually disabled. So um, obviously our Git is telling our, uh, our Battlesnake game engine what our Battlesnake looks like um, and allows for us to use some really default nodes that are in there. Um, our start and end, um, those are really just there for allocating and deallocating resources, which isn't super important for us when you're just getting started with Battlesnake, but some useful things to have in there. Um, but what we're going to do is start to look at these move requests. So uh, first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, enable these requests here. And let's just go enable these selected nodes. And I'm going to deploy that. And now if I head back over and create a rematch, my error should be gone because now there is something actually going on at that move endpoint. There we go. So we're still going up, but we're not getting the same error. Now we're getting a response was not received. So that makes sense um, because we weren't actually sending any information in this node, but we were actually in our debug collecting some information about the game. So I'm going to rerun this one one more time just to show you what this looks like. And I've cleared those uh, the, the debugging. Awesome. So we had that error, but we were still getting our information about the game and what was going on to make our decisions. So now we need to send a move and we're going to get started with sending a really basic move into here. And I'm going to disable these again. Awesome. And I'm going to enable the next step, which is setting a move. And we're going to enable those. Perfect. And we're going to deploy that and clear that. Now, we don't have any uh, any debugs uh, set up here. We, our message payload isn't going anywhere. So we shouldn't have anything that shows up in debug. Uh, but we should see our snake be able to move now because we've added this, uh, this change node in here. And we've set our payload move to right. So if everything goes well, our snake should go right this time when we create a rematch. Let's see what happens. So if everything goes right, our snake should go right, no errors, and our battle snake has gone right just with that single change node in there. All right. So we're going to go back and uh, we're going to go into our node right again. We're going to set our move to, uh, let's set our move to left and done, deploy and head back over, create a rematch, and uh, let's play. It should go left this time. There we go. And we'll do one more. Let's change it to down and deploy. Awesome. Down and deploy. Done. Deploy. So now our next game should have him going down and deploying. Amazing. Now, the last thing that we need to do in here, especially when you're just getting started, is you want to have that logging so you can see what's going on. So if I disable uh, these nodes really quickly, and enable these uh, these final nodes, putting it together with our, our, our payload, our debugging. Let's enable and enable selected nodes. And let's deploy this. And now, if we go in here, we should be playing a new game. And amazing, we're going right, which is what we want to do. And you'll see some uh, messages. So you can see the decision, the game data, and then the decision that's coming from there. Now there's one final node in here that I'll leave for you to explore once you go in here and use the Node Red uh, Railway um, starter. And that's some more advanced Battlesnake logic. And you can see we've got a few more nodes in there, but we're about a couple seconds from being away. So I'm going to jump up here really quickly um, and just say, uh, so let's jump back over to here. Um, so 
uh, if you are um, looking uh, to, uh, to to get involved in Battlesnake to check it out, um, we've set up a code, Node Redcon, um, on the Battlesnake platform. So if you use Node Redcon, there'll be a surprise head and tail combo that's coming to you. Um, and if you're interested in learning more uh, about Battlesnake, uh, you can check out uh, play.battlesnake.com. Um, here's all of our social stuff. Uh, and now I'll turn it over for questions. So uh, thanks, everybody. And uh, hopefully uh, you'll be exploring Node Red with Battlesnake and Battlesnake with Node Red soon. Cool. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> awesome. Um, sorry, I was just uh, sneaking my uh, I've been just been loading up my uh, my Battlesnake flow because I haven't loaded it for a while. And, I love uh, it. Yeah, it's uh, I, I really yeah, I, I didn't keep up as much this year so i need to go and uh, i need to make some changes i don't think it runs doesn't handle the new maze mode and stuff but um i'm just wondering yeah we haven't got any any questions yet maybe i'll let's just bring uh i'll just bring mine onto the onto the stream so this is the last version of um as it's called nodaconda red um so you can see it can get quite addictive um <laughs> so this is this is the incoming move here and then uh, all of this and there's quite a lot of function nodes in here so I'm doing quite a lot in JavaScript. Um, then I've got some some stuff doing the the obvious stuff, you know, a function to avoid the walls, avoid yourself, avoid the snakes, avoid head to heads. Um, yeah, it's uh, and and these are my my versioning was um, each each one in a new tab. So I could have slowly built it up, and I've got <laughs> got tabs like go to food and you know avoid corner, escape, yeah, escape deep hole. And this one was called aggression. I can't remember what I changed that one to make it more aggressive. But uh, I love that. Yeah. And and you know I gotta say like I've I've definitely found that uh, Node Red uh, has uh, I think opened a door. So I've I've worked for Battlesnake, been in the Battlesnake world for years now, and it wasn't until discovering Node Red that I've been able to really build out a functional Battlesnake in a really quick period of time. So as a tool to explore Node Red, it was super practical for me. And then it just they 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 work so well together. Yeah, it's 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 that rapid sort of change something in a web browser, hit deploy, because you know even especially when you're running on on something like like Railway or Heroku or some cloud, that kind of change build deploy cycle with with traditional code is is a bit more kind of is, is a lot slower and you don't have that, that instant gratification whereas here you like you say in in you know in, well, i think eight minutes you 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 deployed about four different versions or something of your snake so um so that yeah. was yeah that was really quite cool uh, let's bring that back so we've got one question um from pablo are, are there team competitions good question yeah, there are, absolutely are, so um yeah so there's a couple of things so um so obviously developers may be going in here to explore new technology so there's like just running the games like i run them there's also challenges that you can run that are really basic challenges to kind of work your way through some set game modes of like don't run into the walls don't hit other snakes follow food um and then we have um our leagues which are competitive leagues that happen um uh sort of three or four times a year and then we also have this new feature that is uh, a tournaments feature so you can um, access a beta feature here and run your own tournament within your company so we have a lot of companies that are saying we're doing a hack day we're really interested in uh, in using something new to engage our developers and learning this new tool and so we actually will grant access to developers to access that new beta feature okay a, pri a private tournament cool i was just thinking yes yeah, so obviously yeah there's there's the sort of yeah there's the comp you compete in the in the um, in the leagues or in the tournaments for different um, different different levels. I, I did reasonably well in the 2021 ones. I think I got into the the playoffs and things with with a no, with a low, with a no node red, so a low code snake. It was the first one, but um, yeah. What, what I'm just thinking the interesting ones. There's nobody's done anything where you've got sort of snakes cooperating yet, but there's. So, that could so there, be interesting. <laughs> there was a there was a classic mode that used to exist and doesn't anymore, which was where you actually completed. Uh, it was a squads game, and so basically oh, you God. had to code against other teams, but then you were not able to die if you ran into snakes that were on your team. So allows oh. for you to do that collaborative styling there. Yeah, so it's been yeah. done, but we pulled it away, and I, I have a feeling it'll come back very soon. I'm I'm thinking about the idea of having two set what looks like two separate battle snakes, but them sort of communicating 
fighting via a back channel as well to, to gang up or something. That could absolutely. Be, and it's yeah. Ken. And I think the great thing about Battlesnake and, and Node Red as well is there's so many use cases that are there. Somebody years ago uh, created a Battlesnake that was hand controlled. So back when <laughs> we hadn't had the 500 millisecond, um, somebody had built out this hand control that you could go faster than the one millisecond timeout at the time period. People had done a face controlled snake where you respond to I machine vision. One, yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's they, really cool yeah, things. Yeah, no, absolutely, and um, and yeah, it's really cool to hit that railway build for um for well, so it's really it's a node red runtime for for railway, and then you've you've added in the battle snake example flow exactly, in there. But, um, exactly. Take a look at that, and maybe we can um we can do something to to wrap that up into a um, thing. I also know it probably needs updating because it's node red two, which yeah. is still supported, but we we really should get that up to node red three at some point. But, awesome, so. awesome, cool. Well, um, just seeing if we've got any more questions, so we'll give it a, a second. But I think. Probably getting towards the end of the day. I think Nick's here to join us. If we bring Nick, do you want to do you want to join join on <laughs> on mute <laughs> With, without without warning? No, so you right. finally seen what that Battlesnake thing I've been I was going on about last year was with like, every 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 daily stand up. I was like, oh, my snake's been doing this. So what do you think, <laughs> Nick? Is it is it going to be a Nick versus Sam Node Red Battlesnake? I feel like <laughs> Node Red needs to be at the top of that leaderboard for the rest of time. <laughs> yeah no absolutely it, it um my mind is currently racing and I, I need to put those thoughts to one side so i can talk coherently for okay, yes. the last few moments of, of <laughs> today's stream but um no it, okay. it looks really cool and uh, more seriously i, I think there's uh, we've we get lots of questions with node red in more educational settings um people are often asking like often say oh you know it's like scratch and you know scratch is very much more accessible to a yeah. much younger audience. Node Red. I like to think, you know, Scratch is for the, uh, yeah, the, uh, I was, I was going to say primary school, but for the international audience, you know, for Scratch is great for you know, up to like your 11, 12 year olds. Um, then they tend to move on to Python and the like. But Node Red also sits nicely in that, could sit nicely in that space as well. But it's the activities. You've got to have the activities that engage and, you know, it's, it's all well and good having having a really good programming environment, a, a language, whatever it might be, but it's the activities. It's what you do with it. That's what really engages people. I mean, you don't Absolutely. learn Node-RED for the sake of learning Node-RED, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, and I yeah, I just love love the whole concept of Battlesnake. And I think, I say, my, my, my mind is racing for, for what, what we can <laughs> do. As well, cool. yeah. I, and I got to say, I do agree. Like the fact that in eight nodes, basically, you are able in a flow to build a functional thing, I think speaks to that really basic feature of, of this block-based programming, low-code environment. So um, yeah. totally agree. And thank you so much for for kind of letting me close off, the, uh, close off the, the conference today, Sam and Nick. Cool. Thanks very much, Andrew. And thank you very much for joining us. Awesome. Talk. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Cheers. Bye. Oh, we're there. We've made it. There we are. So that's... I think I, I think we're at eleven hours of content today um, across the Japanese and the English tracks. Six, six hours on this stream. I think it's six and six hours twenty we're coming up to, and yeah, yeah, five hours on over in the in the Japan track. So it's all on YouTube. If if you're late joining, don't worry, you've not missed out. Um, it, it's all there to go back and watch, and we'll we will endeavour to uh, split it up into yeah separate videos, so you don't have to scan through the whole thing, but. No, it's been awesome. Um, yes. Yeah, Sam. And just thoughts. looking back, looking back through some of the questions, I'm just thinking there's a couple of people asking about <laughs> already asking about next year, which is I think a good a good sign that they probably want us to do something again. Um, I say I'm not sure if we'll we'll do anything in person. The the online stuff works really nicely. It's it's amazing. I mean, I don't know where exactly we've had our audience from, but I mean we know at least from the time zones that we've we've had people from from across the globe. Um, so and it's it's been really interesting watching the number of people on the stream that we've had a fairly fairly consistent number. So I think there's been some as some people have have dropped mm. off and maybe gone to bed. Other people have come on. So I think we've we've done pretty well at, at, at the reach on that. Um, yeah. You know, I think I'd love to see some more some more of the user groups. This this came out of the Japan user group, which is a really strong strong local user group. But the idea of you know no is about community having having some more local groups that can have meetups and things in your city. If you want to do in person stuff. You know, let's get a get a local yeah. group going, and then when we have the online conference, you can you can have a watch party or something. <laughs> and absolutely, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to do an in person event. You know, the the economics and the practicalities of you know we're um, 
yeah, it would be awesome to get to the, the, the point where we we're able to to organize this at that level. Now, I certainly, the, the Node Red Japan guys did, the, the first couple of years was an in-person event in Tokyo um, where they have a very large concentration of people and it would be you know, awesome to do. Uh, but whether we do more sort of regional events or as Sam says, just more regular meetups that we try and help facilitate as a project, who knows? But I mean, I just want to say, you know, it, the, the range of content has been awesome and a huge thank you to all of our speakers for you know, giving up their time. Um, you know, we've, we've all, uh, yeah, there, there's been no sponsorship for this. This is just something we've put together as individuals. You know, thank you to all of our respective employers for giving us the time to spend doing it. I mean, that's, that's the extent of, of this. You know, the, yep. this. We chose not to go down the sponsorship route for the event because we wanted it to be much more community oriented so um yeah and yeah a huge thank you to all the people behind the scenes who have helped i mean to be fair most of them are now fast asleep because it's something like three or four o'clock in the morning in japan <laughs> but um yeah thank you to everyone thank you to sam for doing a sterling job for emceeing throughout the day it's been it's been really good really successful cool awesome yes well thank you for your your contributions, Nick, and I think you know. Thank you to Nick on behalf of the, everybody in the community because I know it's yes, no dread is a community thing, but we also know how much work you put in on uh, on maintaining and reviewing pull requests, and yeah, as well as as well as it being your day job, it seems to be your night <laughs> job. <laughs> uh, it's it's all good. I will just say, keep in mind, there is one question I've seen it asked a couple of times, and it hasn't quite fitted in with other talks, and it seems only fair to to not leave it hanging. And this was. By Byram about Ooh. a possible future Node Red as, as serve in a serverless context, um, to which I, you know, I'll, I'll briefly say there are absolutely people who do run Node Red as a serverless thing. Um, I would love to hear more, as in I, I know there are people who share in the community that they have done it. I'd love to hear more some of the practicalities of what they do. Um, one of the realities of Node Red is it is designed as a long running process rather than the serverless thing. That said, there are ways and means of, of doing interesting things in a serverless context. I think the big one, one of the areas, in fact, I mentioned earlier on the stream, I was at Node. Uh, Node Conf for you. Thank you. <laughs> Two conferences, <laughs> both called Node something. And I, cool. so I was at Node Conf for you for the first half of this week. Um, and really planted some ideas in my head around how we can start looking at the improving the startup time of Node Red, which is irrelevant if you're running a long running process. But when you get to serverless, that's that's what really matters is how quickly, how quickly from starting the process to being able to have the flows running. Um, anyway, so yes, yes. yeah. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it's it's something. Really yeah, I'd missed I'd missed that one. Um, there was also actually one I'll I'll just hijack for for my so because there was one somebody asked about um, open source uh, Jambones for open source voice for SMS. Uh, so Jambones does support SMS as well, um, although you know it's um, it's a little bit simpler SMS because really you're just getting getting the pipe from the the carry. You still need to bring in the the, pho the, the phone network somewhere, but um, yeah, Jambones has SMS support in it as well. Awesome. As, a, as a gateway um cool well that's too much i think i think your chinese is probably on the way and i think i need to go and either decide if i'm going to order pizza or chinese now because <laughs> i may have <laughs> but um so we'll we'll wrap it up there i think but thank you to nick thank you to all our speakers for today um thank you to all our audience for today um and say so, yeah we'll get everything up on everything's on youtube now but we'll try and do some some editing of the videos is my plan for the weekend anyway to uh, if i can figure out where the downloads are and uh yeah, we'll uh, we shall see you all in the community. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Bye now.